Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of our HESUS webinar. Today we continue with our uh, sessions and uh, this morning is for our distinguished keynote lecturers. I will have the pleasure and the honor to introduce to you three of them. In this first part, we will start with uh, Professor Maria Pilokipru. I'm sorry for not pronouncing properly your family names. Mine is unpronounceable as well, so <laughs> I, I hope you'll understand. Uh, then um, you know, we will have uh, Musso Stefano Francesco from um, Genova, and uh, the third speaker will be Professor Anna Tues uh, from um, uh, Portugal. So uh, I wish you all warmest welcome. I have to say that I'm deeply sorry that uh, we didn't have a chance to meet each other in person. This is the second day of our event and uh, up to this moment, we would be already uh, almost friends with each other after a couple of coffee breaks and lunch break and social events. So it would be much easier to communicate, but still here we are this way as we have to go. So um, we can start with uh, Professor Maria and uh, her lecture about environmental conservation of vernacular architecture, the case of Cyprus. On the first day, we saw uh, the magnificent setting of their school. So I hope that uh, this lecture will be of interest to all of you. Thank you. Maria. OK, do you hear me and do you see the slides? We see you and uh, don't see the slides yet. You don't see the slides, okay. Right. But I share it the same way that I did yesterday. I don't know. I will try. Yeah. Nice to meet you again. <laughs> also. Hello. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Morning. Good morning, everyone. Oh, now you slides as well. Great. Morning. Morning. So now you, you can see my slides. Yeah, yeah, perfect, Maria. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good luck. Back. <laughs> Thanks very much. Good morning, Maria. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. First, I would like to thank you for being here uh, today and especially the coordinator of HERSUS project for this opportunity today to discuss subjects related to sustainability and heritage. This presentation aims to demonstrate my recent methodological research approaches to the investigation of vernacular architecture with emphasis on its environmental features and my perspective on the environmental conservation of vernacular dwellings considering the vernacular architecture of Cyprus as an appropriate case study. Sorry. Uh, first of all, what, what is vernacular architecture? According to Paul Oliver, vernacular architecture is the architecture of the people. This type of architecture related to the environmental context and available resources. It is customarily owned or community built utilizing traditional technologies and local materials. All forms of vernacular architecture are built to meet specific needs, accommodating the values, economies, and ways of life of the, of the cultures that produce them. Throughout the years, vernacular dwellings have been continuously reused, adapting to changing local conditions and thus surviving as cultural testimonies that provide a direct link with the past. The sustainable identity of these dwellings comes from the incorporation of many environmental features in their design, the use of traditional local materials and available resources, as well as the simple ways that inhabitants' needs are met. The environmental features ensure a climate-responsive approach and help improve the thermal performance of the dwellings. It is worth noting that the conservation and the reuse of vernacular dwellings has a very positive impact on local economies as it generates local labor, demands, preserves buildings, hunting crafts, and at the same time safeguards the cultural identity of traditional settlements. Generally speaking, 
working, the adaptive reuse of vernacular architecture covers all aspects of sustainability, rendering it as an extremely sustainable method of development. Sustainability and conservation are closely related as they both express in a different way the need to manage existing resources and secure harmony between man and nature. Whereas on theoretical level, the notion of conservation and sustainability are two compatible terms, in practice, they evaluate existing structure in a different way. And I will explain now what this means. Retrofitting is a new term that is currently used to describe the process of refurb uh, refurbishing and remodeling buildings in order to improve their er energy efficiency and thus to decrease their energy consumption. Whereas conservation mainly refers to the preservation of the aesthetic and historic values of dwelling, retrofitting gives special emphasis on energy reduction. In this vein, retrofitting may be deemed as a threat to cultural heritage, as it often involves changes that affect the aesthetic and character at the aesthetic character and historic values of existing buildings. For these reasons, energy efficiency regulations are often not applied during the conservation process of heritage buildings. In this context, a balance should be sought between retrofitting a vernacular dwelling for the improvement of its energy performance and the preservation of its architectural, aesthetic, and historic interest. Different emphasis has been placed diachronically on values regarding heritage architecture in the international charters and declarations of conservation, while in a more recent chart, in more recent charters and declarations, sustainability has gained significant ground. More specifically, in the case of vernacular architecture, more emphasis is placed on the preservation of the, of the way traditional settlements are used and generally on the investigation of the impact on the users and on the society, and not merely on the maintenance of their physical characteristics. The ICOMOS 2001 International Symposium explores issues of sustainability through conservation as a new model for stewardship in relation to design, economics, technology, social sustainability, and environment and development. Sorry. In order to enrich the methodology of conserving vernacular dwellings with criteria of sustainability, the present study considers the vernacular architecture of Cyprus as an appropriate case study for an in-depth investigation. Cyprus is an island situated in the Mediterranean region and thus the investigation and conclusion derived from this study can be applied in other areas with common characteristic and climatic conditions. In Cyprus vernacular architecture and its environmental features were not studied and documented in a systematic way until recently. Meanwhile, many vernacular buildings are being conserved and restored without taking the preservation and enhancement of their environmental elements into consideration, and instead giving more emphasis to their aesthetic values and appearance. Within this framework, uh, three Funding projects uh, uh, were focused on the traditional settlements of Cyprus. Actually, the first one, the Vernage, investigated all the um, elements of vernacular architecture in Cyprus and uh, created a digital database and where all these elements could be inserted. And two other multidisciplinary <coughs> research programs, biovernacular and biocultural. Uh, focus on the environmental design feature of traditional settlement in Cyprus in urban and rural areas. And the main aim of this research was, was to improve the way that we conserve the buildings here in Cyprus and uh, propose new environmental conservation approaches for vernacular dwellings. 
a more, a more recent Erasmus program that the University of Cyprus participates deals also with this subject and now MOOCs for the environmental features of vernacular architecture are being developed. Cyprus can be divided into four different climatic regions, coastal, lowland, semi-mountainous and mountainous. A, a key feature of the Cyprus climate is the high temperature variations between day and night. Five settlements were investigated in detail. These selected settlements were situated in rural and urban areas across three distinct regions in Cyprus with different geomorphological and climatic characteristics. Specifically, two urban settlements situated in lowland areas you can see here Chrysalinodis and Kemakli, and three rural settlements, Maroni in the coastal region, Perorinis in the central lowlands, and Askas in the mountainous areas were selected as an appropriate case studies. Uh, in each settlement under study, a selection of about 50 vernacular dwellings was made in order to record and tabulate in data sheets, all the environmental feature of each dwelling. Here we can see the case of Maroni, you can see the map of the Maroni, and uh, one of these uh, data sheets that we were uh, prepared. The passive design strategies, heating and cooling, as well as strategies for outdoor microclimatic regulation were recorded for each of the selected buildings. Uh, overall tables were also pre uh, prepared for each area under consideration. Here we can see the case of Chrysalinodis's area. And uh, we prepare also comparisons on tables between the three rural settlements. Here we can see this uh, comparison table. And in the graph on the right, we can see the prevalence of cooling strategies in coastal and lowland areas if we compare with the mountainous areas that is in uh, gray. At the second level of risk research, a more thorough quantitative analysis of the environmental parameters was performed on a smaller sample of dwellings uh, in each settlement. Here we can see some uh, examples of urban areas, and here we can see some selected dwellings from the three rural settlements. Data lockers were placed in indoor and semi-open spaces in the case study buildings so as to identify their temperature and relative humidity. At the same time, weather stations were placed in uh, the three areas under investigation so that we have the outer environmental uh, conditions uh, for comparison reasons. I will now present some of the results of this research, uh, starting from the urban scale and going down to the materiality of the structures. Uh, we uh, start from the urban scale we can see here some of the streets of uh, these uh, settlements un under investigation. A monthly isolation condition of the streetscapes were investigated through software simulation in terms of sunlight hours, incident solar radiation, shading percentage, and sky view factors. The mountain settlement increases shading patterns. You can see here in the last um, uh, map in the right. And you can see that uh, the mountainous settlement increases shading patterns due to the dense fabric and deep street corridors. So it offers significant potential to improve the outdoor thermal comfort condition during the summer period. Moving now from the open to the built part of the settlements, we focus on the settlement patterns and on the building scale. Different layouts of the built fabric can be observed across the three different climatic areas of the island. The analysis of the urban fabric showed the positive impact of the continuous attached building system common in traditional settlements, which limits the amount of heat entering from outside. The typological analysis which followed showed that the traditional dwellings in all the settlement share some common characteristics, but at the same time, they incorporated different solutions. The dwellings in the coastal areas are 
typically a combination of single elongated roof topologies. These elongated and shallow layouts enhance passive cooling through natural ventilation during the cooling period. Double space uh, rooms uh, with high ceilings form the most dominant structural topologies of the lowland regions. Passive cooling is reinforced inside the, these rooms due to their high ceiling. Dwellings in the mountainous areas incorporate rooms with narrow frontage and deep plants. These compact low ceiling spaces of these areas offer protection from the cold. Courtyards constitute important environmental feature in all areas. In coastal regions, spacious uh, in courtyards can be found. In lowlands, the relative highly dense layout of the built up areas has given courtyards a more compact form. And in the mountains regions, courtyards, if existent, are very small size due to restrictions of the topography and the climate. Generally speaking, the courtyard offers several environmental benefits throughout the year. It ensures direct solar gains in winter and cross ventilation in the hot summer period in the areas around the courtyards. The semi-open spaces, intermediate areas, constitute another very important environmental, social, and functional element. The Yagos, a linear semi-open space located in front of the indoor spaces and mainly found in the lowland areas due to high temperature and solar radiation values in the summer, provides suitable shaded outdoor spaces. The portico, a semi-open space located within the building volume, has the form of a covered through passages. Frequently found in coastal and urban areas, this, uh, area, this uh, um, feature, the portico, permits sufficient cross ventilation and abundant air flow to the building interior. A prevalent semi-open typology in the mountainous area located on the first floor is the so-called Hayati. The existence of semi-open spaces on the first floor in these areas is connected to the limited available land on the ground level. Moreover, vine percolas are quite common in all climatic regions and provide either shade or sunlight during the cooling and heating periods. Following a holistic multi-criteria approach, the positive attributes of the semi-open spaces in varying climatic regions and topographies were identified and evaluated. The comparison table shows that the Yagos is a semi-open space topology that incorporates the most sociocultural, environmental, aesthetic, as well as psychological values. The role of the semi-open spaces play an improved play play a, a special role in improving the thermal comfort of vernacular dwellings. And that's why they were studied in detail through field mon monitoring. The comparative research outcomes highlight the positive contribution of semi-open spaces to the thermal comfort of vernacular buildings, especially during the cooling period. Temperature records revealed the beneficial impact of conversions from south-oriented semi-open spaces into closed indoor spaces during the winter period. In all vernacular settlements, the few and relatively small openings protect the interior of the dwellings from external environmental condition, but at the same time offer opportunity for ventilation. The cross ventilation of uh, due to the arrangement of uh, windows, is a very common feature of the coastal and lowland settlements and allows for natural cross ventilation. In order to investigate natural ventilation, its influence on interthermal condition during the cooling period, uh, a case study was uh, closely investigated. The research was uh, performed through a field study in uh, this dwelling uh, in a, a rural area. The investigation involved different ventilation strategies and the research outcome showed that the night ventilation was the most effective strategy for passive cooling in vernacular dwelling. You can see here the diagram. Uh, if we compare it with the full day ventilation. 
And we can see here that uh, this ventilation improves the thermal condition in the following days. The structural system of the building consists mainly of uh, 50 uh, centimeter thick load bearing out of Mansory walls based on a lower part made of stone. This high mass uh, of the walls leads to a very small temperature fluctuation in the indoor areas compared to the temperature fluctuation recorded in the external environment in all periods after investigation. In thermal investigated thermal initial, um, we made a, a very specific study and we found out that there was a time lag between the exterior um, temperature and the interior about five hours. The analysis on the environmental attributes of vernacular buildings as described previously showed a variety of cooling and heating strategies implemented. The hot climate of coastal areas featuring high humidity levels and intense solar radiation has enhanced the cooling strategies. On the other hand, on the, other hand the passive strategy implemented in mountainous areas to protect from the cold and to maximize solar exploration during the heating period uh, are the result of rather low winter temperature and mild summers. Finally, in the lowland areas, both cooling and heating strategies are incorporated. The previous described investigation revealed that although vernacular dwellings incorporated many environmental design principles during conservation, there is often a need to further engage this principle to meet contemporary sustainability requirements and construction standards. The qualitative study showed that the cooling and heating strategies need to be maintained during conservation and even reinforced in order to achieve thermal comfort. In coastal and low run areas, special care and reinforcements of cooling strategies is needed through the enhancement of cross ventilation, stack effect and shading strategies. On the other hand, in mountainous areas, heating strategies should be reinforced through the enhancement of solar gains and the preservation of buffer zones. The more detailed quantitative examination and monitoring of the vernacular dwellings has shown that during extreme climatic conditions, thermal comfort cannot be achieved despite the variety of passing uh, strategies. Specifically, the preservation and conservation of the existing building fabric of vernacular dwelling is of high importance for aesthetic and structural reasons, as well as due to its high thermal mass. The, th the research reveals that the elements of the building envelope that can be more easily improved in terms of thermal performance without affecting their heritage values and authenticity are the roof and the openings. In my most recent published uh, uh, paper with my colleague Emilius Mikhail entitled Environmental Sustainability in the Conservation of Vernacular Dwellings, it is underlined that during conservation and qualitative assessment is a session using a multi-criteria process. This assessment allows for the establishment of a contemporary conservation methodology, proposing alternative environmental retrofitting solutions for vernacular dwellings. A very important step in this process is the achievement of a balance between the conservation of the authentic physical appearance of the dwellings and the retrofitting actions implemented. The procedure concludes with the assessment of the decision taken through various evalu evaluation criteria that cover all aspects of sustainability. It becomes clear that in order to evaluate the impact of the alternative approaches and to achieve environmental conservation proposal, many parameters should be taken into consideration. The environmental refurbishment of vernacular dwellings and the improvement of their thermal performance through the incorporation of passive strategies contributes to economic sustainability as it reduces the energy requirements and thus operation cost of the dwellings. In addition, the environmental conservation of traditional environments through revival projects offer a number of benefits to society. 
more specifically, conservation project return traditional spaces to society as living complexes, offering new human environments, while at the same time, they improve the inhabitants' quality of life and social resili resili resilience. Despite the similarity between vernacular dwellings, each individual building is a very particular case study and thus requires specific documentation and investigation before any intervention. The decisions for the energy retrofitting of each dwelling should be governed by the understanding of its heritage values and should respect its character. The selected retrofitting measure should involve the necessary changes in the dwellings building and Develop, while at the same time, these changes should have the minimum impact of the building's original character. The study evidences that the environmental conservation of vernacular dwellings is a complex process. In order to achieve a balance between the various values of vernacular dwellings, all sustainable aspects of vernacular architecture should be taken into consideration. Thus, a multi-criteria and multidisciplinary approach should be followed in close cooperation with stakeholders, owners, and users in order to achieve a sustainable balance between the preservation of the authenticity and the environmental retrofitting of heritage buildings. To conclude, I want to note that the connection of heritage values with aspects of environment of Environmental technology gives this field of investigation a multidisciplinary character, offering opportunities for further research and innovation. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation and uh, very interesting research, uh, even more so since it covered the uh, different uh, areas and uh, different types of buildings from the mountains to the coastal regions and so. Uh, we had a couple of years ago, very nice experience with our partners from Venice, from Ivo. We had a workshop about a small mountainous village in uh, Serbia. And uh, we faced some of the similar challenges. I hope in the future, we will have the opportunity to collaborate with your institution as well in some um, similar activities. Uh, our pleasure to do so. <laughs> yes, and uh, the, I see that there are no questions here, but uh, I would like to ask you uh, uh, whether you consider the changes in use of those dwellings, because uh, in our country, and I think it's uh, the case in uh, many of other partner countries as well, uh, we have... Um, the reality that uh, people are leaving those settlements, so many of those dwellings are not used permanently throughout the year, but more uh, seasonal or occasional use. So uh, did you consider that or uh, maybe some yes. types of adaptive reuse with the we change? Have, uh, we have uh, also these problems. Uh, some of the people are using them are summer holidays dwellings or for the weekends. But now in Cyprus, we started to use them for acro tourism. So um, some uh, new inhabitants can go there and live uh, with this uh, BNB or other status, they um, uh, renovate their house, getting some grants from the government, and then they can rent them for tourists. So this is a new way of uh, uh, using these dwellings again without making many extreme changes in their um, uh, structure. Yeah, sure. Thank you. It was really uh, great, great work and uh, having a systematic knowledge on uh, physical processes and uh, uh, features of vernacular architecture. So hopefully it will be of use for our students as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, they're signaling me that there are questions, but I don't see any on my screen. See, see it's... The yeah, I, I, raise, oh. I raise my hand. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry. I think it's the first time I'm using it, so that's why. <laughs> uh, well, I wanted to I wanted to congratulate Maria for the great presentation. Uh, I think that it's so important to um, 
to be working on this more modest or more invisible architecture and, and promoting and working as, as, as the, the, uh, the moderator uh, already said, all this systematic work and research on vernacular architecture. So for that, congratulations, because uh, I, I think that this is very important, not only as a research, but we saw yesterday that you are also inserting that in a very intensive way in your, in your teaching methods. So mm -hmm. this is very important to transfer that to the students. The other thing that you said is how the Mediterranean linked us. And it's so obvious that we, when we see your uh, pictures, the uh, moderator already said they were also working in a workshop in another villages, et cetera. No? Uh, and so when we see this atmosphere, this house, these uh, uh, villages, this reminds us a lot uh, to our own Mediterranean villages, et cetera. So as the moderator says, it's very interesting because you offer a place to collaborate. We have been working a lot also on vernacular architecture, and I hope we, we can share that. The, the question for you, Maria, is that uh, in Spain, uh, we started to, um, after the, with the COVID, uh, a lot of people started to um, think of going to the little villages to live. So it's not only the ag uh, agro-tourism, as you said, or the, or, or, the, or the tourism, but I wonder if people there are starting uh, thinking of this architecture as a, um, as a day-to-day -day space to work and live so that, you know, the, the, the real life are transferred to the villages in this context, because this is happening here. And I wonder if this is also happening there. Thank you very much. A congratulation to you and Thank your you. team in this uh, magnificent research. Maria. Thanks very much and thank you for your question. Actually, nowadays, uh, uh, some people are thinking about this. Uh, not only old people that they, they, are, they are a permanent home there and they are stuck now there and they don't want to uh, move anywhere else, but in some uh, of uh, our generations now, they... Uh, are thinking of uh, going there. Some of them uh, have uh, already moved there uh, and have their permanent um, uh, house uh, this day. And I think this will uh, continue to increase uh, uh, when uh, this uh, new way of life that we are forced to <laughs> live. Because there you can move more um, uh, Easily, you can uh, feel more free uh, if you compare it with the cities that there is more um, people, more crowded. So, yes, it uh, started now, but especially for the old people, they are stuck there now. They are not going, <laughs> they are not coming uh, uh, in the urban centers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we don't have any more questions. So we can continue with uh, our session. Uh, now we will have uh, Professor Musso Stefano Francesco from Università di Genova. And also I will, I think I forgot to introduce myself this morning when we started. So my name is Natasha Cukovic Ignatovic, as I said, with unpronounceable family name, but very simple <laughs> first name. So. Uh, please feel free to address me on first name basis whenever you need to. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, thanks for having invited me here. And now I'm going to uh, share the screen. Uh, can you see the presentation? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, uh, but it's, uh, sorry. It's at the end. <laughs> <laughs> it's an anticipation. <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to show you the results of research, but I'm proposing you a reflection, critical reflection, of what reconstruction can means have meant in the past and can mean in the present and in the future. As I wrote in the abstract, 
reconstruction is not always the same thing. It can uh, assume different uh, meanings. It can be uh, supported by different reasons, moved by different aims, and uh, of course, different results. That's the reason why ICOMOS International uh, in uh, 2017 started a, a working uh, expert group about the post-trauma reconstruction in the present days. And uh, you can find the reports of this uh, first results on the website of ICOMOS if you wanted to uh, try or to, to see it, of course. Sorry, but I have the, um, some problem, okay. And uh, as always, it's uh, always uh, useful to start from uh, the words, the meaning of the words that we use, and that immediately show what I said before, that reconstruction has not only one meaning. Uh, taking into account Oxford Dictionary Online, but you can use also the Cambridge one and you will find uh, similar, very similar definitions. Reconstruction can be the process of changing or improving the condition of something or the way it works. The process of putting something back into the state it was it before. And that's quite interesting for us. But it can also mean the activity of building again something that has been damaged or destroyed. That is the case of many reconstructions uh, occurred in the past. But in the meantime, it can also mean a copy of make something that no longer exists. And we will see some few examples of all these different cases. Well, I would like to start from this image because I'm sure that every one of you would say immediately, wow, this is a Sistine Chapel in the Vatican City in Rome. Um, the marvelous masterpiece of Renaissance art in uh, Italian uh, history of art with the final judgment by uh, Michelangelo, other frescoes from other painters of the 15th century and the great vault again fresco decorated by Michelangelo. This one with the creation of the word in the center. Well, if this is true, if these are images of the real 16th chapel and if we went go out uh, the Sistine Chapel and go up uh, the dome of St. Peter, we would see this panorama, the exterior of the Sistine Chapel that, as you know, recalls uh, the cell of the Jerusalem temple. But it was not true. Those images were not the real Sistine Chapel. And in fact, if we go out to those images, uh, the space portrayed by those images, we would find this kind of structure. And metal provisional scaffolds covered and uh, closed by black uh, fabrics. Uh, because this is uh, the provisional installation, an art installation performed by Gabriel Baruman, a movie director and producer and his brother. And it's a copy, a clone, a reproduction of the real Sistine Chapel in Rome, made uh, thanks to me of features of the highest possible resolution today. It, is, it was a multisensorial replica with the smells, flavors, sounds, the bells, for example, and lightening the candles that can be experimented in the, in the true, original, authentic, irreplaceable Sistine Chapel in Rome. The measures of this installation are exactly the measures of the interior of the Sistine Chapel. And this recall has a very important book the work of art in the age of its technical reproducibility by Walter Benjamin, of course. This is the real, the true Sistine Chapel. It's almost impossible to distinguish the replica from the original, the true Sistine Chapel with its vault. This is quite challenging. Of course, uh, uh, this is something that is very, very important. It moved a lot of um, ability, capabilities, competencies, uh, uh, in a fantastic way. And uh, it's something that can be acceptable because it offers uh, to millions of people in Mexico City uh, to visit in some way the Sistine Chapel, even if they don't have the uh, resources, economic resources, the time, the possibility to go to the real one. And it exists and uh, doesn't touch the real Sistine Chapel. So it's fantastic in some way, but it poses some questions about authenticity, for example. 
This is a, one of the most famous uh, cases of reconstruction at the beginning of the 20th century, the reconstruction of the collapsed bell tower of the San Marco Basilica in Venice that perhaps uh, all of you perfectly know. But it's uh, important because in that occasion, the architect Luca Beltrami who was in charge of the project of reconstruction after a strong debate uh, in the city in which someone said, uh, well, the bell tower of the 13th century has been lost, no reason to rebuild it. Someone else, uh, someone else said, uh, no, it's important to have again this landmark for Venice, but we can reconstruct it in another place with other forms belonging to our contemporary age. But Luca Beltrami at the end convinced the city that the bell tower will be or should have been rebuilt as it was and where it was. And this is a motto very famous that uh, still resonates in the world. This is the uh, new, new bell tower because it, at any effect is a new construction, is a new building with the, the same more or less materials of the past, but with some changes. For example, the introduction of a a reinforced concrete structures in the cell of the bells. Uh, it's a, a little bit different as a shape because uh, they decided to change a little bit the dimensions. They decided that it's not, it was not a matter of difficulty, technical difficulty. They deliberately choose to make some change. So at the end, the bell tower has been rebuilt where it was, this is true, but not exactly as it was. So the motto is in some way uh, ambiguous. Uh, the recurring challenges after the great disasters, of course, uh, made uh, by nature or by man, still uh, characterize our contemporary debate and pose some questions. Rebuilding for compensated damages caused by nature or by humans? Rebuilding to preserve identity? But which one? Identity is a very delicate and challenging uh, word and concept. It's a dynamic one. It's never a, a, a fixed uh, character of the place, of the site, of the building, and neither of the people, of course. And uh, I wanted to underline that uh, a lot of wars have been struggled in the past to defend or to the impose some identity. And identity sometimes are created also through reconstructions. But uh, uh, recomposition, uh, it can be reconstruction also, the recomposition of the surviving fragments of, and integration of the lost and missing parts. But with what certainties, in what ways, with what forms, materials and techniques, how much? And uh, more important, what will be at the end of the reconstruction process? The difference, that means also distance, alternative, between the lost authenticity, the true authenticity, of the destroyed damaged monument and so lost forever and the new one that we want to reconstruct or reproduce with the rebuilding of the lost uh, monument so the motto uh, following which uh, the lost monument must always be rebuilt as it was and where it was as Beltrami said yet strongly resonates in the face of painful and recurrent losses of parts of our entire architectural goods in Italy and in the world. The reasons for this motto are moral, ethical, psychological and emotional, social or political, and also due to tourist pressure today or before pandemic era, of course. As Renato Bonelli recognizing in the face of the reconstruction of Warsaw immediately after the Second World War, overcoming its opposition to any form of mimesis Consider the demeaning the fundamental need for authentic and sincere creativity as a product of the human spirit. It, it is, does not even escape the similar motivations linked to the delicate themes of individual and collective memory, lose part of their power when the reconstructions take place over a long period of time from the lost suffered. That's the case of, uh, for example, the Cathedral in Coventry, UK. Uh, we can see that, uh, first of all, reconstruction is not always mandatory. Huh? Uh, it can be uh, postponed or it can be avoided. 
like, uh, for example, in the Church of Remembrance in Berlin, in the hand, uh, beginning of the 60s, uh, this community decided not to rebuild the destroyed church, the damaged church, but to build a new one close to it, to give again to the community a place of worship, of faith, but not touching the ruins of the church, like to uh, leave a sign of what happened, a memory of the terrible uh, destru destruction of the war. And uh, some uh, years later, very far from the Second World War, um, the Frank Kirchen in Dresden was uh, as well rebuilt, but uh, with a long distance of time. That means that uh, almost no people remember this, uh, that place uh, like a place where attended a funeral or a, a marriage, I don't know. So it means that the reasons for this reconstruction are perhaps uh, um, different from the previous ones. Or what can we say about uh, the Alte Pinakothek in Munich that was damaged from uh, the bombing of the Second World War, as you can see on uh, the picture on the left, that has been, of course, rebuilt uh, by architect Dolgast, but uh, not uh, pretending to imitate uh, the lost part of the building, but simplifying in some way, respecting its uh, uh, architectural syntax, but not uh, the lexicon, the single words. Or what uh, can we say about the reconstruction uh, by David Chipperfield of part of the Neues Museum in Berlin, very recent, that again proposed a way to reconstruct that uh, uh, escape uh, the risks of imitating uh, uh, the lost monument, and so avoiding also the condemnation that uh, John Raskin gave uh, to this, uh, those kind of interventions, uh, uh, because it's not, it's not possible in his consideration to make a, a li again a life uh, the death. But uh, the reconstruction need uh, can derive from different reasons, as I said, for example, the cathedral in Venzoni in Friuli Venezia Giulia that was uh, so hugely damaged by the earthquake in uh, 1976, has been uh, re re completely rebuilt, uh, saving and cutting in the surviving fragments of the collapsed church in view of their recomposition within a new church, because it in effect is a new church with the same forms, the most accurate reconstruction in terms of forms and shapes of the destroyed one, how much faithful, it's a matter of discussion, of course, but with a new matter in great part, even if similar to the lost one. And this is the result, very convincing. And the people strongly wanted that the church would have been reconstructed in these forms. Like to uh, forget the terrible tragedy of the earthquake. And we now face the same problem in Norcia after the last earthquake in central Italy. This is uh, the uh, Basilica of San Benedict, the patron of Europe, by the way, before the earthquake and in the condition it is now. And uh, there has been a, a big and huge debate about its reconstruction. And uh, the Ministry of Culture at the end made a tender, a competition, international competition that now is going to be realized. Uh, following the idea of the reconstruction al identique, uh, like uh, Viola Le Duco would have said. And what about the uh, uh, theater of La Felice in Venezia, built in 1792, damaged by uh, fire in the middle of the uh, 19th century, rebuilt in Rococo forms in 1837, again destroyed by a fire in 1996, and then right in the night, uh, that the fire destroyed the theater. The major of Venice, that at that time was Massimo Cacciari, the famous Italian philosopher, who, by the way, taught aesthetic at the Faculty of Architecture in Venice, immediately said that the, the Venetians would have rebuilt La Fenice as it was like it was, right? In the same way that the, the bell tower of San Marco, always in Venice, had been rebuilt one century before, more or less. And this is a result after the completion of the rebuilding works in 2006. Well, another disaster, 
the Cathedral of Noto, a very famous Baroque example of urban planning, but also of architecture in, uh, in Sicily, close to Syracuse, that uh, suddenly one morning, again in 1996, a very horribilis, uh, like uh, Queen Elizabeth would have said, uh, the dome collapsed due to uh, structural weakness, bad quality of materials, but also uh, due to some past interventions. And uh, for example, the insertion of a very uh, rigid concrete reinforced slabs inserted between the vaults and the roofs with the idea that in that way, the water would have never entered again in the uh, church by the roofs. But this created a, a domino effect. So uh, not only the dome collapsed, but the material of the dome collapsing against these uh, concrete slabs uh, created the destruction, provoked the destruction of the central nave and also of the lateral nave. Again, a big debate, national and international. At the end, uh, they decided to rebuild the cathedral in Noto like it was as it was and where it was, of course. But in order to achieve these results, new demolitions were necessary. So in order to have a complete rebuilding of the church, but resistant to new earthquake and fulfilling the new rules and regulations about the safety, risk of fire, accessibility, etc., all the survived parts of the church after the collapse have been demolished to allow the reconstruction. This means that the new cathedral, apart the facade, is completely new. And of course, at the exterior, it's fantastic. Noto has again its landmark, its main important monument. But in the interior, the walls are completely white. And this is a, a matter of debate today when the bishop wants to decorate again the interior with the, a modern style. Here in Nepal, it's another case very interesting because it shows that sometimes reconstruction does not answer to the real needs of the local community, but to different reasons and to external motivations and solicitations. For example, in this case of the temple, uh, people didn't ask it to uh, have a, a, a immediately uh, new, but similar to the old and lost one temple. Because uh, in their religion, uh, the real holy meaning of, is linked to the place, not to the building. So they immediately asked it to remove the ruins in order to have the chance to make again their processions, their liturgies, not exactly to have the copy of the lost monument. But to have the copy of the Lost Monument was very important for tourist reasons, for example. On the, what about the destruction of the ruins of uh, the Roman city of Palmyra in Syria, provoked by the troops of the ISIS uh, that uh, demolished the arch of the entrance gate of the city, that in reality was not the Roman one because it was the result of already of a reconstruction of the archaeologists uh, in the previous decades. And so you can see here the picture of the gate and the absence of the gate in the reality. But then you have again the gate through a production of the arch of entrance uh, made with the, uh, 3D printing, starting from a 3D laser survey that has been made before. And this poses another question, the possibility to survey as someone suggested, all the monuments at risk around the world in order to be able to rebuild them in an identical way if a disaster occurs. All these uh, very challenging questions uh, has been uh, taken into account in a recent document. This is the version of 2019, but the new version after the uh, contributions of many other experts uh, is going to be uh, spread off uh, in a few months, uh, a revised version. But uh, this main recommendation, number 19, will remain the same. And in this uh, document by ICOMOS again, it said that the EU funded projects, because that was the field in which we were asked to work, 
should respect EU values and the treaties, and reconstructions might only be funded in exceptional circumstances, insofar as the project complies with the selection criteria of this quality principles document. And in particular, a reconstruction should not be allowed or funded by you if it's uh, uh, supported only by economic or touristic or even worse, ideological reasons. Because, because the risk is the, to go from memory of a destroyed architecture to its apparent rebirth through a new construction conceived as one consolatory image because this means that uh, we are not uh, perhaps uh, in face of a real protection, but in front of a, a spectralizing of heritage, like Marco Oje said in a very interesting book. And at the end, it would not be easy to uh, perceive the real difference between the original, the reconstruction or reproduction of ancient and incomplete monuments in ideal and completed forms, in, but in different places. This, for example, is the Parthenone, uh, built in 1897 in Nashville, Tennessee, USA. Of course, the original one is not in these conditions. So it's a mix of reconstruction uh, in the two meanings of uh, the term that we saw in the definitions uh, from the Oxford Dictionary. And what about the many Eiffel Towers that you can find if you go in China, for example, in Tianjin? Uh, this is a reproduction of an existing building in a different place. And also the neighborhood to give the idea to be real in Paris. Or what about the use, uh, very commercial, very trivial, of a very uh, important and uh, renowned uh, monuments of Venice put together in different ways uh, uh, compared with the reality to realize a, a casino. And the problem is that sometimes uh, citizens that go to the casino in Las Vegas and then go to Venice, uh, at the end they are disappointed and prefer Las Vegas because there are no mosquitoes, uh, no bad smells, uh, no crowd. Uh, the water in the channel is very, very uh, clean. Uh, the gondola is uh, going very smooth because it's in reality, it's mechanical, et cetera, et cetera. What about the comparison between virtual reality, fake reality, reality? And the maximum you can find here in Dubai, uh, where you can find a collection of reproduction of copies, more or less faithful, even merged together. You can see Alfred Eiffel Tower, the Coliseum, the Taj Mahal, etc. And the incredible thing is that this is a, a picture of an, a commercial tourism advertise that says, come, come in Dubai. You will find everything you would like to find. That's the problem. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, again, I have a signal here that we have some questions. Unfortunately, I cannot see them in the chat, but uh, here with the help of my <laughs> dear colleague now, it's here. Uh, from um, Heba and Monawi, uh, the question is, would it be useful to have a rating system like Green or LEED that is only concerned with the reconstruction of heritage buildings? that sets basic standards for preservation and reconstruction and evaluates how well the authenticity of the reconstructed building is maintained. Sorry, but uh, I had some problem with the audio and that I can't hear very well. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, do you think that it would be, I will start rephrase it, uh, uh, would it be uh, good to have a rating system, something like LEED or BREAM, uh, specifically dedicated to the monuments of the heritage as the ones that we saw in your presentation that will uh, set some basic standards for uh, preservation and reconstruction and evaluate how well the authenticity is uh, addressed. Yeah, uh, the, the work of the working group uh, by ICOMOS about reconstruction uh, that I quoted at the beginning of the presentation is exactly directing in that direction. But the problem is that, uh, and the reason why in the other document we used the word principles and not standards, 
is that uh, because it's very, very difficult to have a rating system that uh, can ensure that at the end uh, the uh, decision to rebuild and how to rebuild is in some way assessed on international level. Because the reasons for the reconstruction, as I tried to demonstrate, are very, very different. And so I don't know. I really don't know. I don't like very much the decision-making tools, uh, the standardization of decision, because I think that these questions are uh, deeply of cultural nature. And culture needs a confrontation, dialogue, and, um, elaboration of ideas, open mind, not exactly measures, parameters, or standards. We can transform any problem in a sort of decision-making tool because at the end, we are going towards the artificial intelligence, the intelligence systems, the decision-making tools that could help policymakers. But I fear that the risks in this kind of process are more than the benefits that we can gain. I don't know if I answered the question. Thank you. It was, uh, it, it was very clear and uh, I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, throughout your presentation, personally, I was uh, rethinking how much uh, courage and sensitivity and knowledge have to be deployed in a way to find a, a proper solution or something that might be a proper solution in each particular case. You so, know, I, I don't think that this is a matter of judgment. So it, it's right to reconstruct in this way or in that way, or it's wrong, or it's immoral. Or it, it's a matter of knowing exactly what happened, because I'm happy that in Venice I can find that kind of a bell tower and not a strange concrete reinforced bell tower in, uh, I don't know, liberty style of Art Nouveau style that was the style of that period. So if uh, I would say it's uh, necessary to be in the place where the disaster happens, it's uh, important to understand all the sensitivities, the community, for example, because the conservation or rebuilding is not a matter of specialists. It's not something that belongs only to architects, for example, or to experts in conservation. We don't conserve heritage because uh, for ourselves, because heritage is not in our hands. Uh, it's in the hands of the communities, of the social uh, uh, community. Um, the important is to know exactly what happened and to know that that is not the bell tower built in 13th century, but the bell tower in the more or less the same forms built at the beginning of the 20th. Because otherwise, uh, people can be uh, put in a very uh, dangerous situation. Hmm? Uh, as John Ruskin said, hmm? this is a, a fake architecture, you would say. So I think it's a very delicate question that needs to be faced with the open mind, uh, not in a dogmatic way, not the, with a fundamentalistic attitude but open to discuss and to find a solution and then to declare exactly what happened and why. The only thing that I think is dangerous is like in the case of the reconstruction of cathedrals in Russia, demolished by Stalin more than one century ago. That means that nobody can have a pain for that loss because nobody remember the existence of those cathedrals. But now Russia is rebuilding all the destroyed churches by Stalin of course, with the same shapes, but not with the same constructive techniques and materials. So, very challenging. Yes, yes. And uh, like the case with uh, Notre Dame, that I believe that uh, we couldn't find consensus in uh, all architects around the world. We all take it so personal and uh, uh, all have some different views on uh, what should be done and what is there. Uh, well, what are those uh, both tangible and intangible values that are to be preserved and uh, the ones that uh, should be added perhaps for the future generations. So really always a very, very exciting topic. Thank you for the very nice presentation once again. Thank you. Okay, uh, we don't have any more questions. So uh, let me introduce you now our final speaker for this uh, session. This is uh, Professor Anna 
Tosto S, president of Docomomo International and the editor of Docomomo Journal uh, from uh, Technical University of uh, Lisboa. So please, the title of her presentation is The Education for a Sustainable Future, the Role of Modern Heritage Reuse. Okay, may I? Yes. Can I have the, the, the screen? So I would like to start by thank you very much for this very challenging invitation in this kind of uh, webinar. So I would like to greet the Ersus project. It's a very, very interesting uh, application and now a very interesting content discussion. Um, and of course, I would like to uh, say good morning to everyone um, and uh, once again to, to greet my colleagues more directly from Sevilla University, but I'm very happy to be in Belgrado uh, as well. So. Hello, everybody. It was a pleasure to listen to Stefano Francesco Musso. Uh, I was really amazed by the, the, the Noto, the Noto, which is a fantastic place I visit, uh, you know, in the other times of the life um, with connections with Lisbon and the, the reconstruction after earthquake. And it was amazing. But this is something for perhaps the round table. So hello, everybody. I would like to greet Mar Loren uh, very specially. And if you allowed me, I will start with my presentation. Um, yes. Are you- Your presentation. Are you um, with the full screen? Uh, no, we don't see your presentation. We see you, your camera, but not the screen. Okay, so perhaps I must- uh, take here the share screen. Yes. Not yet. It's coming. Yes. yes. It's now, coming. yes. Okay. So may I start? And um, I think this is very interesting to to take the the word after uh, Stefano Francesco Musso uh, because I'm going to to talk mostly uh, on, let's say, modern movement uh, heritage. Uh, and I would like to, to stress, uh, of course, the importance of uh, heritage in architectural education and, 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 and research. Uh, and as well to um, develop very quickly, of course, the question of the documentation and the conservation, uh, which stands um, as a key of the organization I'm, um, let's say, uh, chairing for 12 years, long time. Uh, for the moment, we have um, quite uh, a world uh, at the moment, uh, and um, we try uh, to keep in mind this idea of uh, reutilization, of renovation, reuse, restoration. I would like to um, talk about all the different approaches we could have concerning uh, 20th century uh, heritage. Uh, of course, there are plenty different layers depending of uh, the cases. But the most important thing is that uh, the idea that the, the heritage is something that we should use. It's not uh, just an object or just, you know, uh, an icon. It's, 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 it's something that in fact belongs to the community and to the society. And to arrive to this point, uh, we all know that uh, um, 20th century, uh, let's say built environment or architecture um, is not so well recognized as uh, truly heritage. Um, and for instance, one of the tasks of the Komomo is to spread um, to common 
people uh, this idea uh, and so we create some years ago five years ago this kind of um, application for our mobile phones uh, with uh, the heritage of the world and we call it the Dokomomo virtual exhibition the Mo move so it's the modern movement the Mo Mo uh, moving uh, and so it's an application very very clear that we we can use when we are in a place to to realize what we can visit and with some uh, further information of course uh, we work a lot in let's say classic uh, diffusion with books uh, i would like to just highlight this one we did with our uh, Chinese chapter, uh, which are the key papers in modern architectural heritage uh, conservation. And of course, we have the Dokomomo Journal uh, twice a year. And now we are preparing the 65th journal. So um, we, let's say, approach different issues, different themes. Uh, and recently, for the first time, uh, we took occasionally uh, some, uh, let's say, uh, special legacies from architects, the case, for instance, of Louis Kahn. Um, but the, the journal really stressed the question of how to conserve it and um, what is the meaning of the legacy of these architects for the future uh, in terms of documentation and conservation but as well uh, other issues for instance uh, this one uh, which is very um, special for all the mediterranean uh, area the the question of the tourism uh, and very recently uh, it was a, a, a kind of a shock in march when i i wrote the editorial because we we were preparing this issue for a long time on pure and care issues. And we were in, in complete pandemic one year ago. So it was in a way terrible, but in another way, really interesting uh, to realize that um, we are following, you know, the, um, the great questions of, 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 of our time. And so uh, I must hurry up because I believe uh, I should take my 20 minutes. And now uh, I would like uh, to share with you some case studies that perhaps could be uh, a good point for the discussion on this question of built environment, uh, sustainability, and how uh, to, uh, let's say, um, construct uh, knowledge and at the same time uh, discuss um with the society and educate uh future professionals and i would like to start uh with this um, very um special case which is uh, as you can see uh, a common uh, housing development uh, in geneva uh, and it's quite interesting because these um great complex um uh, with 10000 uh, inhabitants it's quite a, you know a mega structure um from the 60s uh, it was let's say fated to be destroyed as we know lots of um places and 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 uh, uh, housing complexes um at least in europe and in north america that are being destroyed because they don't fit anymore the regulations people don't love them etc but this case was very very interesting because the ecole polytechnique um, federal de lausanne the 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 lab on on uh, modern um, sustainability and modern architecture took uh, this issue in 2010 and they start there to document to study and involving uh, students and the interesting thing is that they were able to prove to the authorities with uh let's say a deep research that it was possible perhaps to 
not really restore, but to rehabilitate this complex. Uh, because there was, of course, as we can imagine in Switzerland, uh, lots of climate uh, challenges um, that this um, great complex was uh, addressing. So um, there was the conviction in the heritage uh, medias that it was too expensive um, to restore uh, these uh, um, wall uh, window curtain. And so it was possible uh, with this deep research to justify that it could be um, a balance between all the cultural aspects of this uh, housing complex, because it was really interesting, uh, the fact that in these 60s, this complex um, had a program, of course, of housing, uh, of some facilities, for instance, uh, swimming pools in the in the terraces, but as well um, equipments and facilities, uh, for instance, for three different uh, religions. Uh, there's the 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 the, the religions um, places as well as commercial and so on. So this was a kind of a, um, housing uh, unit, uh, unité d'habitation uh, with uh, this kind of uh, landscape environment uh, near the Rhone, the, the river. So the people, they really loved very much to live here. And there was so a mix of social activity uh, with the work of the university um, with this education key uh, aspect um, confirming uh, the possibility of this rehabilitation and with the financial um, quantification in order to prove that this could be possible. And it was amazing because I always remember uh, this was published uh, in the Docomomo journal of 2011. The next year, uh, this, let's say, project won the Europa Nostra uh, award uh, and then um, the Swiss awards from the, the board of architects and engineers. And now it is quite finished, the re restoration, and it's really a success uh, when at the beginning of the story, uh, all um, the, um, the aspects perhaps told that it was a, a lost cause. And so I would like now to move to another um example this is the 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 german school in lisbon it's a, a one of the latest project of otto bartning otto bartning as you know it's a, a very interesting architect he, from germany he worked a lot in in um, school programs and these this is one of the last ones and it's really really amazing and it was necessary you know to to uh, make some new buildings in this complex. And fortunately, um, the school um, spoke with different people, board of architects and so on. And um, they accept to make a competition. And it was very, very good because uh, with this competition, it was possible to make the difference between this project and, and almost of the others, because the others, they didn't care really about the existing uh, building, which is the one you can see here. Uh, and this is the solution um, that considered that the existing building should reuse, be in reused. And so they tried to uh, put and this is from Caril de Grasse uh, project and 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 there was made a, a quite of research based design I, I could say and so they uh, try to uh, put let's say the primary new school you know near the borders creating a kind of uh, acoustic barrier because there's a, a, a big traffic 
um, line here, and then the new gymnastic uh, area in the other board. So with this uh, strategy to put the new constructions in the borders, or in the limits of the plot, they were in fact able to restore um, the school from the 50s uh, and to rebuild uh, or, or to make, let's say, new, um, new spaces, to build new spaces in accordance, in a way, uh, with the spirit of the existing uh, place, as well as uh, restoring uh, the interiors uh, with, let's say, the same philosophy uh, and keeping the um, um, all the windows and the frames and so on. It was really an amazing work. And now my proposition is to move to Asia and let's see what happens in, in, in Japan. And, and as we know, all uh, this seismic question is really a key part for uh, the, the way we may uh, um, address heritage in, in Japan. And so um, this, this example, this is a, a Kenzo Tange uh, work from the uh, post-World II uh, War. Um, and this uh, prefecture, which is a, a municipality, a council, um, this building was, of course, not answering anymore uh, to the, the seismic security standards and should be demolished and built another one. And once again, thanks to a deep work of documentation, research, analysis, um, it was possible to find um, different solutions. Uh, it was the same that we saw very, very quickly on Lignon, so these, these lines, um, in order to balance, you know, all the cultural values, the financial um, uh, necessities, and in this case as well, uh, the seismic answers, and uh, finally, uh, it was possible for this prefecture of uh, um, Kagawa to restore and to uh, apply a retrofit, a seismic retrofit. And just very, very quickly, this is another fantastic case, once again from Tange. Uh, and it's amazing because this place, which is Kofu, um, after the war, there was nothing. It was completely destroyed. And so, um, this kind of uh, Yamanashi Broadcasting and Press Center for the population uh, who rebuilt their little houses was, you know, the, 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 the community um, icon or the community um, key uh, point to put everybody together. Uh, it was the TV, it was the radio, and as well the football uh, team. So you can imagine. So this was the icon of the place. And so it was incredible, this, this, this project, this answer for, from Tange. And as well, it arrives the same problem. It should be destroyed because of all the seismic uh, let's say, regulations. And so all the community was together in order, you know, to make this retrofit uh, from the structure, which is uh, incredible work, as we know, even in financial terms. And it has been finished in 2017 perfectly. And so very, very quickly, because of our 20 minutes, I I'm not able to talk about this question without uh, keeping in mind Lina Bobardi from Brazil. Lina Bobardi was a woman architect, an Italian, as you know, a Roman a lady uh, who immigrated to Brazil. And what is amazing in the work of Lina is the moment when she faced uh, uh, a factory with no use anymore. And she was able to involve uh, the community 
and the young generation as well in an incredible research project in order to keep the factory as it was. This factory was the reason, the, the being reason of this place. Everybody worked in this factory and it was no more uh, used. And we, talk, we are talking about the 70s. So this is a very, very avant-garde project of reuse and reutilization. And so with this action, this uh, activity, this, this quite politic activity, it was possible to reuse um, the, the material structure uh, with uh, sports facilities with swimming pools with all of the this stuff as well as with uh, cultural uh, facilities like uh, uh, libraries uh, art uh, um, uh, displaying places so i think that uh, this sesc pompeia uh, as a leisure center and a sports center is, in fact, a, a kind of an avant-garde um, action um, towards what we are dealing now, 40 years after, you know, uh, with this um, discussion on documentation, conservation and reuse. And just to end very, very quickly, um, a work that I was very, very much involved in, and, and it was once again the result of a deep research done for a long time, I would say 10 years, on this very, very special building, quite, uh, let's say, a classical modern movement building, but very, very uh, I would say not iconic at all. Um, it's a very, very discreet uh, construction, uh, in a way quite humble, uh, of course, with very, very good materials. And as Leslie Martin um, recognized, uh, this building will be a classical in the more fundamental sense that it arises from the well-proportioned and logical solution to a very special problem. And so, you know, to intervene in such a building, it's really hard stuff, it's difficult. And, and so all the story of the building, the story of the construction was coming to light. And thanks to this deep uh, research, on construction and on all the social and, and, and cultural aims of the place, it was possible uh, in a process of 12 years of renovation and maintenance and conservation. The last intervention was in the auditorium, which was the, the, the most delicate one. And it was amazing to work um, with all these questions, uh, as we all know today, to um, answer to the normative or, and the new rules of security, all the security matters, fire, um, um, escape, safety, acoustic, terrible discussions with the acoustic guys of the Gulbenkian Foundation. They wanted another auditorium, you know, with another sound. And we resist and said, no, this is impossible because there's a, uh, there's a, um, an ambience a kind of an immateriality that we should keep. And it was a terrible fight, I may tell you, my friends, but we we won. And also with the fire guys, they wanted, you know, to, to put here, oh, I may move. They want to put here, I mean, between the, the auditorium and the stage, uh, a concrete portico to have the, 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 the security curtain working. And it was a terrible discussion, but we won because we discovered a way to open all the windows of the foyer in order to be escape doors. So this is 
a work that we must deal um, as architects, but with all the other disciplines and all the other intervenients um, of, uh, of society. And of course, in this case, it was possible to work like this because it was already recognized as nation monument. Because if it was not a national monument, as you Italian say, there was no deroga. It was not possible, you know, to escape uh, from the firemen. That's the question. So I would like to praise in a way that what we call um, all these recognitions, for instance, now um, um, Gulbenkian Foundation is the is in the, the list for a world uh, heritage from UNESCO. And this is very important, not just to have the label, you know, to involve community, all the people. Without people, there's no heritage. So very quickly, one, research, documentation, knowledge, keys for responsible intervention. The conception, Research-based design is a working in progress, normative security comfort. And finally, education strategy for the heritage preservation. So that's why I greet very much Ersus and please go ahead and we are here to support you. Thank you so much. I keep more five minutes. Wow. Uh, your excuse, <laughs> fantastic. That many times. Hey, I finished. <laughs> Thank you, wonderful presentation, really. Thank you so much. And uh, once again, it's uh, such a pity that we are not uh, all here together in person because uh, throughout the session, we had uh, really lively discussions and uh, comments and uh, many thoughts on those issues that we addressed uh, this morning. So uh, thank you, Anna, once again. Let me check with the, our team. Do we have some pending questions here? No? Thank you. So, uh, sorry, now we have. So, uh, we have a one hand raised, just a second. Oh, Marloren, thank you. There you go. Uh, hello, thank you, Natasha, for your moderation. And thank you very much, Anna, for being here today. Um, it was, as always, uh, a pleasure to listen to you, to learn, to learn with you. Uh, and with all this positive energy you put on the table, uh, although we are not together today, uh, this is very important, all this emotion within heritage. So thank you very much. Um, so the other thing I want to point out is the, the uh, one thing that it was wonderful um, how you uh, point out the importance of the more modest architecture. Even when they are very modest, very invisible, uh, you are working on that. And in the end, you won. I, I, I love the fact that you say we won on that. So this is, this is wonderful. Um, the other thing is that although there is a lot of creativity in project intervention, so we are still architects, it's so important, the research, the documentation, all the effort you show us uh, through all your work. So thank you for sharing that and give us hope that we can get that also if we are worried about our own heritage, right? And finally, uh, the education, how we transfer that to education, to community, and how we position ourselves in a very interdisciplinary real process, as you told us. So I want to, um, of course, congratulate you for the, um, the great work of Docomomo International on you as, as, uh, as its president. And I wanted to ask you, Anna, what is the challenges we have ahead of us? Because you are our, uh, our professor on, on that. So what are the the, the, the great challenges we have in terms of uh, modern heritage and all these vectors we are talking here, education, uh, uh, rehabilitation, reduce. What are the, the, the challenges you think, Anna? Thank you very much. Congratulations for your wonderful work. Thank you very much for the question and, 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 and for the statement, I would say. Uh, I think um, 
you you touch a very important point, which which is these invisible uh, arch architects. Um, I mean, there's a, a a huge amount, for instance, in housing in Europe. I think we have um, an incredible uh, experimentation uh, work, um, mostly after the World War II. For instance, Italy, it's incredible. All you, you go to Trieste, you go to Turin, you go to Naples, uh, you go to Rome. It's amazing the things you go to the former Yugoslavia. There's incredible, um, um, let's say, uh, uh, new uh, solutions. And in Europe, it's a, it's it's a pity that we don't know all these cases, and they could be uh, lessons for the future. I think that modern movement, it's, it's architecture, it's important mostly, um, you know, not everything is good. There was lots of errors in urbanist terms, etc. Of course, it's not the, just the blame of architecture. It's a society and a capitalist system, you know, um, that uh, with, with a great speed. Uh, but, but architects have a mission and urbanists have a mission and we all as society, we have a duty. And so I think housing is, uh, in my point of view, uh, one of the great issues and, and, and keys um, to work on and I'm trying to do it. Uh, and so I just tell you that uh, I would like very much to make uh, an European project on each on on this issue, and perhaps we could join our our uh, energy um, in order to first look to know and to realize what which are the cases that could resist to the twenty first century, uh, and perhaps the other ones that we may may forget, and of course, um, and what we could learn from these uh, invisible uh, architects that are not, you know, in the books. Uh, this is another history. We all know that the, the historiography is mainly done in English and we are talking in English now. Um, and so there was a kind of a, a lack uh, of information um, during uh, lots of decades, I would say. Uh, and so it's time, and I'm sure that all these inputs from Europe and these Erasmus Plus uh, and the, all the Erasmus program, I think, if I may say, it's the most revolutionary action of all Europe, you know, it's to, to put uh, the, the young generations together. Uh, and now the ones who start are not so young anymore. Uh, and so we have, uh, we are uh, crossing uh, generations and in, in terms of education, and this is really very, very, very important. Just to finish, uh, I would like to say that it's in fact very different, the cases that uh, where we can talk about the restoration. And you know, I was involved in the restoration of the Tugendat house in Brno, in Czech Republic. The, the house from uh, 99 uh, designed by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and Lili Reich. And it's very important because there's a woman behind or, or perhaps in front, but for us it's behind. But the thing is that the result is fantastic. And this was a case of a restoration in a way. Restorations are always, you know, a little bit of invention, but let's say this house deserved I would say to be restored and to put lots of money just to make a museum. But in other case, I think that the reuse and the transformation could be very, very much welcomed. Um, you know, this heritage of the 20th century um, could adapt to, to, to new times and this is the way to be sustainable. Sustainable in all the levels, economy, cultural, social, and material. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Anna, for this really inspiring uh, end of this uh, session. Thank you all for attending this and uh, until our next meeting. 
uh, I wish you all nice remain of the day. And uh, while we are still with modern architecture, I just have to say that we pride ourselves with uh, our heritage in modern architecture that was uh, acknowledged uh, 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 through the great exhibition in MoMA a couple of years ago, Concrete Utopia. Anna would know about it, I'm sure, but uh, the rest of the Hersus people, this is a good moment maybe to introduce you to this part of our architectural heritage that is uh, very important to us. Thank you. Uh, we will continue at uh, quarter to 11 with the next session and with the next host, uh, Milica Milovic from uh, Faculty of Architecture. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. See you later, Stefano. I enjoy very much uh, Noto. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Fantastic. Know. It's a fantastic place, really. Indeed. Yes. You, you know that we were there um, um, when we were preparing an exhibition uh, on the, um, the post-earthquake plan for Lisbon in the 18th ah, century, and yeah. we make links with the people of uh, Noto, and, and we were there in the theatre, and it's in fact amazing. All this area uh, of Sicilia is the incredible. So I think we are now going to lose. Tell me, it's supposed to have a, a, a round table around 12? I don't know. I, do, I don't oh, have the program uh, in front of myself. Sorry. Okay. Hello, fantastic keynoters. Uh, the okay, round table man. is at one. Is at one o'clock? No, at one. And by the way, I was also in this fantastic note. And sorry for my... Uh, ignorance, but I didn't know the reconstruction. So I have. Oh, yeah. I went to Noto one day. We had. We have. A, you know, another plan for the next day, and I said, "No way! I have to go back to this place again." So the following day, we cancel what we were doing and go there. Um, very, so it was a wonderful place. Uh, the place is fantastic. Mm, I think that they did a good job to have again the dome and the, the, the cupola and the, this landmark because for the integrity of Noto as an urban settlement in the, in the landscape, it's good. But you have to know that it's not the real cathedral from the 18th century. And that also the survived parts after the collapse of the dome have been completely demolished in order to have a new cathedral resistant to earthquakes and other risks, etc., etc., etc. So, in some way, it can be accepted for the reasons that I said, but people have to know that it's not the real Baroque church. And the problem is evident inside because it's all white. It was fresco decorated. It was with stucco, gold uh, that disappeared completely. And now the bishop wants to decorate again the interior, giving the commitment to a painter who has the idea, the strange, uh, crazy idea, to inspire the new decoration to the Orthodox Church, to the Byzantine style. So it's getting crazy. <laughs> the debate is. Uh, Stefano, I must send you because we, we had two cases in Lisbon of churches uh, um, that uh, had been, let's say, painted um, in the 20th century, but because they were really destroyed, one because of a fire. Um, I know, I know, we, the Dominican church. Yes, the Dominican Igreja Toto Santa. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting. It's from the uh, 90s, but there's one recently, Igreja de Santa Isabel, mm -hmm. Elizabeth. Uh, and there's uh, um, the, so the Aboboda uh, was, um, they asked a painter and it's really, uh, and they won um, a prize, the Villalva Prize recently, and it's very, very beautiful. And, and it was a, a remarkable uh, work of uh, interdisciplinarity, you know, all people working together was, this is architecture and it's mostly rehabilitation. So yeah. it's impossible to work alone. Unfortunately, Noto is not successful. The people is angry with the bishop because they don't like that kind of uh, style within a Baroque church. It doesn't match uh, at all. <laughs> so it's very contradictory. So 
So they should they should discuss, and the bishop should discuss with the people. Ah, uh, but the bishop doesn't want to discuss. That's the problem. <laughs> He says, "This is my church, and they want to do what they want." <laughs> well, okay. Let's take a coffee. Okay. See you later. Okay. Bye bye. Ciao ciao. Ciao ciao. I, I will be back, eh, but I go to take a coffee. Bye. Okay. I I only be back later on. Bye bye. Bye bye. Mar. Uh, bye bye. Voi, bye. Te, te llamo? I, I'm calling you. Hello, uh, we are about to start our second part uh, of uh, this morning session. Uh, my name is Milica Milojevic. Uh, I'm assistant professor at the Faculty of Architecture, University of Belgrade. Uh, and um, I have a great pleasure to open this uh, session, welcoming Vito Oliveira, the Secretary General of the International Seminar on Urban Form and the president of the Portuguese Language Network of Urban Morphology. He is principal researcher at the Research Center for Territory Transports and Environment and Professor Oxler of Urban Morphology and Urban Planning at ULP. His research area are urban morphology, urban planning, architecture, and cities. Today, he will give an overview of what urban morphology is and how it relates to professional practice in the built environment and what it offers to understand change. Uh, we are all facing the change in our everyday life, our community and our professional activities, and we think about adaptation, resilience and resistance deeper than before. Let's look, let's look how urban morphologist thinks on change today and associate what kind of energy he brings to the field of urban morphology. Uh, please welcome Mr. Vito Oliveira. Uh, good morning. Thank welcome. You for... Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Um, I will share my screen. Okay. Uh, do you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I think I can start. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, Professor Vladen for uh, the invitation to to join you uh, today. It, it is a, a great pleasure for me. Um, I have seen the three last uh, presentations and I have enjoyed uh, very much. Uh, so today, uh, as the title says, um, I'm going to talk about uh, urban morphology and change. Uh, and I will do that uh, based on my experience on education and uh, research um, in, in the field of urban morphology. Um, and I do that, I, I teach um, students, mainly students of architecture, but uh, sometimes uh, students of planning and of, of geography. So I try to, to gather this uh, experience of uh, research and teaching in these uh, four books that I've published in, in the last five years with, uh, with Springer. So urban morphology is the field of knowledge that uh, studies the physical form of cities. 
And um, to do that, we, we start with, with a natural context in a way very similar to uh, the first uh, presentation uh, today uh, by my colleague, uh, Maria. Um, and we continue that by looking through at the spaces where we move through in urban areas. Uh, so we have a look at, at streets, at squares. Uh, we try to understand the different street blocks that uh, configure these uh, streets and, and squares and to understand how they are divided into into uh, different plots. Plots of very different sizes and shapes, as you can see in this image, that is just a small stretch of one street here in my city at uh, Porto. And we try to understand how this diversity of plots uh, influences uh, diversity of building footprints and, of course, of uh, building fabric. So we, we are especially interested in the ordinary common buildings. Um, I like very much one expression that uh, the first presenter, Maria, again, uh, has used. Uh, uh, she was looking at the architecture of the people. And I like to think that uh, we also uh, do it. Um, so we look at ordinary and at special uh, singular buildings also. Uh, but most important than, than these elements taken in isolation is the fact that we try to understand the physical form of cities through an understanding of how these different elements uh, are combined uh, in different ways in all over the planet. And we can see by that just by this different com by this com combination in different patterns of streets, plots, and buildings, we have a huge diversity of urban landscapes. So I would say that um, my lessons for for an architectural students um, they represent a challenge to change from the design of extraordinary buildings to the analysis and in the first moment is just analysis uh, is not yet design to the analysis of all 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 elements that make the physical form of cities for a planning student uh, on on the other hand uh, the challenge would be to recover uh, certain uh, common sense, a certain sense of uh, physical form uh, that is, is not very present in planning theory and planning uh, uh, research where issues such as discourse and negotiations and politics tend to be uh, more present. But urban morphology is about change. It is about processes of change. So in each specific setting, we need to understand what can be changed and what must be preserved. And uh, my colleagues have all uh, touched in this issue of heritage, of what to preserve, perhaps um, the second presentation by uh, Stefano has been the most explicit on that uh, topic, but we all uh, address this uh, this thing of the balance between preservation, preservation and change. And we also have to understand what are the main drivers of, of change. So uh, how do we keep transforming our cities, for instance, from this to this? And of course, here we have uh, a long time period of transformation. But if we move from to, to another uh, different context, uh, what are the changes that have framed this uh, urban landscape in New York, in Manhattan, in the Chelsea district? What has controlled 
what has been controlled by the public initiative and what was left to the multiple individual decisions. Or more directly, what is the influence of this ground plan, this ground plan that was designed in 1811 and that uh, clearly established the avenues and streets, the street blocks and the plots? What is the influence of this ground plan in the Manhattan that we know uh, today? And what has changed in this ground plan in 200 years? What were the ideas or what were the main goals of the four men that have uh, designed this notable plan? So one, one major lesson in, in urban morphology is that for us to understand the present and have some ideas about the future, we have to understand the past. We have to understand the long history of um, getting together and live together in, in cities. So this is an, a history with almost uh, 6,000 uh, years. And um, we try to have a look uh, at the main changes and permanences that uh, have uh, taken place in this uh, six millennium of, of history. So when looking at each of these periods of um, our urban history, we try to understand uh, the simple things that we are studying in today landscape. So how was a street in Irvine? Or uh, what was uh, the plot pattern that we had, for instance, in Dubrovnik? How are the buildings of the simple, ordinary buildings of Palmanova of, or of Novkrizash? And uh, we get to today's um, very complex and dynamic setting uh, of, uh, of, uh, our, of the settlements that uh, uh, that we have uh, in uh, 2020 or 2021. So what we see here is um, first, a, a very important thing, uh, more than half of us live in cities. Uh, we all know that, but uh, it's something that is very recent. Um, it has not been uh, like that until uh, uh, just some few years ago. Um, another thing that we can see here is that 23% of us lives in settlements that are smaller than 300,000 inhabitants. And on the other end of the spectrum, we see that almost one in each 10 persons lives in megacities, in 36 megacities, meaning cities that are uh, 10 million or, or more. And if you look at the map and at the red dots, uh, we see that more than half of these mega cities is located in Asia, six in China and six in India, which is uh, incredible. And again, a very recent uh, fact. Uh, so when we look at all this, we, we, we see that we have um, our object, the city, uh, has it's very complex and very dynamic. When you think of mega cities, uh, in 1950 we had only two. It was just New York and and Tokyo. So urban morphology, as a field of knowledge, started to be developed in the late 19th century in Central Europe and within urban geography. Um, with the rise of, of the Nazi party in, um, in Germany, the core of this morphological approach moves from Germany to the UK. Um, in the mid 20th century, it was based in Newcastle upon time. And after the 70s, it was clearly centered in Birmingham. What does this approach 
give to us researchers and practitioners. Um, it aims at offering a detailed reading of the elements of urban form and of how they change over time. And that is uh, very important. Um, it makes evident that some elements are more resistant to change than others. Streets are very difficult to change, while on the other hand, uses are apparently easy to, uh, to, to be transformed. It also demonstrates that a correct understanding of the built environment depends on our ability to work at different scales simultaneously. So this is a map by uh, Jeremy Whitehand. Um, it's a map of Newcastle. And what we see here is that he is trying to understand the metropolitan dynamics of Newcastle. And at the same time, he's trying to understand what happens, what are the changes that take place in each of these plots. One of the concepts that has more potential for application in planning practice is uh, the concept of morphological region, meaning an area of uh, a great homogeneous in terms of the main elements of urban form. And um, this concept has a particular method to, um, to be uh, developed, made of um, standardized, uh, let's call it like that, uh, steps. And this makes it applicable by any practitioner. And as such, it can be an alternative to traditional zoning based on uses that are uh, applied in practice everywhere. So here we have a division into different parts. So it's all, all also zoning, but this a zoning based on forms. Each of these areas is delimited by um, the cohesion, the coherence in terms of urban form and the regulations for the transformation of these urban forms over time is deeply related to uh, the physical landscape and to the social landscape. So in the first decades of the 20th century, uh, a new morphological approach started to be developed in Italy in architecture. And uh, while it was mainly based in, in Rome for several decades, after the 70s, it started to be spread all over Italy and a bit uh, around Europe. Um, it shares with the former the focus on history and uh, to a certain extent also a, a focus on, on the building fabric. Um, one of the most useful concepts for practice on the built environment is the idea of a typological process. Um, we all have seen building types. Uh, in fact, uh, again, the first presenter today, Maria, has shown us some building types. And the idea here would be to collect the building types of a certain territory and to place them into a timeline and in this timeline, each building type would be um, part of a, 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 se a sequence that uh, takes place over time. So one type, one building type is the result of transformations in the former building type. And it contains in itself the basis for future transformations. So this idea is quite powerful for research, but it is even more interesting for practice. So if, if you look at the lower part of the slide, uh, you see a reading of transformations in Genoa. And what you see here, uh, it's a project uh, that is strongly determined by uh, this uh, reading of how 
ordinary buildings have been transformed in time in this Italian city. Uh, both the analysis and the project are uh, by Gianfranco Canigia. Well, in, in the 70s, a new morphological approach started to be developed in London, in the UK. Um, it was developed by architects, not only, but by architects, as in the former case. But um, it is much more quantitative uh, than um, the approach developed by uh, the Italian architects. Uh, here, the focus is on the relation between space and society. At, uh, at the urban scale, the core of this approach is in streets, in how streets are organized within a city like London, Beijing, Tokyo, Brazil, um, and how this organization of streets enables or disables movement, enables or uh, disables integration. So um, what we look here in this, uh, what we see here in these four maps is um, a, the pattern of integration and segregation of the different parts that make this, uh, these four cities. Contrarily to the two former approaches, uh, history is not a key issue for, uh, for space syntax, but the future is. So one of the possibilities that this approach gives us is after building these models, which are models of the present situation, uh, we can um, calculate what would be the impact of the design of new streets. Or, in a more detailed look, what would be the impact of changes in some particular uh, public spaces. For instance, here, this is uh, one of the first iconic projects of this approach, is the redesign of Trafalgar Square, um, which was done together with Norman Foster. And what is here at, at SAIC is uh, looking at the pattern of movement uh, and redesign the, um, the public space of Trafalgar Square by doing changes in the space that is for pedestrians and the space that is for cars. And within the space for pedestrians, try to make slight changes that would have a, um, a sound impact, for instance, changing the place of a staircase. So to conclude, because I'm getting very near uh, the 20 minutes, this is just, um, these are just two tables or two parts of the same table um, of how do I organize these contents uh, in, my, in my lessons of urban morphology, first focusing on the city itself, and then on the way how we researchers uh, look at cities and on how some of these theories, concepts, and methods are applied in planning practice and in uh, architectural practice. So I would just like to conclude with this uh, paragraph uh, that is uh, taken from, from my book, from the first of those four books that I show you in the first slide, and it, it is the core of my uh, teaching course. So this is a course on cities, on their physical form, and on, on how we, urban morphologists and practitioners, describe, explain, and act on this physical form. It is also an invitation to a number of fabulous books that have been published um, in this century of, uh, of life of, of this uh, field of knowledge. But more important than that is it's an invitation to students to contribute to make his or her city uh, a better city and to visit and enjoy other cities in different parts of the world. So if you want, it is an analogy to 
diversity, to the diversity of places and to the diversity of, um, of people. So thank you for your attention and I will stop sharing. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, we have questions. Uh, no. So we can uh, go to the, our uh, next uh, guest uh, and uh, uh, second lecture in this session, Professor uh, Michel Melenkos, our guest from Detmold, uh, OWL University of Life Science and Arts. He holds the chair for contextual design, building transformation, reuse, and cultural heritage. He's a member of Dokumomo International and is active in Dokumomo Deutschland Work Group Education. He is coordinating the Master in Architecture at the faculty. He's project coordinator of the project Reuse of Modernist Buildings. Today, he will be sharing with us his experience in developing educational models and proactive approach for working with modernist heritage. I believe that those who are interested in the future of modernistic settlement structures or design and those who are dedicated to the idea of proactive role of future architects, as well as those who have doubts in that, will give their full attention to this presentation. Professor Michel Malforst. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And um, I will share my screen. Um, let's see. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's OK. OK. So hello from, from Detmold. I think I'm the most in the there some thoughts and some ideas on a project uh, on since 2016. It's called RB Reuse of Modernist Building. And I want to emphasize uh, or to, to look a little bit closer to one of the workshops that we that we did. But first of all, I will tell you um, about what is RMB. Actually, it's it's uh, it has a lot of similarities to uh, to Harris's. Um, we want to reuse modernist buildings. That might be clear from 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 the title. We believe that our world we will be a better world if we reuse more, or continue to use. Uh, reuse can also be just continuing using what what we have. Um, we started in 2016. The official end of the project was in 2019, but we continued afterwards uh, with organizing all kinds of uh, workshops and uh, seminars, uh, conferences. So let me explain you a little bit about the backgrounds of this, of this project. Um, we think, as I said, if we want a better world, we should Mm, reuse more more buildings. Um, we want to educate students in how to do this, and we want to educate students on a European level. Um, we have been searching with a group of six partners, uh, our university, University of Antwerp, initially Istanbul Technical University, uh, later uh, the University of Belgrade came to the consortium, Coimbra, uh, Technico from, from Lisbon and Docomomo International. See if we can share the knowledge that we have within our faculties to set up um, an educational project that will educate students on reuse of modernist building uh, on a European base. Why um, modernist building? Well, if you look at the chart at the, at the right side, you can see that we have a lot of it. Um, so in Germany, for instance, 30% of constructions were realized from 1949 to 1978 and then uh, afterwards. So it's the majority of buildings. And if you intervene there, if you, if you, or if you keep them and continue using them, uh, it has a huge uh, effect. In our educational program, it's not just about stones. Um, it's about different things in modernism that we want to address uh, society, the societal level. It's about spaces uh, outside of modernist architecture. And uh, on 
course, uh, the use of material. Uh, we want to show how green or how sustainable modernist architecture often, often is. So these are three levels. And like I said, different partners from Europe brought in their specific knowledge to, to work on this, uh, on this project. It's interesting that we have um, five universities and one non-university being Docomomo International. And I think from Docomomo International being part of our consortium uh, from, the, from the start, we had a, a very activist approach. Uh, we just saw the lecture by us and you can imagine something. So we really go for it. Uh, we talk with people, we phone them, we, we look for them to, to find projects that we can actually participate in. Uh, so that's, that's important in this consortium. And then we also have um, some outsiders, I would say, which have a, have a specific role, Terry from, from India. They will help us to connect from Europe to the rest of the world, to Asia, to South America, North America. And we have a supervisory board and an advisory board checking on what we're doing, bringing in their knowledge to make it um, a better um, a, a better project. So what are our tools, our methods and our goals? Um, we want to make combinations of traditional learning and e-learning forums, combine on-site events such as conferences and workshops, but also online events. In the meantime, we all have become quite experienced in, <laughs> in these online uh, events, remote teaching and design education, but it was not really self-evident uh, in 2016 when we started. Like I said, we want to prepare a joint master on the reuse of modernist buildings. We want to contribute to better awareness and knowledge on reuse as a way to reach climate neutrality, carbon neutrality, and in general, raise the appreciation of modernist buildings resulting in preservation of important heritage in buildings and neighborhoods. Because, you know, this, this after war modernism after 45 is quite vulnerable, uh, not much loved in many ways by people. Uh, but we found out that at the moment that you involve communities, people uh, in thinking about a future for this, that, that preparation of the master, uh, we use this working document, we uh, define different lines uh, for design projects. Project is that students will travel and will different climate zones, different attitudes towards heritage and how to preserve it. So first semester, uh, they are in uh, the northwestern part of Europe. So somewhere in Detmold or in Antwerp. Um, second semester in uh, uh, Portugal, so southwest Europe. Third semester in southeast or middle Europe, Belgrade and initially um, Istanbul. And the fourth semester is free to choose for um, for a thesis project. Um, in the end, we made this out of it and there are some lines continuous over three semesters, the history of modernism, which of course is a little bit different in the Northwest, North, Southeast, Southwest and outside of Europe. So each semester there's the possibility to uh, go deeper into the specific conditions um, on, the, on the place where the students actually are. Uh, reuse theory and background. We have been reusing buildings since buildings exist. Huh? So we give them a background in this, uh, in this respect. Energy and sustainability. Uh, also in urban space. Pre-design projects with different focuses. Uh, and then there are some semester specials focused on topology research and methodology, assessment of buildings in use, social aspects, housing, building construction. We will start this um, um, master September 2. Take some time, also Corona due. Um, but we're in the middle of, of accreditation processes and fine tuning uh, the curriculum. Um, 
and in the meantime we continue with all kind of activities. I want to share some of them with you to show you what we've done in those four or five years. We organized many conferences starting 2017 um, combined with a facade conference in Detmold, Coimbra we had on the tools of reuse and design we had a workshop very interesting cold workshop it was incredible april in coimbra i've never been so cold um, and we had a two-day uh, conference mm, the last conference was was very interesting in berlin 100 years of bauhaus organized in collaboration with docomomo germany we had some uh, very uh, good keynote lectures, David Chipperfield, Fernando Romero and uh, Villaretz and a lot of sessions, parallel sessions. What's interesting from these conferences and workshops that we shared the knowledge from them in, in magazines like here in the architectural magazine of uh, Coimbra University. So we not only used the conferences to get information into RMB to use in our curriculum, but also to share it afterwards. And uh, Anna already uh, presented Documomo Journal and um, after the Berlin conference, we made this um, journal on education and reuse with a very interesting interview with both David Chipperfield and uh, Will Aretz that Anna and I held together in Berlin and, and Amsterdam. But let us focus a little bit on, on the workshops now, and especially perhaps the, the, uh, the workshop that we did in Detmold. I want to highlight some things. But we, we had workshops in Germany, in Istanbul. Um, we joined uh, as a kind of startup workshop, a Docomobo workshop in Lisbon. We were in Marl, in Antwerp, and in, in Coimbra. We defined... Um, a strategy, a process for the workshops that we followed in all the workshops. So the first day is quite dense with presentations of the topics, some initial lectures with specialists from outside, site visits. We always worked on site with workshop. And then in three days, students define a concept, but not just define the concept, but also define a strategy on how to realize uh, the concepts in a project. Uh, and then afterwards, the results are made public, presented, uh, not just within the workshop group, but always with the municipality, uh, with, with developers, uh, with heritage specialists. So the, the results are shared to a wider audience. The focus of the workshop might be different. It can be on the location, the history, the climate, time. It can be on program. It can be on material. Um, the student group is always uh, like 40 students and then five groups of background and qualifications. So both from where they come from the region, but also their, um, it's a multidisciplinary workshop. Architects, it's also urban planners, heritage students, uh, civil engineers. And that's also the idea for the RMB master that we have uh, uh, a wild bunch of, uh, of students, so to speak. So let us focus on this specific workshop after the military has gone that we organized 2019 in, in Detmold. It's a workshop in Detmold, but it has uh, a meaning for the whole. Because as you might know, after the Second World War, Germany was split in four zones, Russian, American, British and French. Uh, and a lot of military came into Germany Detmold was in the British zone and um, the British occupied uh, barracks that were built in the 30s uh, by on the, on the National Socialist regimes. One, one of those so-called 100 days uh, barracks they were built in 100 days. Initially, it was just the, the barracks itself, so where the soldiers were. But after the British came and they wanted to stay for... <laughs> for quite a long time and they did actually from the late 40s till the late 90s they built housing for um for the soldiers um i don't know can you can you see my my mouse on the on the screen or i can comment a little bit so this here this part is the barracks and here you see the the houses that were built and 
like like the barracks, it's very militarily organized. So you have um, apartment blocks for the soldiers. You have row houses for the lower officers. Uh, you have doubles for the little bit higher. And then here there are two small villas for the commanders. Um, what you also see, what's interesting, and that, that there are no plots. There is no, you know, they they all stand on common ground, so to speak. Um, those soldiers would live here for, for a couple of years and then return to Britain. So they had no time really gardening or taking care of, um, of the area just around their houses. And what's also quite interesting, although it's not a gated community, there was no interest from the military to, uh, to connect to the city of Detmold. Um, because, you know, when, when a war starts, it's not good to have emotional relationships with, uh, with the locals. So. Uh, it was not closed off, but Detmold people did not go there and the military did not go into Detmold or hardly did. So after the military uh, left, well, I see it's not working. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, it's hanging. Yeah, now it's continuing again. Um, and now my, sorry for this. Uh, I see that my drawings are still there. So now they're gone. So here you see the different typologies in the, in the area uh, marked by, uh, by color. But what I wanted to say that after the, the military had gone, uh, it was still a, an enclave within Detmold. Nobody knew about it, nobody went there. It uh, remained empty like a ghost town for 10 years, more even, 15 years. And the only thing the municipality could think about is demolish it and, and build something new. So here you see some of the apartment blocks in the, in the area. We offered them to organize a workshop, um, international workshop, to see what could we do if we can in any way make these houses match the needs of contemporary society. I think that's always the goal that you have to follow here. You see an extreme example of Candelas and Woods in Morocco and how it looks afterwards. So if something happened in between, you might not like it, but somehow they used the buildings in a different way than how they were built and exactly that's what we wanted the students to, to research. Um, we defined themes before for the students uh, so that we would have a quick start. And one of it was, can these houses change in size? Can you add or can you take parts away? So it's about growing and it's about shrinking. Another thing is how can young and old live together? Uh, are they accessible? Are they big enough? Are these houses um, usable uh, for living together of more generations? It's a very um, important topic at the moment, also in, in Germany. But also, uh, Detmold being a student town, can you think of other kinds of living together? Like the commune, can you realize these kind of living together forms in, this, um, in these houses? Can they become productive because, you know, they were just housing, but can we have shops? Can we have offices? Can we have uh, workshops in these buildings? Should it be always in one house that I live? Can I have a relation living in one house and my partner lives in another house, living apart together? Is that an option for these buildings? And then the last topic was the house. House, we called it, can... Uh, people from Detmold realized their, their suburban dream of having their own freestanding house with garden based on the typologies that we, that we have. We had a, a workshop with 12 different uh, nationalities um, working there over, over a week on these topics and they made a very beautiful booklet. Uh, I don't do justice to them, not, not presenting it now, but um, it's just not enough time. To, uh, to do this now. With the results, um, and that makes it special, we informed the design workshop that continued in a smaller group of students to work with the results 
of the workshop. And we did it um, in a way that's often used in participation models called Now How Wow. And it um, takes all ideas serious, but says, okay, this one is easy to implement. We know about it, we know how it goes. It's, it's good to do it here. Uh, so that's, that's, that's fine. How it's a little bit more difficult. It's innovative breakthrough ideas, but they can be implemented. And wow, are the green ideas not to forget, but perhaps for the future. Uh, so every single idea is taken seriously, which is important. Uh, so nothing falls down. So we did with the results of the workshop, we try to, uh, to bring them into these now, how, wow categories. And we soon noticed that many of the ideas had to do with actually uh, a pretty um, uh, with a change of context. So, which is a very modernist approach. Actually, we see here Marcel Duchamp bringing ordinary objects into a museum and then they become art. But you can take the same approach for, for building, changing the context and changing the meaning of it. It can be building parts, it can be materials, it can be the neighborhood. And I want to show you two projects by students who actually took this this way with reuse of material, building parts, change of entrance positions, change of plot size and forms. Also about property. And the first one is a project by um, Mar Marvin Dusterhus. And what he said, in the 60 years uh, of existence, a lot of additions, good, bad, were made to these houses. If we want to retrofit them, they should be taken out, but perhaps we can can use them. We can continue using them, but change their position. So take out the plastic fence, uh, uh, window frames, um, the roof tiles, not the best condition for a roof tile, but perhaps they can become cladding for, um, for a facade. Uh, also the fences around the, 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 the plots, can we use them in a different way? And also the plaster stones, a lot of plaster stones in this area. Can we make it greener and reuse the plaster stones? So he took one of the apartment blocks, um, made it um, made an uh, energetic uh, restoration of it and made a new cladding with old roof tiles. He also took the rooftop, which was built in uh, in wood and lifted it two meters to make it accessible. Um, so it's, it's interesting what's happening. You make a continuation of the materials over time, but reposition it. So people will still recognize it from form and, and color. Um, and here, for instance, in this rooftop, all of a sudden the chimneys, they uh, don't people out of the roof anymore, they become objects in this in this space. So it's an interesting change of, of con context and also the, um, the transparency inside outside is of course different here in the rooftop than it is in the other areas where you still can see the old facade shimmering through the new covering. What he also did is um, maintaining the, the blocks which are there, but adding to them. So change the form of the urban space, make it more specific. And also here, he took parts of, of roofs, changed it. So the wood of the roof is, is used again, but the form of the roof is changed, marking an entrance here. And this entrance is marked again with old rain pipes, uh, covering uh, stairs going up there. And like you can see here, um, there is a diversity of, of spaces compared to the original situation. Perhaps an even more low-tech approach uh, only has to deal with changing the, mark, the lines of the, of the plots on the side and about property. What the student did is, uh, so this on the left is the original situation. Um, street, street, uh, double houses, and step by step, he made a patchwork of new plot sizes. And what's interesting is that actually the size of the plot and the position of the house on the plot informs, um, make, make, makes it contextual. So the entrance uh, will be different if your house is uh, on the back side of the plot or is, if it's at the street. So here you see some nice models, conceptual models that he, um, that he made. 
and here we see the actual urban plan and then parts of it become uh, basketball fields also little places for parking uh, sometimes the house needs an addition but you see that uh, originally everything came from the same size it was uniform and here it is the diversification of um, of the basic material so there are some interesting effects of of these workshops and the works out uh, working out in the um, um, in the design project actually this doesn't look so spectacular but we convinced the city of Detmold uh, to organize a competition uh, in reusing the buildings uh, initially they wanted to demolish them but with the results they were convinced that they have more possibilities and more potential in them than what they initially thought and also by making the results public to uh, the dead molders in the newspaper and inviting them for the presentations people became aware of the, the qualities that were there and that's something that we found out in all the workshops that we did that that the reactions from the, the local so to speak uh, that now they found out ah, this is what modernism is about uh, oh, and they also found out well demolishing them is not such a good idea is our cities change too fast people start to be proud on what they have and very important building have has a character like humans so you should give it time to grow and to develop uh, and can preserve it but you can also continue uh, using it never knew this house had so much potential people also say yeah this is actually where I grew up uh, like I also grew up in in the 60s 70s and so it's part of my heritage let's keep some more growing awareness very important thing so over the time and already from the start but more and more also thanks to the Docomomo approach we became sort of R&B activists so we organized workshops not always telling uh, the people involved what we are going to do because often they are afraid that, that something will come out they don't like uh, developers oh, 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 oh. so we say oh it's for students and they learn a lot and they actually do learn a lot but in the end we also uh, use it in a political way so I want to invite you to our next action which is going to take place in September if Corona will allow us uh, to, to do so, because we want to work on site, not, not online. So it's Bielefeld, um, not far from Detmold, like 400,000 inhabitants. And we identified two zones that we start working on. On the right side, it's the old University of Applied Science that moved outside of the city and left vacant, a very interesting building. And here on the market, it's the old police station. This is the, um, uh, the old university, which has a very nice auditorium. Um, and it's one of those unspectacular, but very well-made good buildings from the 60s, 70s. We go into it, we will work there with students for a week. We'll sleep there, we cook and think what can be the potential for it because it's listed to be demolished. And, and as often it's motivated this demolishment by uh, there is asbestos asbest in the, in the building. Uh, so we have to demolish it, which is completely ridiculous because, you know, regulations in Germany and I think everywhere are so strict on how to demolish, how to take out asbestos that the moment that they did so, they have a perfect building free of asbest to continue to use. So it's, it's a ridiculous reason. Anyway. The next workshop will be here September 2021. If you'd like to participate, contact me. We'll be working here in this space and make nice proposals for the future. And hopefully they will change their mind and try to keep the building. I think in the end, it comes down to this, that anything becomes interesting if you look at it long enough. Uh, from Gustave Flaubert, and I think very often that's the problem. People just don't look long enough at the potentials and the qualities of the buildings. So that was my presentation. Thank you very much for, for listening. And uh, of course, open for questions. Thank you very much for this uh, inviting presentation. In the end, uh, uh, I think that uh, workshops are uh, very important. Uh, our method and tool in educating uh, architects uh, and nowadays we have uh, a problem implementing them uh, uh, so I'm thinking about uh, 
alternative uh, way or tools uh, during these uh, days and uh, online format. Uh, do you have any suggestions for, for us in, in that sense? How, how we can continue doing this with, with online? Uh, well, yeah. actually, we did, we did some, um, uh, some experiments with it uh, that we worked on site with a gro small group, which, which was there, and we had advisors online. Uh, so we had a specific topic and we would be working in Germany, but students from, uh, from Lisbon, from Coimbra, from, from, from a distance, they would support us and check similar situations or bring in their knowledge or say, we did it like this here. Uh, so that's, that's perhaps a mixed possibility to continue uh, doing that. Yes, there is a trouble to, to make a connection between and experience of uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, a topic uh, and the site. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that remains difficult because I think you know if you're working with buildings, you want you want to smell them, you want to touch them, which is also a great benefit in working with with heritage that you, it's there and and there are people that might be using it, so you can talk to them and share share the experience. Um, yeah, but we also became more. Um, uh, that's that's the optimum form, but we be, we became more experienced the last year, I think, in filming and, and uh, being online and and sharing things. But it's yeah, it's it, it remains suboptimal, I would say. <laughs> I hope we will see you on the site. Mm -hmm. Hope so too. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Michel. Uh, and now we are pleased to uh, welcome uh, Paraskevi Korki from Thessaloniki. She is Managing Director of Strategic Planning, Urban Development and Funding of Pavlos Melas Municipality. Her core skills include strategic planning and implementation, EU policies, urban development and social challenges. Her parallel academic interests uh, and research involvement secures theoretical knowledge of urban policies, including the Green Agenda. She will share with us uh, her professional experience of uh, decision-making and strategy shaping activities at municipality level for the case of the historic site of ex-military camp of Pavlos Melas in Thessaloniki. This presentation will give us an insight into the local obstacles of the implementation of the Green Agenda in, our, in one particular case. Trees versus heritage is a trigger for this presentation. I have compassion for a single tree, uh, and I look forward to nature-based solution for the transformation of ex-military camp. With that in mind, I ask you to help me welcoming uh, Paraskeva Koiti. Hello, thank you very much for having me here today. Is my sound okay? Do you listen to me okay? Yes. Okay. So thank you again for having me to this seminar. Uh, following all these exquisite pre uh, presentations by academic and researchers, I feel that there are so many important aspects of this seminar that have already been mentioned. And it's a, a great opportunity for me to be, to have this feeling of the academic environment again. Uh, what I hope to bring in today's discussion comes from a different point of view, let's say, a managerial point of view, and it has to do with some issues that in my professional experience affect decision-making and policy-making in the field of heritage preservation. So allow me to share my screen. Is it okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, uh, for highlighting my arguments, I'm going through the case study of the reuse of the area of the ex-military camp of Pavlos Melas in Thessaloniki, uh, a city in the northern part of Greece, and it's a municipal project of the urban scale. Pavlos Melas camp was established in 1895, sorry, in 1985 by the Ottoman army, that's while the city of Thessaloniki was still under Ottoman rule and in an area that at that time was a peri-urban non-habituated site. The Ottomans acquired a piece of land 
that was actually nearly the half of the size of today's camp and constructed a building project consisting of two long two stories barracks, four horse stables, a headquarters and a build a headquarters building and a mosque. These two buildings are the barracks, the four stables, the headquarters and the mosque. The construction was assigned to German architects and engineers because Pavlos Melas, at that time called Topsuki Slasi, it was a Turkish name, was part of a bigger developmental project of buildings and infrastructure uh, that the Ottomans operated in the city. And while they struggled to modernize and thus maintain what was left of their empire. Pavlos Melas remained a military camp in all of its history. And that means fenced in secrecy, excluding and excluded from whatever happened around it and in the rest of the city area. The Greek army succeeded the Ottoman after 1912, which is the year of the liberation of the city, and expanded the camp at nearly double of its previous land area. In the interwar period, the Greek army constructed a group of warehouses in the northwest part of the camp. And they also put out for the two bags that consisted of replacing the internal wooden bearing system of, of, uh, by columns and beams of concrete. At the Second World War, the German army succeeded the Greek one in the status of the occupation of the camp. And from here on begins the most painful part of its history, a history connected with the most troubled and regretful decades of social and political history in Greece. The forces of occupation divided the area into half and turned the northern part into a military camp for armed forces and its southern part into a concentration camp for imprisonment, the deportation and the extermination of various groups of people, Jews, fighters of national resistance, hostages of various nationalities and others. The Greek army reoccupied, reoccupied the area of the camp, but many of its buildings continue to be used as prisons through the years of the Greek civil war. And after that, until 1974, that the Junta was over and the third Greek Republic was established. The camp was then turned into a common military base for the armed forces until the year 2006, when abandoned by the troops without a single thought of actions needed for the protection of the historical buildings. The municipality claimed the camp from 1997, I mean the property of the land of the camp from 1997 until 2017, that's nearly 20 years, when a final agreement was set up with the Ministry of Defense. Through all of those years, the historical buildings suffered tremendous destruction from fires, thefts, and erosion. Let me note that until recently, the history of the camp was not at all known. Its Ottoman origin was not obvious because the buildings had all those Western characteristics and the minaret of the mosque was demolished sometime early at the interwar period. Even less was known about the next important layer of history, that of being a concentration camp. We started to enrich our knowledge of the camp's past due to the research done after 2010 from the Department of Architecture of the Aristotle. Some knowledge of what happened to the Second World War came into light after a research project that was funded by the German embassy. Through this research, we were able to reconstruct the topography of the camp at the era, the way it operated, identify the names of a small number of prisoners, how many of those were deported to other camps for extermination and how many of them were killed into site. Municipal actions were taken Municipal actions were taken in order to educate 
the public about the site's heritage, and that included funding a documentary, making education programs and campaigns to schools, meetings and discussions. But nevertheless, at a research that we conducted at the neighborhoods surrounding the camp, it was evident that people did not correlate to any of these fragments of history. They did not have any personal or family memories, and they were reluctant to reflect any further to these issues, with the exception of those citizens of old age that had also a strong political orientation towards the left or were members of the left-wing parties of Greece. Through the almost two decades of indication and rivalry between the municipality and the Ministry of Defense about the ownership of the camp, a few proposals of rehabilitation and reuse were put up. That came from architectural competitions, in-house municipal proposals, and some of external partners. And they were all visualizing the fortunate outcome that would be if the city acquired the land. And those proposals had all something in common. The old proposed the additions of new buildings of various forms in the site. By the year 2017 that the municipality acquired the land though, we would have come through a crucial change in viewing and acting about city issues and challenges. I am referring to what have started as a major shift in action, in social action towards the protection of the environment and then, and then gradually transformed theoretical knowledge, technical solutions, policies and fundings towards what I call an environmental shift. Some say that this new reality, sorry, some say that this new reality of nature and human civilization reconciliation came out of gradual steps of humanity's cognitive maturation. And this is probably true. But if we can examine and compare past ways of responding to city challenges, it becomes obvious that it is always a move in concepts and ideas and that in 20 years from now, people will probably will be thinking very differently than what we do today. As soon as the municipality acquired the land, we had to put up a strategic plan for its reuse. We researched and analyzed various technical solutions, technical, social, environmental, and economic data about the camp and its surrounding area. Main decisions of the strategic plan was first and foremost, prioritizing a project for the fundamental upgrade of the open air green area of the camp in order to offer 320,000 square meters to the public, demolishing around 10,000 square meters of buildings that were of no historical value and they were poorly preserved. And then as a third action, as a, a second phase action, aiming in the restoration and reuse of the historical core buildings of the Ottoman area, mainly by public uses, as well as the use of the Northern Park buildings by private uses of commerce and services. The project was named as Metropolitan Park of Pavlos Melas, and its budget was estimated around 62 million euros, 20 of which were needed for the green open area intervention. Besides all the data and the elements analyzed, there were two crucial factors that underline that decision. First and foremost, the knowledge that in, in our municipality was various groups, organizations, NGOs that were intensively active in the environmental issues. Some of these groups played a crucial role in the negotiations with the army by putting pressure to the government of that time at the public demand of having the vacant land turned into a much needed park. The second crucial factor was the pressure for ensuring the first stage funding. Funding is the driving gear of all agendas and policy making actions. The environmental shift I was previously referring to transformed totally the funding backup scenery the last decade. And let me explain that for a few minutes more. Greece, and I guess other countries of the European South, 
was always heavily dependent on the structural funding of the EU, especially in the municipal level. From 2007, that was when the Lisbon Treaty was signed and onwards, there was a crucial change at the character of policies that serve convergency. And in budget structure, that means that 25 of all EU budget is directed to social actions against unemployment, poverty, exclusion, and 50% up to 8% of the budget of the European redevelop uh, uh, of, I'm sorry, of the European uh, Regional Development Fund is directed to um, research, innovation, new technologies, renewable energy, leaving out of eligibility, out of funding, whatever has to do with infrastructure, and infrastructure includes buildings too. So we can get an even uh, more indicative idea of how the policy funding scenery looks like for projects of restoration and reuse in Greece look, by looking at the funding conditions of the operational programs of the uh, Ministry of Culture in Greece, that was the, um, uh, the, the, what the, you showed in the previous, um, in the previous uh, public. And, um, or the available, the available funds for restoration projects in the national uh, scale for the last seven years. I think from this data that it becomes obvious that in terms of funding opportunities, green interventions are winning full ground. So policy priorities and funding scenery formulate a framework for me to imply that we live in an era of trees versus heritage, and that trees are winning so far. We were aware of these conditions when we set up our plan for Pavlos Melas, and that was a very crucial reason for forwarding the green innovation first and foremost. And although we knew that the historic buildings were in a very bad condition, uh, they were preserved in a very bad condition. As soon as our proposal was finished, the consultation process began with the public and other public and private bodies of the city. Through the discussions, one crucial point of discontent prevailed and had to do with the number of buildings that should be kept for restoration and reuse. The public was very persistent in asking for credentials that no, no new buildings uh, would be built as, and I quote a phrase from the public consultation meetings, any new construction would devour the precious lad from trees. There were also proposals that asked for more buildings to be demolished, a group which I call environmental extremists because of their hardcore beliefs and actions, asked for the demolishment of all buildings so that the site could be a pure green deposit. Another group of citizens that were connected to the left political party proposed that the buildings which belonged to the, mid, to the middle war expansion of the camp could and should be demolished in order to make more space for vegetation and to inhibit permanent human activities to the camp. Explanations about the importance of keeping a crucial phase of the camp's history were turned down and a quote, a quote again, a characteristic of the conflict phrase of the group's leader that heritage talks of the past, but trees are our children's future. Other pro to this opinion arguments stated that historic buildings constantly need money while trees live out of nothing, that buildings are enjoyed by few, even if they are of public use, while parks are enjoyed by everyone. Although Political and administrative personnel was affected by these claims. We concluded in keeping our plan as it was originally constructed, influenced mainly by the thought that demolishing a building is a radical, non-reversible act. It's true that, though, that in social knowledge and understanding, there was a fight that can be presented as trees versus heritage, and that the latter is actually losing. This might be true for the case of Pavlos Melas that includes an orthodox and, uh, sorry, an obnoxious and painful history. 
as well as suppressed social memories. It is surely not applicable to all cases in Greece and definitely not of universal value. But what I like to keep from this case study is that there is a social claim or notion that heritage preservation speaks about the past while green intervention speaks about the future. And while for academics and policy officials maybe, it is obvious that trees versus heritage is actually a pseudo dilemma because rehabilitation and reuse of existing building stock is one of the most environmental friendly solution. I am sure that this knowledge is not at all embedded. Therefore, I conclude that what the Herzl's project is working on is of great value. In my opinion, it would be even of greater help if the discussion and outcomes escape the academic environment and pursue diffusion of knowledge in a broader public, agenda setting officials in national and supranational level, lobbying and supporting the idea that heritage reuse could and should be part of the new and very promising European Green Deal and thus be reconnected to the future. So thank you very much. I've com concluded my presentation. Thank you for the presentation. And do we have qu some questions? No. Uh, I have to ask the, uh, to say that uh, we received some more questions for the presentation before, and uh, uh, we will discuss about that uh, at the round table uh, at uh, one o'clock p.m. So uh, we can uh, go on with the session. Uh, we are going to conclude this uh, session with the next presentation. Uh, Professor Atmini Paka from Aristotle University at Thessaloniki. She is the head of, our, uh, of school, director of postgraduate program, environmental architecture and design, and team leader at the international funded research project SOS Climate Waterfront. Uh, her research focuses on subjects related to urban, environmental urban design and sustainable heritage management. And today she will sharing with us uh, her expert insight into extensive reconstruction work on restoration, reuse, and enhancement of a heritage site uh, integrated in the Athens uh, Historic Center for the Museum of Modern Greek Culture. This presentation will show how new structures are integrated in surrounding open space and historic landscape, as well as what losses of integrity of structural and construction components are. The question of integrity of today and future heritage is one of our common concerns. With that, I ask you to give your attention to this uh, presentation, Professor Mini Paka. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to participate. The previous presentations were really inspiring and I was very glad I had attended them. I will proceed with my, uh, with my PowerPoint, I will allow me to share my screen. Okay, now we can see your presentation. Wait a second. Great. So, um, I have to find my camera to turn it on. Okay. I cannot turn on my camera actually. It's okay, you can uh, present. Okay. Okay. okay, so um, I'm 
I'm sorry. So uh, I will be presenting you a case study, uh, which is actually a unique project in the practice of the Greek Ministry of Culture, who has a very standard and stereotypical uh, attitude towards the state uh, museums that uh, uh, it's running. Uh, we have very few private museums actually in Greece. And uh, this is a project that uh, it's quite apart from its uh, usual practice. So uh, it's uh, a mixed use uh, uh, urban block in the core of the historical city of Athens, in the old city of Athens. This is our building block right here in the center. It's a group of buildings opposite to the library of Hadrian, which is back here and the Roman Forum is over there is restored in order to house the main part of the premises of the State Museum of Modern Greek Culture. Well, this museum has a long history and a unique collection of objects uh, from the early 18th century to the late decades of the 20th century. Uh, it was founded in 1918 by a group of Athenian intellectuals under the name Museum of Greek Handicrafts. And in 1923, it was named as Greek Folk Art Museum. It was given its present name in 1959. Until 1973, the uh, museum was housed in this mosque that was given to it, uh, uh, a property of the state. Uh, so the exhibitions were there in the square of Monastiraki, a very central and busy part of the historical part of Athens, just opposite to the metro station, which is here. Here are all the uh, antiquities that visitors are usually visiting. And uh, uh, the permanent exhibition and the main functions were then transferred uh, because the space of the mosque was considered insufficient to mention inside the historical area of Plaka, which is all these we are looking here. And recently it has been transformed, uh, it transferred to its new premises. Well, the building block that we will be talking about, it's right here, right here, the whole building block. And some of the buildings be do not belong to the museum, but the core buildings have been expropriated and are now part of the museum premises. So the building block consists of 13 plus historical structures built around an open courtyard, uh, dating from the late 18th century until the end of the 20th century. Uh, we see buildings of the late Ottoman period, traditional vernacular townhouses and neoclassical buildings compose a unique example of unobstructed continuity in the urban fabric of Athens in close proximity to the Acropolis. So from the building block, the, uh, you see here the buildings that uh, we see the roofs are the ones that have been renovated and belong to the museum. Uh, there are also three more buildings that have been renovated for this purpose outside the building block. And uh, from the site, we see a closer look here, the site of the Acropolis is constant from all the open spaces. So it is an urban scale conservation project. And I would like to make some remarks concerning the role of cultural heritage in fulfilling sustainable development goals of the urban environment. In the last year's report by UN Habitat World Cities, we read, sustainable urbanization can play a key role in the decade of action to accelerate growth and shared prosperity to advance the achievement of sustainable development goals by 2030. In the same report, there is also a part concerning the management and promotion of cultural heritage contributing in this direction. We read, cities can build economies, 
around culture and creative industries, historic buildings in need of renovations, arts and crafts traditions that could prove nascent economic drivers, and cultural institutions like museums and performing art venues are all the building blocks of a creative economy. In order to implement sustainable development strategies and to improve quality of life, it is essential to use the potential of cultural heritage, especially the possibilities embodied in abandoned historic buildings and territories. So we observe here that the notion of sustainability involves rethinking development to integrate environmental, economic, social, and cultural goals linking issues of cultural heritage management. We know that no matter what the economic benefits of economic globalization, it is also true that there is also a substantive threat of cultural globalization. And therefore it is fundamental for every community to identify and maintain its own characteristic features and reflect diversity and identity of the place. And furthermore, historic preservation reinforces, as Donovan Ripkema, a professor of the University of Pennsylvania on conservation issues has defined, uh, the five senses of quality communities, which are sense of place, sense of identity, sense of evolution, sense of ownership and sense of community. So our case study promotes all five of these senses and during its analysis, we will be specifically referring to all of them. So uh, since conservation and heritage management is about preserving memories of previous periods of time, historical analysis of a heritage site is a fundamental prerequisite for defining the approach of any conservation project. So let's look at the different layers of historic periods, monuments of which are found in our case study and try to underline the sense of place, identity and evolution found in situ. So as I said before, we are here in uh, this block which stands next to the uh, Stoa of Attalus, which is this long building here forming, it was forming, the part, one part of the Athenian Agora, the classical Agora, who was placed here. The Roman Forum is here, and the Library of Hadrian is uh, this site where my arrows now. So I will be presenting um, a series of historic maps illustrating the evolution of this urban fabric of Athens, and more specifically, the particular site the building block is occupying. All maps are taken from the historical study of the city of Athens by John Travlos, architect and archaeologist, who has produced a thorough study of the city, urban evolution uh, and urban planning. So this is a plan of er early Roman and Hellenistic, Hellenistic rather than early Roman, Athens. The Acropolis stands right here, the Agora is here, and the long building we see, we saw in the previous slide, is right here, the Attalus uh, Stoa. Now in the next slide, we are moving something like uh, four centuries uh, later, after the destruction of the city in the third century uh, after Christ, we are having the demolition of this stoa uh, from the area of the agora and the roman uh, uh, government of the city decided to create here a narrow wall around the major institutions of the city you see here a line which is the Roman wall, well, this line, we will find it in our building block because it forms something like a spine of the whole uh, complex. So let's move uh, later on and see what the city of Athens had become after the uh, Byzantine times and during the long period of the Ottoman 
uh, governance of the city. So after the uh, ending of the uh, classical institutions by the Byzantines where Christianity prevailed, Athens was reduced to a very unimportant site. Uh, it was abandoned by most of its inhabitants and during the Ottoman period had, had been reduced in a small, almost a village, a settlement around the Acropolis. We see that the uh, site was occupied with a dense organic fabric. Uh, the open public spaces were very few and public buildings were very, very scarce. So by the time of the Greek Revolution that took place in the beginning of the 19th century in 1821 until 1833, uh, the city uh, uh, all degraded and from the fights, a big part of this urban fabric was destroyed. So um, as the Ottoman rule ended, in 1837, the city was in ruins and the Athenians tore down existing domestic buildings and there was new construction of neoclassical buildings with a direct reference to the city's classical past. So this image of the city to a great extent completely disappeared. So, um, Excavations and restoration of classical monuments were, uh, was a priority of the new Greek state, whereas memories of the Ottoman occupation were hastily buried along with a part, a considerable part of the Byzantine and medieval heritage of the city. And there was, uh, so here you see the neoclassical city with its axes, the diagonal axes that uh, the new Greek state established. Um, and the city uh, developed considerably. This is a plan of the early 20th century. And we see here the port of Piraeus and the city hasn't uh, completely extended because today the two settlements are completely united by urban sprawl. So there was a, a second phase, though, of extensive reconstruction and demolition that wiped out that neoclassical city. Uh, after the Second World War, and uh, the part of the organic fabric that we were previously seeing where our building block belonged, uh, here you see the Stoa of Atalus that was reconstructed after the Second World War as well. So you see the image of the urban fabric, uh, the remaining axis of the neoclassical city, and the new uh, developments with this uniform urban fabric. So why this part was conserved in this uh, uh, big operation of deconstruction and rebuilding of the city. Well, the part of this, this area called Plaka had been conserved because the Ministry of Culture had expropriated all these buildings uh, in order to excavate the area around the Acropolis, of course, by demolishing them. So the process of demolition and rebuilding managed to arrange the evidence of different layers of Athenian history, thus increasing the chasm between the civilization of the classical city and the anarchy of the modern one. Since there are few remaining buildings from the centuries between the classical times of the and the 20th century, the sense of disparity between the perfection of the classical heritage of the city and the evident problems of the modern one is even greater. So finally, in the 80s, the demolition of Plaka was abandoned as a project by the Greek Ministry of Culture, acknowledging its precious townscape as a heritage site for illustrating a fragment of the city's historic continuity. 
So the history of this building block reflects older and recent phases of the development and renaissance of the city of Athens. The historic, social, and cultural frame of uh, the block's developments corresponds with the historic, social, and cultural development of the historic center of Athens, while the small community that inhabited its buildings was a miniature of the society producing and using the artifacts that are now the collection of the new museum and that are going to be presented in it. The block is a small sample of modern Greek architecture, urban design and planning, while it is one of the rare parts of the urban fabric of Athens with an unobtrusive continuity with a very good state of conservation. The building block consists of a precious complementary part of the museum's collection, while together with the important classical Byzantine and Ottoman monuments found in its proximity highlights the continuity and turbulent history of one of the oldest cities in Europe. So let's move on with the uh, building program and the design project for the restoration of this site. So, um, So this is our building block, an aerial view. We see the, the, the four streets that surround it. The two buildings here belong also to the complex. This building also belongs to the complex. And these two buildings are also part of the museum, the shop and the cafe. So um, comprises, uh, uh, as we said, uh, uh, the surrounding buildings. It still possesses the mosque that we saw earlier and it also comprises a bathhouse which is an ottoman bath one of the last remaining ottoman baths in the old part of athens and a house mansion in uh panos street which is very close all these buildings are in close proximity to this central core of the museum and of course all buildings have been expropriated by the greek ministry of culture so uh, as I told you before, since these buildings were expropriated initially for demolition, none of them was listed. Uh, there were some listing of buildings by the Greek Ministry of the Environment. Uh, of course, the Roman wall uh, surviving here, it's this line that goes along the whole building block and was uncovered during the restoration project. And the two religious buildings, the small chapel of St. Eliseus and the basilica, this is a early Christian basilica that had a more recent church built on top of it. And underneath there is a Roman bath. So this archeological site uh, and the uh, small church of St. Eliseus were uh, catalogued and listed, of course, under the respective efforts of classical and uh, Byzantine antiquities. And of course, the uh, interventions here in this area were all controlled because Plaka is a protected area today. So the project was carried out in two phases related with the relative periods of European funding. The first phase was from 2007 to 2013. The second phase was from 2014 to 2020. And the total cost was uh, 12 and a half uh, billion euros, out of which 10 millions was uh, European funding. Uh, The restoration and rehabilitation uh, project was carried out by the architecture office Beta Plan, Venturaki Stepaniotis Associates, under the supervision, of course, of the Ministry of Culture, Directorate of Anastilosis, Museums, and uh, Technical World. And there was a continuous supervision of all reconstruction, restoration works by the, Green the Greek Ministry of Culture. One of the reasons for this close inspection 
when the works were carried out, aimed at recuperating ancient sculptural and architectural parts incorporated in the walls of the existing buildings. Uh, well, the site here uh, being in uh, a close proximity to archaeological site, of course, used much of the materials, you know, uh, derelict or abandoned archaeological site were used uh, as quarries for the construction of new houses. So the Ministry of Culture during the restoration had to recuperate this because there were some of them were really important. Of course, there was documentation um, of the repealed parts of the late Roman Athenian wall that was uncovered. And the entire site was uh, documented and surveyed before carrying out the restoration project. So all buildings, including the Church of St. Thomas, the Church of St. Eliseus were conserved and reused according to a comprehensive study based on their particular structural, morphological and historical elements. So uh, what was the condition of the site before the restoration? The block consisted mostly of vacant and partly derelict buildings uh, before the intervention. Some of the structures had already collapsed and had to be reconstructed. Um, the extensive reconstruction work was carried out mainly because of the long period of time these structures have remained derelict, the poor quality of the original materials, and of the need for accommodating new functions, visitor safety, and new electromechanological, electromechanical infrastructure. Of course, this extensive reconstruction resulted in a considerable loss of the integrity of the building structural and construction components and of course of their authenticity. So uh, the residential buildings were typical of their respective historic periods conserving their original layouts and typologies while the two we see here some samples. These are traditional Athenian houses. Uh, we find very few samples uh, today remaining in the urban fabric of Athens. Here is really a beautiful collection of this uh, type of houses uh, with open in courtyards, in small courtyards, and having these balconies with the long a row of windows uh, facing the south. Uh, we the, well, this is a late 18th century uh, mansion by a noble family. The construction system is completely different. It has a rather uh, defensive, very small openings, um, and uh, it's a complex. It's not just this building. There are annexes and the church. Uh, that we saw the small chapel forms part of this complex. So, um, uh, St. Thomas Basilica, as I, the, the archaeological site here with the early Christian Basilica and the Roman bath underneath was conserved as an archaeological site and the small chapel of the mansion, the private chapel of this mansion that we saw before uh, was reconstructed according to its original form. It is important to note that the layout of the open spaces was conserved and made accessible at all levels. So the main concept, what was the main concept of this restoration project and reuse of this historic complex? which was residential, religious, and commercial buildings together, was presenting the collections of a, a folklore museum in context. In this site, the centuries-long history of the city unfolds in a mosaic of building structures dating from the Roman period to the present day. 
the museum promotes comprehensively the tangible and intangible values of cultural heritage, while folk art objects dating from the mid 18th century until the 1970s highlight the lifestyle perceptions, aesthetic standards, know-how and art of the modern Greek culture. Well, I'm sorry about that. So uh, the museum's permanent exhibitions will be housed in nine of these buildings, while the rest will comprise other functions such as storage areas, laboratories, temporary exhibitions, offices, and uh, seminar rooms. Here is a temporary exhibition building. Here is a, a, a building that will be used for uh, exhibition spaces. The layout of the building block was totally conserved concerning the exterior facade of all buildings. They were restored with respect to their original and authentic characteristics while preserving and highlighting their aesthetic, historical and architectural values. So there were no alterations concerning the facades. But on the contrary, there were alterations in the layout and typology of building plans that house exhibition halls of the museum. All new additions uh, for facilitating the accessibility of the new museum and accommodating special museum functions reflect a contemporary architecture design approach with a critical stance regarding the historic structures. We see here the uh, sanitary spaces, the new sanitary spaces of uh, the museum. And uh, there were elevators for uh, here is the elevator uh, that uh, allow access to different levels of the open spaces. And uh, if we look now at the, the sustainability issues in this project, uh, we have to say that in the brief and tender, there were no references to specific environmental and sustainable sustainability issues. Due to the nature of the building's restoration project and the public operation of the complex as a museum, the design had to comply with safety regulations for public buildings, but not respond to specific sustainable goals and standards. As far as building materials are concerned, the reuse of existing materials, mainly the stone, because most uh, recuperates a major part of the embodied energy of the existing structures, but extensive uh, reconstruction of timber framed walls, roofs, windows, doors, staircases, and interior walls do not respond to sustainable goals and standards, of course. Uh, the conservation of all open green and public spaces within the building block is a positive environmental goal of the project. Uh, so all greenery was uh, conserved. This building, uh, this uh, tree here is a listed tree. It's a, it's a 250 years old tree that is uh, protected. Uh, in addition to that, the use of original materials of low embodied energy and of permeable quality at the open public spaces enhances an environmentally friendly aspect of the project. This is all local um, uh, slabs um, and there is no concrete underneath. Um, it is important also to note that the function of the new museum will be a pivotal element for enhancement and further development of the surrounding urban fabric, while the effective reuse of existing buildings contributes to a more sustainable development model. Um, so you see here the open spaces that have been uh, kept, preserved. This is an open uh, uh, courtyard for, uh, events and concerts and uh, lectures. Uh, the new museum 
promotes the dissemination of cultural heritage, of course, and uh, within uh, this restored complex. And it regularly organizes workshops, events, public lectures, and temporary exhibitions. Um, and uh, finally, it is important uh, uh, to see that since 1982, the museum offers also a great variety of uh, educational activities providing opportunities for the appreciation, enjoyment, and awareness of the cultural heritage. Here is the building for the uh, museo pedagogical uh, program of the museum. And uh, in the basement area, we can have a look, a glimpse of the late Roman wall that was uncovered. And uh, here is the lockers and the reception of the pedagogical workshops. And uh, finally, it is important to mention that the museum has received in 2020 one of the prizes of the competition European Union in My Region 2020 organized among projects co-funded by the European Union. So, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, this was a very uh, specific and special uh, site and uh, uh, process of reconstruction and results of that. Thank you for your critical overview of the uh, results. Uh, and if you, we have some questions, unfortunately not. Uh, so uh, I'm going to thank you uh, all uh, participants in this session and for your uh, presentation and uh, for contribution for this uh, seminar. Uh, we will meet uh, again at 1 p.m. Uh, we have a round table. Uh, so it is uh, another opportunity to discuss all these uh, topics. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Finished.
Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the round table. Uh, uh, I guess that uh, we are all eager to discuss a little bit about uh, sustainable heritage as uh, uh, we had an opportunity to listen to all those presenters this morning. My name is Anna Nikesic of the University of Belgrade Faculty of Architecture. I'm a scientific coordinator of Harris's project and I will be a moderator of uh, this round table. Today with us are panelists from this morning, but also consortium members and other partners. Uh, unfortunately, Professor Vittorio had to be excused for today's round table, but we are all here. Uh, and uh, uh, I do welcome uh, you all from the part of the whole consortium. The round table will be structured around three questions, uh, uh, in our opinion, uh, very important for the beginning and the opening of our project, as we are on terms with uh, discovering the exact content and the position uh, from which we stand towards the heritage and sustainability. So when preparing for the project application, we as consortium members knew what we wanted. We wanted to enhance, to add knowledge to where we felt most in need, the phenomena of sustainable heritage. At first glance, these two notions seemed so much in harmony, but when we opened the discussion on the way in which we understand the proposed phenomena and try to somehow critically inspect them, we discovered two major issues that emerged as uh, really important to discuss on. So the first issue, you can. The first issue is the scale of heritage, but we can talk about scale in physical way uh, and whether we are talking about it in this way or in time way. The question of what do we mean under the notion of heritage, and in particular in terms and in condition of contemporary urban cosmopolitan society in the context of productive and healthy city, which we are eager to build and develop for future generation and the one that comes after us. I would like to start with the question of complexity of the notion of heritage in terms of sustainable uh, sustainability approaches. So uh, I will open the discussion um, and uh, ask each of you to stress one particular way in which we can think about the scale of heritage. So um, maybe uh, if there's someone who uh, can uh, answer the question or open the platform for this, uh, can raise the hand, and if not, okay. And I can tell Michelle. You, yeah. Um, what what I think, uh, or from from my experience in R and B, uh, we we made a focus based on our own knowledge, and and uh, first of all, it's the time frame, of course. Uh, so modernism, and then specializing on after war, after war modernism, but also on housing, uh, because. You know, heritage is so broad, uh, you know, the, the, the French sausage and the German bread is a heritage, but you have to see where your knowledge is to, uh, to really be able to address it. That's actually what, what we did in, uh, in R&B. Okay, so uh, that's one uh, vision, but maybe uh, uh, our presenter, uh, Miss Anna would like to add something to this uh, particular uh, notion of the scale of heritage. How, how can we measure this? Uh, um, I'm not sure that we can now talk only about the uh, physical measure or time measure, but also about, uh, for instance, the relation between uh, society and space can be a measure of heritage scale uh, through which we can uh, think about uh, the sustainability agenda of the heritage. Anna Tustois. Yes, it's yes. me. Okay. Um, this 
this concept or this idea of scale, uh, I believe you are um, addressing a, a question of dimension. Yes. Or the full dimensions of, of heritage. Uh, I believe that um, the idea of uh, heritage is transnational, transversal, trans society. Um, and as well in, 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 in what has to do with, with the time, the chronos or the chronology, I think it's quite huge, even if we are um, considering uh, modern movement architecture or modernism, as Michel Melanos um, uh, puts the question, um, we have very, very different um, approaches uh, since, let's say, the beginning of the contemporary era, if we are talking in terms of uh, historical science, let's say. So contemporary era uh, raises with the industrial revolution, French revolution. So we have the, all the, the enlightenment um, philosophical process going through 19th century with all the incredible revolutions of the 19th century and uh, the 20th century, in my opinion, with lots of um, answers. Uh, some answers perhaps too short and too close because in, 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 in some occasions um, there's always an idea to make a kind of normative or to say to be modern is like that or is like this. And the, um, uh, the knowledge that we have till now and you know that uh, I I'm participating as well in the RMB uh, project and we are both very happy to be here. I would say uh, Michelle with the RMB uh, and uh, with, uh, with Docomomo and, and all of our schools, because I believe this is really a, a task force we must, this, I mean, heritage and education. But just to say, to don't lost me, that uh, 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 in fact, um, it's very interesting if we consider just this, let's say, contemporary era or, or period, the, the different layers we can find. And if we go further to all the, the extent of, of heritage in the world, it's, 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 it's huge. So, uh, I believe the scale is immense, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. Um, and that's why perhaps we uh, must um, identify some, some issues that we consider there are, let's say, more um, urgent. And I think that the way Ersur's project um, put the question, so education and sustainability, I believe it's two, it's a binomial, very, very uh, uh, clear. Um, in, in a certain way, it's the same that we are following in RMB and you realize uh, with the presentation of, of Michel Mellenhorst that we are now preparing or trying to preparing a kind of a master course with all the terrible uh, bureaucracy of our schools, universities, countries. It's a crazy thing. And Michel, thank you so much for being so patient with this yeah. thing. <laughs> So this is another scale for this heritage problem, you know, how to deal with all the constraints uh, of um, politics mm -hmm. uh, from Europe. We shall have no frontiers uh, in this. And it's a, it's a mad thing. And, and it's, it is c'est dommage, how do you say this in English? It's a pity that we, 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 we waste lots of our energy <laughs> in these bloody things. Uh, and we should move uh, to action with all of these workshops, which I believe are, are really, really very important. And perhaps I could, I could say that in this binomial teaching, education workshops are perhaps the first step to fulfill. I'm changing a little bit this question of heritage dimension uh, just to uh, identify how 
to go on. And uh, uh, as well, I would like to profit. And it was really great that we make our um, presentation so balanced and we don't put each other uh, on. Uh, for instance, as you realize, the Docomomo journal we prepare on this project, uh, there was this very, very um, challenging and, 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 and stimulating uh, idea and result, which was the interview with Villarets. So it's very interesting as well, this dimension, I would say, you know, to connect with uh, based professionals, uh, that we we trust and and it's very important that the academy the school the research goes to the real outside uh, production um, and in Docomomo we have um, a long history of uh, being in touch with uh, these protagonists uh, Michelle uh, spoke to uh, as well, we will interview David Shipperfield on this matter. Uh, but it, it is something that is really very alive, you know, to put students uh, with, or I mean, new generations with the, the old generations. This is another scale. So uh, I think we, we should make a kind of database of the scales of heritage and to cross all these things um, in order to make these uh, issues comprehensive and, and, and consequent and, yeah. and, and, and going beyond all these limits uh, we have uh, in our countries and schools to try to make a transnational degree. This is the point well, that thank we are you. fighting for. Then uh, I understand this as a huge complexity of uh, some something like we can say layering scale. I think that that everything overlaps and intersect, and uh, then we can have it. Uh, I think that architectural education is a really good place from from where we can actually raise all those different layers and access. But now I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Dimitris. Uh, Zibomalas, as he uh, joined us, and he is uh, from the service of modern movement. What he has to say about this complexity uh, that uh, that somehow um, uh, um, uh, that somehow uh, unites and uh, see the the sustainable heritage as a holistic approach. How can we um, approach it from this other side, uh, the side of services and uh, um, the side of profession? Well, thank you very much. I'd first like to remind us that uh, the concept of heritage is very much attached to the way uh, societies acknowledge the built environment that uh, they have inherited from past generations. And so the concept of heritage is not at all static. It is always dynamic because the concepts, uh, the, the evaluation of the built heritage uh, of each generation is uh, constantly changing. And we needn't, of course, uh, forget that uh, some uh, decades ago, the concept of heritage was quite narrow. And even today, it is very wide and in many different ways, because there are many different societies which attach different values to the buildings or other uh, structural elements that form their environment. Uh, in Greece, for example, and since you spoke of services, uh, services are obliged to make sure that uh, laws are enforced. Uh, there is a law, a major law for the protection of antiquities and monuments in general, which prescribes that the fundamental uh, value of heritage is the historic value. And in doing so, it actually uh, puts forth the issue of age. And most of the listed monuments in Greece are of a certain age. And coming to uh, our times, there aren't so many buildings at this point that are acknowledged by the Greek Ministry of Culture as monuments because they are considered quite young. Uh, on the other hand, there is also legislation that allows for heritage to be protected on aesthetic terms because of its aesthetic value and contribution to the quality of our built environment. And in that case, uh, the concept of heritage is quite widened, not so much in terms of age as of the different elements of heritage. For example, Heritage can be claimed in the form of a tree or a path and from there on uh, up to a large uh, building. So I think that 
In terms of uh, architect, the architectural studies and specialization in the uh, understanding of heritage, it is important not to aim so much to uh, complete this possible record of all the types of heritage in all different scales, but it is more important to cultivate in the young architects the idea or the way of understanding how different societies appreciate and attach different values to the heritage that they have inherited and how these uh, values are or could possibly be uh, combined, whether there is any common space in between them. Uh, I suppose there is some since today we even have the uh, world heritage acknowledged. Thank you. Um, I think that we somehow tackle the uh, the problem of identity, uh, regional and cosmopolitan uh, together as to find something that is uh, um, mutual for all of us, but something that is specific and particular for each of our regions. So maybe uh, Professor, uh, uh, Professor Musso Stefano Francesco can uh, um, make a, a replica on this, uh, uh, in these terms of identity as we know he, uh, he is very eager to talk about. It. Sorry. Uh, well, the question of values uh, has been posed uh, since uh, how is Riegler, the beginning of the 20th century. It's a very complex uh, problem because uh, if you remember Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, the revolution of values, uh, there are no more values. God died. That meant uh, that uh, the values that uh, at that age were imposed in some way, not uh, shared, but imposed by a system that ruled the world, uh, collapsed. And new values uh, came to the fore but also the struggle in between the, the values. And now we have uh, a, another problem because in a democratic society, in a globalized world that can be also a homogenized world, we have to decide who is going to decide what has value and what is not value. And it's not anymore a question of experts. As we know, Europe has posed in the cultural year of, uh, uh, sorry, the, European here of cultural heritage, a very strong accent upon the role of society, starting from Fraro Declaration uh, coming on. Um, the subjects are not anymore only the historians, not anymore the scholars of history of art, of architecture, not anymore only the architects, the urbans, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it's not anymore a question only for experts. Uh, cultural heritage comes for Europe. There is a report from the European Commission about this topic. And the role that cultural heritage can play on the uh, well-being, on the social cohesion, on the economic but sustainable development of our societies for the future is a crucial question for all our societies. And in this uh, crucial uh, panorama, is uh, even more difficult uh, on some uh, aspect uh, to decide who is in charge to decide what has values and what not. We are speaking about not anymore of only one cultural heritage, even if world cultural heritage, but of many different cultural heritages. Because we are living in a period of we must work to uh, organize the world in a different way to uh, allow people share experience, respect cultures and human rights, and share also the view of what is our environment and its future. So um, it, it's a sort of a matter of a dialogue of uh, respect, but also of sharing experiences in order to avoid one risk. If uh, cultural heritage enlarges too much, we know any more differentiations in terms of scale, of time, et cetera. Um, at the end, uh, we risk not to be able to save anything. We don't have the resources, not only economical or technical, eh, but also mental. Because if everything comes as cultural heritage, 
at the end, nothing is cultural heritage. Or each one of us, like the cats, uh, uh, all the black cats in the night are invisible and everything is equal. So we have to uh, avoid the risk that uh, the continuous process of enlargement in terms of space, in terms of scale, in terms of times, in terms of objects, not to speak about the immaterial cultural heritage that is an even more complicated matter, uh, we risk to make confusion. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, fearing, I'm worrying that uh, this sort of uh, uh, race to say that uh, even the smallest uh, object or smallest house in the smallest villages of every country um, is a cultural heritage to be defended, to be safeguarded, to be restored. I think that we have a, a, a big risk in front of ourselves. That doesn't mean that we have to go back to the 19th century conceptions, a sort of ranking of importance of values, the big monument, the castle, the cathedral, because we know that the rural house like that, uh, those that uh, Maria Filobrico showed us in Cyprus uh, could be a very valuable trace and piece of cultural heritage for a Cyprus community. But uh, we can't uh, conclude this uh, consciousness saying that everything is cultural heritage. Because otherwise we don't have uh, the time, the resources and the real capability to save what we call cultural heritage. And to be sincere, I do not like the word heritage. I prefer legacy. And I don't like at all the term identity, as I said, because identity is a dynamic concept. It's not a fixed one. And I don't like it because I remember too many wars struggled to impose, to defend, to select identities through fake, imposed, built, rebuilt, sometimes also using restoration and cultural heritage as a very dangerous uh, instrument tool to achieve these results. So I prefer, following the uh, suggestion of a French philosopher, Chris Younes, to speak about specificities and not identity. There is an interesting book uh, written by a scholar of uh, classical philology, in Siena, Maurizio Bettini, that is entitled, unfortunately in Italian, I don't know if it is already translated in other languages, that uh, the title is Against the Roots. Uh, it says uh, the trees as the roots and the trees stay firm, stable. People move. So he prefer to use the metaphor of a river, of different rivers which waters uh, uh, are mixed in together and then goes towards the seaside and the, and the sea. So we have to mix, we have to sum, not to divide, we have to enrich each one of ourselves, listening, dialoguing, knowing the specificities of each other. Only in this way we can create a better world, in my opinion. Thanks. Well, thank you, Professor. Um, uh, I will ask if someone else has to comment on this. Okay, so I perhaps will... Anna, perhaps, Anna, I can show a few slides. I like to... Uh, it very much um, um, follows this discussion. I, I do this lecture on the notion of, of, of heritage and um, monument care in, in, for my German students and then I showed them this as a start, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this. So you see also the people that wrote on heritage they were, that were important in the German context, but also in a larger context. Uh, you also see what was mentioned earlier, like in the 30s in Germany, the Fachwerk became very important. Actually, it was covered in stone, in a slate. Uh, but they, they took it away to show the original German Fachwerk in, the, uh, in that time. We also saw today the church by Eiermann in Berlin. Actually, Eiermann proposed to demolish the church and only build his church. It's also interesting to 
to see what happened there. So we see a lot of people, we see modernism entering in the, uh, the realm of, of heritage. And then at the end, we have Rem Koolhaas Bordeaux house that was listed five years after its completion. Uh, and then uh, also the immaterial heritage. And I, I made this lecture series a couple of years ago when um, Niemeyer still lived. Uh, so I, I asked, should we also declare Oscar Niemeyer heritage? So it's, it's quite, <laughs> it can go pretty far in defining what, what is heritage. Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, thank you, Michelle. And uh, I have to say that uh, obviously we have to be careful about not losing the ground on which we stand and to uh, actually, uh, um, uh, I don't know, propose maybe a few more notions uh, critical for, for, uh, to the notion of the heritage itself and to try to uh, layer our way of uh, thinking about uh, sustainability and heritage. So uh, we can probably go to the next uh, uh, question. And uh, next, the other issue that uh, we were very um, eager to think about how to uh, actually, uh, uh, how to link and uh, how, to, um, uh, to, uh, how to connect uh, the architectural education on one side and architectural profession on the other. Uh, when thinking about uh, all those uh, um, words as responsibility, awareness, social integration, participation, energy efficiency on one side, and when we uh, think about the processes of reuse, rehabilitation, regeneration, reconstruction uh, on the other, um, I would like to ask uh, uh, and to propose probably a way in which uh, uh, you think that those two uh, areas of, uh, of knowledge, gaining knowledge, could uh, inter, inter, intertwine uh, the architectural education on one side and architectural profession on the other. And uh, we have uh, 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 Professor Michel, uh, were telling us during his presentation about the workshops. Uh, I had an opportunity to be the actual um, the actor of one of those uh, workshops, and it was uh, really uh, a great, uh, a great way to actually connect education, profession, and uh, and society as well, uh, also inhabitants and also people uh, from, from, uh, from the neighborhood in which we uh, built all those workshops. So probably we can start with Michelle and then uh, please do uh, uh, invite you, uh, and raise your hand in order to uh, somehow uh, propose this, uh, I think, really important issue on how to connect those two spheres. Well, actually, I think there is a very important um, role for us as teachers, educationalists, to feed the profession with, with our thinking, our experiments. Too often we get questions from, from architectural offices, uh, your students, they don't know how to work with this program or with that program. It's totally irrelevant, I would say, I think. Use these five years to develop notions and, and responsibility and attitude uh, that's the most important thing you can do while still a student. That's um, my, my position and also what I try to do, which is not always easy. <laughs> uh, probably we can ask also Professor Maria to comment on this uh, issue as uh, uh, she, she somehow, I think that she stands on both sides. Uh, as a profession working on site and then from the other side as a professor? Actually, uh, I was working uh, before uh, my employment in the university in the private sector and afterwards in the government. So I know the, very well the professional occupation. So in the courses in the University of Cyprus, we tried hard to uh, combine the, the two. So we have uh, participations during teaching from the government or from the uh, practitioners, architects. So the students can uh, be involved with them. 
And another thing is that the case study that we give the students are real case studies that the Department of Antiquities uh, suggested us. So their proposals will be implemented in, uh, in practice. So, and the government and the practitioners are more interested in the work of the student. So in this way, we managed to um, uh, uh, make this uh, connection and uh, uh, manage to make a good dialogue between the professionals and the students. Uh, uh, in other lessons, we have the visit to the vernacular settlement. So the students have the opportunity to discuss and with the people there and with the professionals, architects that are dealing with the restoration of these uh, dwellings. So we have, uh, we tried hard. We are a very small uh, place. So I think it's a bit more easy to have this uh, connection between uh, uh, the community, the practitioner architects, uh, as well as the teachers and the professionals at the university. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I saw that uh, Professor Almini Paka uh, raised her hand. Am I right? Yes, thank you. Ah, yeah. uh, well, I very much agree with what uh, Michelle had just said that uh, actually what we have to do in our schools and through our curriculums was uh, mainly to develop uh, uh, an attitude, a notion, a strategy for our students in order to act when they enter their professional uh, career. Uh, I think that as a discipline we are by ourselves a multidisciplinary um, uh, field of study, uh, having to deal with humanities, with history, with aesthetics, with uh, uh, social issues, with uh, environmental and climatic issues, and uh, navigate through these different fields, combine them, and uh, develop a knowledge and a standpoint that uh, has to be defended afterwards. So, uh, of course, we're always um, troubled in uh, formulating our curricula, how to deal with practical uh, knowledge that students have to be equipped with. But at the same time, I find it very crucial uh, that what we have to uh, foremost do is to teach how to combine all these different aspects that the role of an architect involves uh, in order to be able to formulate a narrative, a strategy, an attitude, and be able to communicate this uh, to the wider public, to the communities with which our uh, students, future architects will be involved. I think this is really a very, and it's a very challenging uh, uh, aspect of uh, uh, our educational programs. And uh, since this uh, globalized context has uh, things changing rapidly, so we have to catch up in this process and uh, uh, be alert in order to uh, sort out and find ways in which our students will be able to respond to this ever-changing conditions through their creativity, through their sensibility, through their notion of uh, social and environmental issues, uh, through the continuity that has to be taken into consideration where heritage or legacy is involved, and be able to judge and navigate through these uh, notions. Okay, yes. <laughs> I think that you uh, somehow have covered the whole thing. And now I can see that we have one question for uh, uh, here, but I would just want to add something and to maybe raise uh, one more thing about the connection in between education and uh, profession that was raised uh, uh, through, through our pre presentations, and this is the research. 
I think that Miss uh, Anna Tostois uh, told us something about that. And so she opened the question of her research as something really, really important and to, to, to have our uh, hands uh, uh, full, uh, uh, fully grounded in the, into the specific and particular problem in order to, uh, to develop ourselves uh, uh, through the work. Uh, so I um, thank you for that. Uh, and uh, now uh, um, we can have this uh, uh, question. Uh, so could the panelists comment, Michelle in particular, on the activist role of academia in mobilizing public authorities? Are there particular strategies that you think work? Is it context specific or could we further enable ourselves with tools? Um. Okay, I try to, to give some, some answer. Like, like I said in my presentation, normally when, when I want to reach something with the authorities in a certain community, I push forward the students and tell them, yeah, you have such a nice building and they can learn a lot. And uh, uh, so, and then step by step, I try to involve them uh, in, in, in getting away from the initial notion of, uh, of having it demolished because very often that, that's what it starts with, that they say, yeah, okay, you can go into it, you can use it, you can do it because it's going to, de going to be demolished anyway. Um, so, but yeah, as a general, general tactic, um, you, need, you need some, um, um, yeah, you need somebody, you need some people within within a municipality that you can address um, to, um, to do this, to take this, this uh, activist role. Um, and another thing which is very important that you inform all kind of local media, uh, you know, local newspaper, radio, television, to, uh, to be part of it so that you, uh, you make it known in, uh, in, in the town. So thank you. I think uh, Professor Stefano Musso uh, Francesco would like to add something. Yeah, first of all, I totally agree with the, what Michelle and Alcmini said about the challenging uh, relationship with profession. I have been professional as well. Um, it, it's a funny story and uh, I'm a little bit fed up with this uh, fake struggle uh, uh, between the two sides of the moon. Because uh, all the professionals, attended the Faculty of Architecture in their past. And all our students, hopefully, will be architects. The problem is that the professional is changing very fastly. It's not the same of some years ago. And uh, that's important uh, why we have to uh, train our students in critical thinking and all the other things that Michelle and Alcmini said, because those are fundamentals. Don't, don't change. A software changes every time. And what is updated now is not anymore updated to tomorrow. But uh, I, if you allow me, I would uh, suggest you to read a report of another Erasmus Plus project that was led a few years ago, and in 2018, by EAE and ACE, the European Association of Architectural Education, and by Architects Council of Europe. It was called uh, Confronted Wicked Problems in architectural education. And more or less all the topics that we are dealing with now are already in that report, but what is changing. So it can be uh, something that you can uh, look at, not to, to assume it as, as a basis, but to enrich it. I will send you uh, in chat the web address where you can find all the reports of this project. Thanks, Stefano. Not well, at all. And another thing that I will share with you, uh, answering to the last question, and that is something to what Michelle uh, just said. Um, I I'm now I have been dean of the School of Architecture, but I am now director of the School of Specialization in uh, Architectural Heritage and Landscape. That is a post master program of two years uh, devoted to architectural and landscape heritage. And in, we published uh, just a few months ago, a book about 25 years of activity of our school. So you can have the curricula and all the demonstration of how we interact continuously 
with the local superintendency, the Ministry of Cultural Heritage, with the municipalities, with dioceses, exactly in the same way that Michelle was explaining before, uh, trying to involve the school in real case studies, as Maria said before, but also pushing the public administration in using our schools and our students that are already architects, of course, or engineers, uh, in order to have a synergy and to move and to involve the local communities in all the works that our students uh, develop on a professional level in the two years of the master post master. Of course, also in the master program, we use uh, um, real case studies and the students develop a project not so definitive like in the master and post master program. So I will send you now the two uh, links where you can find these materials. Thanks. Thank you. Great. As, uh, is there anyone else who would like to add something to this? Okay. The I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to okay. raise the hand for three times. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Anna. So Perhaps I'm not making it well. I don't know. You didn't saw me. Uh, okay. May I? May I speak? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, thank you. Oh, I think we are um, all agreeing uh, so and supporting each other completely. So uh, I, I enjoy very much Akmini Paka. Uh, let's say synthesis of the architect education, like a Vitruvian um, uh, process. Uh, and there's no way out. So this is always our problem and, and our um, singularity and our force, our strengths. Yeah. Let the force be with you, this is it. Um, but at the same time, it's it's very difficult to 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 and now I'm I'm speaking as dean of the architecture uh, school in in Technico University of Lisbon, uh, and it's terrible to um, sustain uh, this global uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci Vitruvius man against all the great specialities of engineering and so on, and and I I, I believe. Uh, that the, the way we, we work in, in design studio with the relation with the all, all the, the rivers that come to the design studio, it's fundamental. And what I think it's a great challenge and a great difference in our education for the most recent years, I'm talking about five years perhaps, was the um, capacity to introduce as well the, um, the field of rehabilitation, uh, mainly in the second cycle in master, because it was not a matter to discuss because everybody thought, oh, this is the same as, uh, let's say, a new design for a new building. And this made a great, great difference. And now in our school, at least, this is coming to as well to the, the, the first cycle. So the, the way we approach, as you uh, all said, uh, real questions uh, since 2017, no, 70, uh, we work with the uh, Lisbon uh, municipality um, with uh, issues that are really questions for the city. And it's very fun because five years, seven years late, they are using our ideas to uh, put, put projects on. So I, I believe we really must be very, very attentive uh, concerning the, the, the uh, raising the issues for um, design laboratories. The, the fact that we uh, cross the research with all the, di the different disciplines. For instance, in one hour, I'm going to have the meeting for the next semester where all the disciplines of an year, we try to cross with design project and design laboratories. So history, I don't know, construction, geography, landscape, we are all uh, put trying to, to, to cross things. And, and I believe the, uh, this, is, this is the way. And in fact, um, 
nowadays, I would say last year, the year before and so on, we are working uh, with real, real questions of rehabilitation um, and some of the ideas finally are used afterwards. And, and this is the great uh, mission of uh, teaching is this research, uh, having time for research uh, and then analyze and then discuss. This is the, uh, what makes us unique in, in, in the community, in the society. Of course, we don't know everything, but we study things and, and so we are able to then discuss and to uh, generously give, give to the uh, community uh, our, our conclusions. The, the, the first case I, I present in the morning, the Lignon housing was indeed uh, very successful because of, of, of this. Thank you. Well, thank you. I would like to make a comment. Okay. Uh, Alphmini Paka, please. Uh, well, uh, uh, following the line of uh, thinking of Anna, I would say that, uh, and uh, picking up a small linguistic uh, aspect of our work, uh, since uh, Stefano today referred to the Oxford Dictionary, I will say that in Greek, uh, architectural design is also architectural synthesis. So uh -huh. it's uh, uh, it's uh, very it's really meaningful this um, uh, word because we have to synthesize in this uh, most different mostly different disciplines. So the role of the architect is uh, its possibility to synthesize actually to put together and evaluate hierarchize. Um, judge and promote to choose, to and choose. formulate and formulate a strategy a narrative that is prevailing so it is uh, our um, obligation in a way to uh, teach that uh, nothing can be left out because our uh, design is a synthesis of given things so the most you enrich your thinking with all the parameters, the more uh, the outcome will be rich and meaningful. And well, this is a challenge for me. Uh, thank you. I agree with you completely. And now you can see that we ran out of- Sorry. Uh, as I can see that we ran out of time, I want to wrap up this question. And uh, as I can the presentation, the process of research towards the community on one side and then to the students on the other and to open our teaching methods to, to learn from them as well as to uh, teach them and to, uh, to develop together in, a, in some height of, somehow of a, a new community of uh, educators uh, and uh, students. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you for this round table. I think it was very interesting. And uh, uh, I will ask all of the participants in, uh, of this round table to comment and to try to give us only a short uh, dilemma or a feeling. One thing is the most important when uh, sustainable heritage is in question. So um, I think that it would be of great importance to us uh, in our future work on the project. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you for inviting Bye. and uh, getting to know you all. Bye. Nice <laughs> to Bye. see you, Michel. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And see and you great sometime great somewhere. Akmani. Mm -hmm. Akmani. For sure. Small world. <laughs> thank you. Stefano, bye-bye. Yeah. Goodbye. Have a good day mm -hmm. and take care. Okay. Yes. Well. And we see each other next year. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Good.
Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to open this uh, last uh, second session of seminar on uh, teaching methodologies. Uh, yesterday, we had a great opportunity to uh, hear really uh, wonderful presentations uh, from Venice, uh, Sevilla and uh, Cyprus. And uh, today, uh, two universities will present uh, their <coughs> Uh, teaching uh, methodologies. Uh, first one uh, will be uh, University, Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, uh, and uh, the second one uh, will be University of the Belgrade Faculty of Architecture. Uh, so my name is Jelena Zhirkovic, I'm Associate Professor at the uh, University of Belgrade Faculty of Architecture. I will moderate today uh, this session. And now I would like uh, to invite uh, Sophocles uh, Potsopoulos uh, from Aristotle University of uh, Thessaloniki. Uh, I will just briefly present the presenter. <coughs> uh, he's a teaching assistant at Aristotle University of uh, Thessaloniki. He graduated from the School of Architecture of Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and specialized in the restoration of historic buildings and settlements at the University of Roma Tre. He holds PhD in the history of architecture and city of 19th and 20th century, exploring social issues in cities, cultural exchanges and urban transformations. His research interests relate to the analytical and critical approach to architecture of modern period, the methods of restoration and holistic management of monuments, as well as the exploration of synthetic tools in relationship between historical and contemporary architecture. Uh, since uh, 2015, he's a joint lecturer at the School of Architecture at Thessaloniki and uh, teaching undergraduate and postgraduate courses. At the same time, he's a co-founder of private architectural design office dealing with a wide range of constructions, mainly in relation to the existing uh, building stock. So this uh, first presentation will be uh, held by uh, Sophocles Kotsopoulos. Good evening, everyone. Do you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> that... Actually, we will be holding the presentation, the three of us. So I will start on behalf of the Aristotle University. 
I have informed the organizers that we will be showing also some videos, but I will try and uh, share them from my screen. This will delay us a little bit. I am Konstantino Sakantavis. I am the scientific coordinator of the team, and uh, Angel Gihadzi Dimitriou is also a colleague who is a participant on the HERSUS uh, Greek team, and she specializes in environmental design. Um, so we will start our sharing. Um, and thank you. Well, to start our approach in this uh, course of uh, methodologies, um, we have singled out mainly design studios because we believe that these truly form the core of knowledge consolidation in uh, a meaning that is to say that they bring together the more diverse parameters of design into real application scenarios. So this review of our courses um, focused equally on sustainability and heritage. Um, in this presentation today, we are going to present four parameters of our thinking and of our uh, axis of analysis. Um, the first will be presented in the form of uh, videos. Uh, it, it really is the context and it's not something that we have filtered. We will try and show you a poetic version of an appreciation of the site, of the city itself, which is offered as a an architectural laboratory, and of the campus itself and uh, the values that the school holds uh, within its spaces. Um, then we will uh, refer to the five-year program, which forms the core of our studies, and then at postgraduate studies, while in the middle, we will have um, a significant contribution regarding diploma projects as a, a core theme in our studies as well. So to start with, uh, with a context, uh, the first um, issue that we are going to deal with is the city. And uh, we're going to speak about the city through the work of a, a filmographer, a director, who has had uh, training in the uh, School of Architecture in Thessaloniki. His name is George Kondos. He was LA-based in the USA, and now he's uh, in Athens, where he's producing uh, documentaries and films. Um, his film, The Cumanus, focuses on analyzing uh, the city of Thessaloniki and on portraying a very informed view of its surroundings and of its dichotomies. So I invite you to watch it. We have the uh, permission of the creator and uh, he sent us a clip from his movie. Um, I will need to make... I am sorry for this delay, and hopefully now you will be able to yet again see my screen. In what way did the ancient city become the origin of the modern city? Domino, a self-help construction system, a reinforced concrete framework open to any infill and thus to any spatial interpretation. The domino frame is erected first 
and its destiny is decided on the way. Architecture is applied on the frame almost as an afterthought. The modernist blueprint for the infill model was passed around. In most cases, it was loosely interpreted as if from a faded photocopy print. Modern Thessaloniki was formed in the 1950s, creating a boom in construction, augmented by the rise of architectural modernism and the Marshall Plan. The built landscape strikingly changed overnight with the new typology known as the Polykatikia. As a multifunctional dwelling block, the Polykatikia would come to serve as an icon for the Greek city. In this way, the Polykatikia has transformed the city itself into a gigantic factory. The city as a factory of itself. Housing is reduced to a flexible framework customized by the inhabitants. The proliferation of this type was supported by the state in the form of a general building regulation and a property law, which directly produced the basic rationale behind the architecture of the Polykatikia. This law allowed landowners to barter tax-free their buildable ground in exchange for built indoor space, effectively deregulating the construction industry. Since then, the construction industry was a major asset in the economy of Greece. The cement landscape of an indistinguishable sludge of monoliths, balconies, TV antennas, cars, and garbage looks like a modernist ruin. The present state of the city of Thessaloniki, throughout all its innumerable transformations, acquires a positive value and a point of reference. The concrete volumes interweave with the monuments and the plaza areas and extend the public sphere throughout the neighborhoods and bazaars, creating stages for social interaction. Hundreds of cantilevered balconies extend the interiors of the flats outwards. They become observatories of the various stages on the ground levels. The public space is unconfined. It spreads through all possible levels of the city. It exists for all. The city and its buildings are the backdrop for human activity and drama. Thessaloniki, the co-reigning city of the Eastern Roman and Byzantine Empire, the gateway to the Balkans, rises in a gentle arc from the Gulf of Thermaikos, a geographical location that explains the importance it has had ever since it was founded in 316 BC. Επίκαιρη όσο ποτέ, μια σάτυρα της τσαρικής Ρωσίας που εξελίσσεται σε σάτυρα της διαφθοράς χωρίς τόπο και χρόνο. Architecture is the direct result of the city's position at the center of all historic developments in the Balkans. After the 1917 fire that destroyed the city's historical center, the issue of reconstructing it had become imperative. Ernest Hebrard, one of the pioneers of European urban planning, immediately understood how important it was for Thessaloniki to become an archetypal city in accordance with the principles of the science of modern urban planning which had just been introduced. Thessaloniki can be described as the first major achievement in European urban planning of the 20th century. A city in constant transformation cultural complexity, depth, change, loss, 
antique beauty, richness, and ancient history constitutes a conglomeration of typologies and styles. The dominance of the concrete housing blocks introduces another world in itself, an anonymous architecture that is so anarchical that beyond its functional and formal problems, it creates a unique experience. Architecture implies the city, but this city may be an ideal city of perfect and harmonious relationships where the architecture develops and constructs its own terms of reference. Cicero was exiled here. Paul founded his second European church. Emperor Galerius lived here and persecuted Christians. The monks Cyril and Methodius set out from here to convert the Slavs. Hopefully you were able to follow my presentation up until now. Yes, we followed it. Good. So um, I was planning on showing a second video, but hopefully this was clear enough about the context that we are experiencing and about the very big dichotomy uh, among the uh, basic res restrictions and uh, multiplications of modernism and among the monuments which really dot the um, all sides of the city particularly the historic center they are at the cross point of major axis and are engulfed in this uh, modern uh, surrounding which really raises questions as to sustainability of the city as a whole you saw that the saloniki is really dense and this density is apparent in the urban canyons and also is apparent in the whole way that the city, that the city functions, having a very small ratio of uh, green areas per uh, uh, capita, having only two square meters of green areas. So a, a particularly dense and coherent city, uh, which operates for many years. So. This context allows the School of Architecture to have been established over many years, but to have developed uh, its own thinking um, on the educational problem, uh, programs that it supports. Um, the studies of architecture are supported by continuous dialogue in our department. And uh, the posters that you see are uh, evidences of uh, conferences and talks and uh, that have happened during the last few years. Um, Let's remember that the video that you just saw also is filmed during the financial crisis. And this is not something that we have uh, uh, referred to, but it's uh, certainly a reality for universities around the world, and particularly at the south of uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, here, the discussion that we are trying to engage with is with uh, uh, departments like yours or with other departments in Greece. And we try to fuel uh, our own um, research questions and methodologies of teaching through dialogue. Um, what we have come to appreciate now is the main. Constant, Constant, uh, there is yeah. you. You have to switch um, to the presentation view again. I think uh, we cannot see the presentation very well. Okay. Are you on video view? Okay. Okay. I hope now it's a bit better. No. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry for that. So the core of our studies is formed around the undergraduate studies and uh, essentially these have been the start of the school. They evolved with it. Uh, they evolved with Bologna, but they never lost them their main uh, um, holistic approach in a five year continuous program. Um, the curriculum addresses all levels of scale in design practice and what I want to draw your attention to 
is uh, these diagonals that transverse our whole program and uh, they inform knowledge in the main design studios that uh, run vertically. Um, actually, the, the studios are the hubs for promoting creativity and experimentation, critical thinking, where students have the opportunity to synthesize and implement and integrate all their knowledge. Um, moving on, um, until we, we have a whole picture of the, the studies of a student, the whole program uh, introduces aspects of sustainability and heritage over 15 modules uh, that cover issues of history of art, culture, architecture, the historical evolution of urban planning, theoretical approaches. You can see these courses marked uh, in the theory courses in red on the diagram on the right. And then we have other courses on historic building systems, restoration of historic buildings, the design and regeneration of historic ensembles and sites, contemporary architectural design in the historical context, again, raising issues of the relation between new and old. And then we have uh, the more uh, the modules inclined uh, more towards sustainability and these uh, vary uh, from uh, basic courses like the principles and guidelines for bioclimatic design, uh, environmental design studios, which are smaller studios that introduce the smaller complexity of uh, introducing these aspects of design. And then uh, a major design studio that uh, follows a pro the progression uh, of the students in this aspect where uh, almost 15 ECTS is attributed uh, out of the 30 ECTS that they have in the semester. Um, very briefly, I'm going through all the different uh, programs that we have in an introduction. So you can see here that historical development of postgraduate studies at our school. We start from the restoration and protection and conservation of uh, monuments and uh, culture so becomes the first uh, focus of uh, research and uh, of uh, postgraduate studies in 98. And then you can see a grouping of uh, postgraduate studies, again, the second one in uh, museology and cultural management, again, dealing with heritage and culture. And then the landscape architecture program comes in 2003. And this also um, examines quite a few uh, issues related to the cultural uh, appreciation of uh, landscapes or cultural landscapes. And then in 2015, we have the most recent additions um, which is the environmental design course and the advanced design in the innovation and trans transdisciplinarity in design. Now this deals more, more with the digital and VR environments and their use in architecture. So overall, we need to stress something that wasn't apparent in the beginning of the project. Um, other uh, departments compared to ours um, tend to integrate uh, all these different uh, postgraduate diplomas into more inclusive uh, practices actually utilizing the, these different tools. And maybe this is something that has come out of this review that we did to our courses. Um, one more thing to touch upon uh, in terms of really teaching methodologies and a common ethos of studies among uh, all the programs that we're going to analyze. It is, is this diagram you must have seen that I used um, uh, initially a, a diagram from uh, Culture Counts for Europe. And this is the tetraptic, let's say, of sustainable development. Um, it's important that we uh, understand that we all come on different sides of the equation of sustainable development. And this is a, an all-inclusive diagram that can sort of um, house many approaches and also have enough space for our common understanding. Since it comes from uh, a joint uh, approach of sustainability, including he uh, heritage and cultural management, we feel that this has uh, created a common base for our studies at our department. Moving on, um, I will uh, allow my colleagues of Oklis Kotsopoulos to start with a five-year integrated master program and um, present um, in more detail the course that we wanted to review in particular from uh, our five-year program. So I'm going to explain uh, about uh, what, uh, how we organize the Department of History of Architecture and Restoration uh, of the school, uh, which includes uh, two main uh, studios related to architectural heritage. Uh, these are the introduction to restoration of historic buildings in the second year of studies and the architectural design in historical context in the fourth year of studies. In addition, in elective courses of specializations in the fourth and fifth year of studies, 
The following courses are offered, historical building systems and historical ensembles and sites, re redesign, regeneration. In the same or uh, related subjects, research and diploma thesis topics can be chosen. This escalation of courses helps students to come up with this agnostic area in their basic studies and to be specialized at graduate level. Meanwhile, at postgraduate studies level, the interdepartmental program of the Faculty of Engineering entitled Protection, Conservation and Restoration of Cultural Monuments is offered. All the studios included in the latest syllabus of Architecture School of Auth reflect broader contemporary concerns of international architectural community at the topic of architectural heritage. Specifically, if you want to change to change cost. Specifically, the first stage, that of analysis and documentation of historic buildings, is covered at the obligatory course Introduction to Restoration of Historic Buildings in the fourth semester. At this studio's exercise, the content of which is formed based on international methodology, the, the circumstantial architectural survey of a historic building is carried out. At the same time, during the semester, students attend theoretical lectures that introduce them to the history and theory of architectural restoration. Regarding the teaching methodology, the first, the first weeks, students work in the file where they observe, survey, and photograph, gathering all the necessary data. Okay, the next one or... This is also from the Studio of Introduction to Restoration. In the last two academic years of the integrated master's degree, there are two optional studio courses of specialization. In the, study, in the studio course, Historical Building Systems, students delve into the internationally recognized scientific area of construction system history through theoretical lectures focused on Greek history, while at their exercise, they systematically analyze and evaluate historical structures. If you want to change. In this way, it is aimed that students are familiarized with the, specialist, with the special issues of historical building technology and the pathology of newer historic buildings from the 17th to the 20th century. It is considered that deepening the issue of construction could be a key tool for evaluating and upgrading the energy consumption of a historic building. In the studio of historical assemblies and sites, redesign and regeneration, students delve into issues related to small historic villages, abandoned or not, or historic centers of towns, according to the international methodology for this complex subject. It is apparent that in the studio, students face issues of urban planning, sustainability, and social reflection. And now, let me explain some more details about the main studio, main design studio. Uh, could we go on on two slides? Okay, the next one here. Well, this is the design studio seven that aims to provide students with the knowledge and skills necessary for the synthetic research and experimentations by design on the relationship between all the new. The studio utilizes a program of high complexity, building upon the conjunctive and compositional logics and experience from previous studios and courses. The studio focuses on architectural design issues in historical environment, such as new architecture in historical context, interventions in the redesign of historic buildings, additions on to historic buildings, architectural rehabilitation interventions and reuse of historic buildings and complexes, Rehabilitation interventions and promotion of historical sets and sites. The purpose and objectives of this studio, of this studio course, is to familiarize students with the theory of material culture and with the critical approach to the cultural to the cultural heritage. Maybe the, the next one, please. Okay. And the next one. The design studio has high complexity and demands synthetic skills, aiming to familiarize the students with the very decisive role for, of the architects, that of redesigning and managing the historical environment that constitutes a very important part of today's architectural creation. Upon successful completion of this course, 
students will cultivate their sensitivity in recognizing and reading the historic environment, the interpretation and post-interpretation of architectural data, be familiar with issues of analysis and evaluation of the historical built environment, be familiar with architectural planning issues, the setting of goals and performance standards for the design space, be fully aware of the phases of architectural design and of the relationship between architectural composition and construction, have practical design experience of integrated new architecture in historically formed complexes in urban and rural areas. The studio consists of two parts. Theory lectures, presentations, and practice design studio. Also, there are two phases in the design process. In the first stage, around three weeks, the group elaborates the architectural analysis and, doc and documentation. At this stage, the historical phases of the building, the structural system, as well as the pathology of materials are investigated with file research. In the second stage, which lists about 11 weeks, students study the proposal for the restoration and reuse of the historic building based on the analysis. The environmental approach of the building cell is, is part of the educational process, but in the context of an undergraduate studio, it is difficult to achieve greater depth. However, the energy performance of historic buildings could be further elaborated on with specialized lectures, etc. In addition to, to teaching staff, experts provide lectures, guides on the site of restored buildings and sites, and participates on the final presentations. Among the, the experts, there are professionals with rec recognized work, represented, representative of organizations such as the Ministry, the Ministry of Culture. Oh yes, some, uh, some data about the studio. It is a weekly studio, of course, uh, one day a week, about 10 hours. Uh, the studio topics include buildings or complexes of historic interest, interest mainly in the city of uh, Thessaloniki. Moving on, I will take the floor again and then um, sort of disrupt the presentation of the courses that we reviewed for the purposes of the Hersus project and introduce the, the, the parameter of uh, actually the diploma project. And this is a formative uh, project that I believe uh, all the architecture schools have and it's the final year project which really allows students to synthesize basically everything that we teach them and everything that they are interested in learning basically. Um, here, a very quick example of such an application which really tackles the issues of uh, uh, heritage of uh, this, um, let's say, disused or even abandoned uh, building stock that um, is part of uh, the city of Thessaloniki. And here the approach is much more of a, a societal one, as you will be able to see. So I will again uh, stop the presentation and show you a small video.
hopefully you have been able to follow the presentation until now and the video and uh, to comprehend the relation that uh, architectural studies have now in our department uh, and the shift from actually uh, designing so much uh, and uh, end results or buildings and more on designing processes and uh, these processes of regeneration or uh, processes that include more of the reuse of our building stock have become increasingly more important. Can you hear me? I, I get, keep getting some noise. We can hear, okay. Okay, so moving too. on, um, I will uh, give the floor again to Sophocles Kotopoulos and uh, he will move on to present the postgraduate studies program in uh, conservation and restoration. Okay, let's go on with the uh, postgraduate studies and uh, actually with the interdepartmental program entitled Protection, Conservation and Restoration of Cultural Monuments that's organized on three semesters. The first two semesters include theoretical courses as well as the interdisciplinary studio. During the first semester, students elaborate the final diploma thesis. The studio includes lectures, presentations and the restoration design project. The lectures reflect the stage of project development. Mostly, they are studies and implementing examples of restoration and reuse of buildings and historical ensembles of different historical periods. These examples address theoretical, technical, and environmental issues. The design work includes the restoration and reuse of a historic building or complex. The historic buildings and sites that are proposed are usually from different eras and it's feasible to visit and study them. They have undergone various interventions and show damages and alterations. The purpose of the studio can be described in, can be described in five sentences. The interdisciplinary cooperation of postgraduate students, the exemplary treatment of a restoration and reuse design study, to carry out all stages of restoration and reuse design study, the pursuit of postgraduate students on a real issue which concerns local communities, the practical application of theoretical principles and knowledge. Also about the learning outcomes, we can mention the acquisition of knowledge and development of critical thinking on theories of conservation and on contemporary trends that have been recently formed, training in both theory and practice on subjects of conservation and reuse of historic buildings and complexes, as well as buildings of modern period, understanding of the principles of the holistic protection of buildings and complexes, understanding the importance, the important role that the conservation of existing buildings plays towards a more sustainable attitude for the built environment, acquisition of knowledge to recognize the passive environment strategies incorporated in the design of historic and vernacular structures in order to conserve and reinforce them during the conservation process. And finally, the acquisition of knowledge of historic buildings, materials, and techniques that embody environmental values. The work of the studio includes three stages. The first stage is the analysis and documentation of historic buildings carried out in the file. The second stage covers the first approach of the restoration and reuse scenarios. Finally, the third stage includes the overall final design study of the restoration and reuse project. For each interdisciplinary group of students, an interdisciplinary group of teachers is provided who monitor the evaluation of the practical work at all stages of elaboration. This interdisciplinarity is a central goal of the program and we are really proud that we managed to implement in a very good balance between architects, civil engineers, mechanical engineers, survey engineers, and archaeologists. As in the undergraduate program, the issue of energy upgrading of historic structures can be further enhanced by lectures and the use of software. The involvement of mechanical engineers, professors, and students can offer a comprehensive approach to the issue. There is a strong relationship between the program and the current local needs. Specifically, in order to fully simulate professional practice, the course established collaboration with the municipalities, which allow access to historical buildings or sites. 
Upon completion of the practical work, the organized presentations informed the municipal authorities and the residents. Graduate students come in direct contact with the real problems of the local communities and are informed about the real problems of conservation, restoration, and reuse of built heritage. The teaching staff, as mentioned, come from various schools of the Faculty of Engineering. And about the participants, the program accepts holders of undergraduate degrees in engineering and graduates of other schools and departments of Greek universities and abroad. Holders of undergraduate degree in history and archaeology are also accepted by this program. Finally, some details about the alumni of this program that comprise a group of scientists intended to work both in the public and the private sector, increasing the number of young scientists who can develop further specialized research in the services of society and culture. As mentioned, all the concerns of postgraduate students' works refer to real issues of local communities and market. Local bodies call on postgraduate programs administration, administrators for solving problems regarding the built heritage. In addition, the graduates of the program are included in public position of, com of competent bodies, mainly the Ministry of Culture and the local government. Some of the graduates participate in projects, private and public, as experts. Based on pertinent data available to date, at least 500 of our graduates of the last 20 years of all specialization, specializations have been hired via open public procedures in organizations and public entities related to their specialization. Specifically, the 43% in services of the Ministry of Culture, 21% in services of the wider public sector, 6% in education, 6% in higher education, and finally the 24% in private sector or act as freelancers. And now Angeliki Hadzi Dimitriou will explain us we don't right. see hello from, hello uh, i will uh, we will see now the environmental uh, design uh, studios um, which are integrated in the uh, uh, postgraduate uh, program of studies environmental architectural and urban design uh, this study program develops over three academic semesters, uh, of which uh, the first two uh, comprise of theoretical uh, courses and design studios, and the third for attending support courses, uh, intensive seminars, workshops, uh, workshops and uh, an educational uh, trip, uh, and the elaboration of the postgraduate uh, diploma project. The main uh, uh, contributors uh, in the uh, study program are the professors and teaching staff from the uh, uh, architecture department, um, also emeritus professor and cooperating researchers. Um, but the approach in environmental design is interdisciplinary and there are uh, several invited uh, speakers uh, among experts, practitioners, uh, professional architects and engineers and uh, academic staff from other departments that are uh, uh, contributing regularly to the program. Uh, the design studios uh, cover both uh, design scales, architectural, building design, and the urban uh, design scale. Next slide. Uh, here we can see uh, that the uh, design studios, um, uh, we can see the structure of the program, and the design uh, studios uh, are uh, the basic um, uh, uh, courses of the program uh, in the core of um, uh, the, the study program. And uh, the work, uh, the students' work uh, for in these studios is um, uh, feed, it's getting feedback from the um, theoretical and the technical, uh, more technical uh, courses of uh, the study program. Uh, so uh, the uh, architectural uh, design studio two is um, uh, the, it covers the uh, architectural and building uh, design scale and takes place uh, over uh, the second uh, out of the three semesters. It applies uh, an environmental approach to the retrofit and the uh, use of uh, the existing building fabric of the city. The studio emphasizes issues of uh, adaptation to the surrounding environment, 
that is integration in the urban space, volumetric composition and scaling, orientation, building skin surfaces, uh, the openings, the indoor climate controls, management and uh, articulation of enclosed, semi-outdoor and open areas, as well as selection of materials and integration of vegetation. Within uh, the design uh, process, the architectural uh, composition utilizes parameters of sustainable design and energy efficiency as a framework for the adaptive reuse of a specific building envelope in the historic center of uh, the city of uh, Thessaloniki. Uh, the course uh, also includes evaluation and assessment of the environmental and energy performance uh, of the proposal uh, through qualitative and quantitative parameters utilizing analytic uh, tools and uh, thermal simulation uh, and other software. Um, a critical issue in sustainable planning and the resilience of uh, contemporary cities is the revitalization of urban districts and the adaptive reuse of existing building uh, stock, which is the main uh, objective uh, uh, in, the, in this uh, uh, studio. Um, the term of uh, retrofitting uh, is um, a, a main issue for the studio uh, and it refers to the addition of new technology and features uh, to all of, of features to older systems uh, and characterizes the trend for revitalization of obsolete built stock. The term of green retrofitting further sp uh, specifies these interventions and adaptations with a focus on improving environmental response of uh, the building stock and urban areas. Uh, the using uh, both technical uh, means, thermal isolation, uh, replacement of materials and systems, uh, but it also extends to the adaptation of use and uh, to the image of the buildings in the urban context. context. Uh, this, uh, this course uh, focuses on the redesign of uh, an existing multi-story building uh, located in the historic center of uh, Thessaloniki uh, and it aims at uh, its uh, reintegration into the contemporary life of uh, the city. Um, <clears throat> the outcomes, uh, the learning outcomes of uh, uh, the studio uh, is uh, uh, for the students is a thorough understanding of uh, the design principles of green uh, building envelopes. Um, the students also can acquire architectural composition skills that maximize the environmental and the energy performance of uh, buildings. Uh, also students familiarize with the process of quantifying the environmental energy performance uh, with, um, within the process of uh, architectural composition. Uh, through thermal and energy simulation uh, tools. Uh, also, they can gain a thorough understanding of the role of uh, climate, of microclimate parameters and of solar geometry uh, towards the energy performance of buildings and the user's comfort within uh, uh, the built uh, environment. And um, uh, also, uh, they acquire knowledge of, uh, on methods and strategies for minimizing environmental footprint footprint and on improving energy efficiency of uh, existing buildings uh, in the context of uh, a broader structural uh, redevelopments and also in compliance with uh, uh, contemporary regulations. Um, uh, in regards to the methods, uh, the studio is carried, is carried out uh, normally um, face to face so within the uh, classrooms. Uh, recently, it's carried uh, out um, online. Uh, the teaching um, includes uh, short lectures and uh, assessment and discussion of uh, the student project's development. Uh, it also uh, encourages uh, creative and innovative thinking in the design process, and um, it integrates the advanced interpretations of the taught materials and methods in, from, the, um, uh, surround, from the other uh, courses of uh, uh, the, the, the study program. Um, it uh, also includes the application of the environmental performance assessment uh, tools and uh, the also intermediate presentations are uh, critical phases in the progress of uh, the student projects. 
During uh, the, the first and uh, the second semester of, uh, the pro of the study program, the students uh, uh, fam are familiarized with uh, tools, with online uh, tools and uh, other uh, software for environmental analysis, climate uh, data management, uh, daylight analysis and other tools. And during the second uh, semester, uh, during the studio, uh, the students uh, receive tutorials and seminars on specific, uh, on more um, uh, specific uh, uh, tools that they use for assessing uh, the energy performance of uh, uh, their build, uh, the building proposal um, through design scenarios and also for the final uh, evaluation of the energy efficiency of the, of the uh, proposed uh, building. Uh, then uh, I, I, I should note that the, the concept uh, is not uh, with, uh, from using the tools, it's not uh, to, uh, to learn a specific tool, but uh, to familiarize with the process of the analysis and uh, to be able, uh, which is uh, general, and uh, to be able to use any other tools uh, that will be available in uh, the future. In the future. Uh, next, next slide, please. So the, uh, the challenges um, uh, is in the framework of, of the studio uh, arise from the necessity to meet the current um, uh, urban resilience and uh, energy efficiency requirements, um, the construction uh, regulations and uh, the advanced uh, technologies, um, along with uh, preserving the existing historic and cultural qualities of uh, built structures and uh, urban uh, characteristics. Uh, by utilizing uh, the historic and cultural values of the host city of uh, Thessaloniki and considering what we said before, that the cultural heritage is uh, one of the pillars of sustainable uh, development. Um, the tutors uh, of the studio uh, cover an area of approaches um, to exemplify the implementation of uh, uh, culture in the context of sustainable design. Uh, and there are also the invited uh, speakers and visitors that uh, provide uh, specialized uh, uh, knowledge uh, on methods uh, and uh, several aspects of the design processes, the technical methods and the uh, historic background views. Uh, another challenge uh, within uh, this studio and within the program is the inter interdisciplinarity of students uh, which um, uh, come from different backgrounds and this uh, may um, in the first side, may pose obstacles in achieving a consistent um, perspective uh, within uh, the studio, but uh, it also uh, helps merging viewpoints and experience, and uh, they integrate and uh, it uh, allows integration uh, and it enriches the perception of the varying parameters of uh, environmental uh, design uh, within the process. So, as we said, that the, the teaching uh, um, uh, personnel from uh, of the studio are basically um, uh, professors and uh, teachers in the from the architecture department, and um, uh, also uh, other experts from uh, uh, other departments, professionals and uh, engineers are usually uh, are regularly invited. Uh, there is a framework that allows uh, the participation of, uh, um, uh, of tutors and the researchers and uh, 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 PhD candidates and um, a lot and uh, several uh, teaching staff uh, within uh, the program. Uh, so the, this uh, allows the interdisciplinarity and uh, it allows to um, get several different uh, viewpoints uh, uh, of uh, uh, environmental design within uh, the course. And um, also the participants are uh, also from different uh, backgrounds and uh, from engineering, spatial planning, environmental engineering, uh, landscape design, there are a lot of different backgrounds within uh, uh, the, the students. And uh, we can see now some uh, next slide, please. And uh, here are some data uh, of, for the a specific course um, about the workload and uh, uh, the evaluation uh, system. And uh, we can see now some uh, uh, student uh, projects. We can see two examples of uh, uh, the projects uh, that are developed uh, in the in this studio. Uh, the basic um, 
the uh, there are uh, three basic phases for the project of uh, the project of uh, the students. Um, the the first one is the uh, analysis uh, of uh, the site, uh, which is. Um, uh, uh, as we said, located in the historic center of uh, uh, the city. Uh, it's a specific site near uh, the port, which has changed uh, significantly through time and uh, has changed uh, the use and um, its character. Uh, the analysis of the site includes both the historic, the analysis of the historic background uh, of uh, the area and uh, the use of uh, uh, the urban functions and uh, uses. Uh, as well as the uh, parameters that uh, the, the microclimate uh, parameters and uh, that uh, um, uh, uh, that apply on the uh, that influence uh, the design the building uh, design and uh, function. The second uh, the second part of the uh, of uh, the, the uh, project. Uh, includes the uh, design, uh, the redesign, and the retrofitting of uh, the existing uh, built uh, uh, structure. Um, we can see an example uh, of uh, this, the example here of uh, a project that uh, Alain, uh, proposes uh, different uh, scenarios of um, uh, construction, different uh, scenarios of the uh, proposed constructions uh, that can have different forms that can uh, create different forms of. Uh, uh, the existing uh, building and uh, include a different uh, variety of uses. Um, and the third uh, uh, phase, uh, the third uh, part of the uh, project is the analysis, uh, the environmental uh, analysis, the environmental evaluation uh, of uh, the proposed uh, building, which is um, uh, can be done in, uh, both in the scenarios, in the different scenarios uh, through the design process, and uh, it, it also um, includes the final uh, evaluation of the uh, final proposal of uh, the building. Um, the, ev the environmental evaluation can include uh, several parameters. Here we could see the uh, daylight, the evaluation of the daylight parameter, the daylight uh, um, of uh, the the, the scenarios and the final, and the final uh, proposal. Uh, another uh, project uh, of uh, the same uh, for the same uh, building uh, or the retrofitting of uh, the same building in uh, that area of uh, the city. Again, uh, the first uh, it includes the analysis of the site and of the um, the uses of uh, the building here. Um, which uh, the analysis of uses also includes uh, um, uh, the um, needs of the occupants of uh, the building uh, the th um, in terms of uh, the thermal environment and the daylight environment. Um, and also we can, uh, we can see the proposal of the building design proposal on the next uh, phase, which includes uh, um, uh, retrofit uh, the um, improvement of the building of the building uh, envelope uh, as well as uh, uh, different uh, materials and um, uh, different uh, uses for the for this building and um, we can also see some uh, um, images of the final environmental assessment uh, which here includes the system the thermal uh, loads and uh, the analysis of the um, uh, energy needs of uh, the building uh, proposal. Um, and uh, there is also uh, the second uh, uh, design uh, studio, uh, which uh, is um, the urban design studio. Uh, it takes, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, it, this takes place uh, over uh, the first and the second uh, semester and applies an environmental approach to uh, urban planning and design uh, practices in the context of um, the historic uh, city. Uh, the urban design studio focuses on multiple scales of uh, the built environment, um, uh, such as settlements, building complexes, uh, built and uh, private, um, uh, public and uh, private uh, urban uh, open spaces. 
And uh, the approach, uh, the approach regards design principles and tools referring to scale from urban planning to the shaping of city blocks and uh, building volumes down to the detailed uh, design of street furniture, paving materials, uh, green areas, uh, etc., of the public space. Uh, the proposed uh, uh, project uh, for this uh, studio can either deal with the existing urban fabric and its uh, rehabilitation or with uh, new uh, urban units and uh, open uh, public spaces emphasizing uh, on environmental uh, parameters. Um, the uh, environmental approach here is uh, integrated at uh, all levels of uh, the proposed concept for the given site and um, it uh, considers the role of uh, place, local culture, natural uh, landscape, uh, climate orientation, uh, environmentally friendly materials, um, vegetation and uh, also sustainable urban uh, mobility. The, pro the project site for both uh, semesters so for, the, for this studio uh, is the same and um, during the first semester there is uh, uh, students uh, uh, do the site analysis and the elaboration of the design strategy for the for the for the site and uh, during the second semester uh, the they elaborate the actual the proposal uh, the uh, urban of uh, the urban design project and um, here again, the, uh, the design project uh, evolves under evaluation and, and control in terms of uh, the environmental uh, performance standards, um, the energy efficiency and the sustainable outcome as uh, evidence qualitative and quantitative analysis again with simulation uh, uh, software. Excuse me. Uh just because we have uh, uh, some uh, the other presentations to uh, and timetable is running so uh, can you please uh, yes make... i'm sorry uh, I, I, I i lost track of time uh, we can see that the outcomes of uh, this uh, this studio uh, is uh, again uh, the understanding of design principles in and uh, uh, in the urban level uh, we again the, the knowledge of uh, concepts of sustainable uh, uh, urban uh, design in terms of density, mobility, and energy efficiency, um, and of the uh, climatic parameters of public space. The tools uh, that uh, the students learn here are um, uh, the methods is again lectures and uh, discuss, discussion of the project, and there's also environmental assessment tools. Uh, here, uh, there are tools uh, for environmental analysis, GIS mapping, and also microclimate uh, simulation uh, tools uh, for assessing the microclimate uh, development within the proposals. And um, can, next slide. Um, the challenges uh, here uh, are, see, uh, again, the interdisciplinarity and uh, the um, uh, uh, of the students uh, and uh, also the um, uh, approach of the cultural heritage as the pillar of sustainable development uh, within uh, the city of uh, with the historic city of uh, Thessaloniki, which is used as a background. And uh, we can the next slide. Uh, we can have some. We can see some uh, uh, information on the design studio and the academic staff. And again, we can see some projects from two different. Um, uh, uh, from two different sites for this uh, studio. One is. Uh, sorry? Uh, the one is uh, a site near uh, the uh, port of the city, uh, which where students propose uh, the, the um, development of the uh, outdoor spaces around the existing buildings. And the other um, site uh, is. Um, uh, the site in the uh, near the, uh, the coastal zone of uh, the city, again around the area of uh, uh, also a historic uh, uh, com historic co building complex uh, near the coastal zone. Uh, here we can also see that the proposals uh, include the site analysis, uh, the um, design of the uh, uh, the redesign of the open space, the open spaces in the urban uh, in the urban site. And uh, also the evaluation of um, based the evaluation is based on uh, microclimate uh, parameters with the, with the tools uh, uh, with the simulation uh, microclimate simulation uh, 
uh, software. Um, sorry to take up the time. I, I should also note that uh, uh, there is a strong relevance of uh, uh, this, this program with uh, the uh, needs of the labor market in the field of architecture and urban design in relation to sustainable uh, development. And uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry for taking up much time. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for this very uh, informative and complex uh, presentation. And now um, uh, I can see that there are no uh, questions. Uh, uh, are there any questions by audience? Thank you. Uh, now at the end, I will uh, introduce uh, University of Belgrade's Faculty of Architecture. And uh, uh, teaching methodologies will be presented by uh, Anna Nikizic, who is uh, Hersus uh, Scientific Coordinator, Vice Dean for Science Education, and Associate Professor at our faculty. She holds PhD in Architecture and more than 20 years of teaching experience in the area, area of Architecture and Urban Design, and over 14 years of experience in research projects. Uh, she's particularly interested in connecting theoretical and practical dimensions of designing and uh, architecture in general, and particular academic attention has been brought to the subject of relations between architecture and nature, architecture and urban culture, as well as to the subject of social responsible architectural education based on an interdisciplinary approach. She's also author of uh, several books, and uh, she has uh, also been member of the organizing and science committed for a number of national and international conferences and workshops. Uh, please, Anna, and then we will have uh, three more uh, presentations uh, from our different departments. So thank you, Elena. Uh, I'm just press, please, the presentation. Okay, hello everybody, one more time uh, for uh, this second day in the afternoon. I think that we are all a bit exhausted uh, after the whole two days of this webinar and I'm sure that it's been very interesting but uh, we will, I will be really short uh, in trying to uh, present uh, to, um, just the structure of the curricula at the University of Belgrade Faculty of Architecture. And then I will give my word to three different specific uh, courses uh, that will be uh, presented by the authors of those courses, um, which uh, are focused, uh, uh, which focuses on different aspects of uh, this uh, uh, interesting topic of sustainability of built environment and heritage uh, uh, in architectural education. So, uh, the Faculty of Architecture offers a comprehensive education, including a wide range of studies and related educational activities, which enable the sharing of knowledge and development of skills required for um, practicing architecture and urbanism within the inter interdisciplinary environment. The studies offer practice-based courses that aim to prepare students for future careers in architecture and urbanism. The students are taught to by academics and professional practitioners and supported to develop the practical and specialist uh, techniques in different area of conceptual and professional skills required for future practice in chosen subjects. Uh, the faculty uh, currently offers the following programs, as you can see on the slide. So we have bachelor studies, counting some 300 students, and then we have master studies in architecture, master studies in interior architecture, and master studies in internal urbanism. Uh, the, um, the core of the faculty is uh, master studies uh, at master level, our master studies in architecture that uh, consists of a few models. Um, module for architecture, for urbanism, then for architectural technologies and structural engineering. And so um, this master covers uh, a number of 120 students, while other masters are um, counting some 30 to 40 students, depending on the year. And we also have this integrated studies, a single cycle for, for five years, counting some 60 students, uh, which is more um, uh, into the uh, professional uh, architects uh, and uh, urban uh, uh, designers. 
So uh, the next slide, please. Yes, thank you. A distinctive feature of the study program at the University of Belgrade Faculty of Architecture is based on integrated approach to education with equal emphasis on architecture, urbanism and technologies and also architectural engineering. We have three distinct departments. All three departments are there shown. So you have three colors. So you can see that they are intertwined uh, in a bachelor uh, uh, at a bachelor level uh, in a way uh, uh, sim in similar amount of uh, credits. And then on the master level, depending on the module and on the master, uh, you have one department that is more um, and the uh, and, uh, and, uh, in the prospect of the student, while other modules are just there uh, to cover the, uh, the area of uh, interdisciplinarity through elective courses and some experiment, experimental pedagog pedagogical approaches toward uh, other fields uh, and that are that somehow uh, ground and uh, resource architecture and urbanism. Uh, the white fields uh, are for the compulsory. Um, uh, courses uh, which are uh, the same for all the students. Uh, study programs at the Faculty of Architecture allows students to come up with their own uh, course selection, thus tailoring the education to their particular needs. All three departments offer a number of elective modules open to all students. The number of elective in, uh, electives increases and diversifies over the case uh, course of study program. Uh, so when we accredited uh, the, the, the whole program and all study programs, actually we thought that this selectivity would be a great offer for our students, but um, uh, in, in, cor in the course of uh, running uh, all those uh, all those courses and the study programs, we actually uh, discovered that due to the lack of electivity on prior uh, in prior education, specifically in higher education, our students were not prepared uh, in well a manner to choose uh, uh, in a rightful way. So uh, we decided to move a little bit of activity away from the first and second year and to introduce it only at the end of the second and then the third and of course master uh, classes. So at the master level it's more or less all elective. So, uh, especially the teaching curricula for students of sustainability uh, of heritage, that is the thematic and, uh, and challenging scope of the Harris pro 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 project, are established within different study programs and levels of studies, which very often disables logical chronology of learning and an integral consideration of the phenomenology of heritage and its lineage to the sustainable approach. So therefore, it is evident that the need, and we can see that here, because all those uh, uh, colored subjects and courses uh, are there uh, to, um, to, um, to support the knowledge in uh, sustainability and heritage, but as you can see, it's not enough. Uh, so it is evident that you need to learn about heritage is there. Different frameworks are established, but unfortunately, they are scattered all over the curricula, lacking an amalgam that will unite all aspects. We needed a new agenda to establish a program that requires the development of extended programs of the teaching processes and learning that empowers students to develop their competencies and skills further, critical thinking, positioning, sustainability of heritage in their own cultural media. So, uh, I will uh, now present, and so you can see here, uh, these dotted spaces are the, the places where our uh, authors of the courses and our presenters uh, will show their uh, positions in the whole study program in, uh, or at the University of Belgrade Faculty of Architecture. So now, Yelena, I will leave you with the other authors. Thank you. Uh -huh. So first, uh, first author who will be uh, presenting today is uh, Professor Daniela Milovanovic-Rodic, and uh, she will have a presentation, Educating Socially Responsible and Engaged Architects. Daniela, I hope that uh, you can, 
yes, you are here. I will just shortly present you. Uh, she's assistant professor at uh, our university and uh, she got a master of science degree here and her PhD. Uh, the focus of scientific research and professional activities of uh, Professor Daniela is in the field of urban governance, planning and design, especially collaborative planning methodology, public participation and education of socially responsible and engaged urban planners and uh, architects. And uh, she has par uh, participated in a few international national science research projects, national and local development strategies, spatial and urban plans, urban planning, architectural competitions and exhibitions and such. So uh, please, uh, Daniela, will you present uh, your course? Thank you. Yelena, I had, I, I have uh, some kind of problems with camera, the figure. Huh? Uh, is it switching as I see it? Yelena, do you see me well? Can you share the screen? Uh, yes, but do you hear me? With, uh, with your presentation? Yes, we can hear you. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you all for inviting me here. Uh, and thank you for this call and this opportunity to present uh, the results uh, of uh, my teaching in the recent years. Uh, I will present you just to, to find uh -huh. do you see my screen no do you do you have a uh, presentation no? uh, we can share presentation from here maybe yes. it would be better yeah i don't know do you do you see it now yes we can see it okay uh, so the title of this uh, presentation is um, educating socially responsible and engaged architects and uh, or architecture, architecture for and with the other 90%. The subject is a specific teaching model for educating socially sensitive, responsible, responsible and engaged architects able to formulate, design, fundraise and implement and sustainable solutions for people living in their conditions in urban slums, poor or distant rural areas, refugee camps or temporary accommodations. The main goal of professional activity within that model is to improve the quality of life of these people and communities that are usually outside of our professional focus and their empowerment to deal with the problems in the future. The main goal of the teaching model is to empower students of architecture with this new perspective, skills and knowledge needed for a shift from a service provider to a community enhancer role. The term design architecture for the other 90% is derived from the term design for the other 90% which means the search for design solutions that represent the answer to the basic needs of population, which is not the usual clients of professional designers. Under that title, curator Cynthia Smith has set up two thematic exhibitions at the National Design Museum in New York in order to demonstrate how design can be a dynamic force that transforms and in many cases saves life. Bell and Wakeford, in their book, say that there can be recognized emergent geography of architectural activism rich in its diversity of approaches. The ideology of this architectural movement is a part of a broader ideological framework of socially and environmentally responsible architecture that is based on the premises that many social and environmental problems can be solved by architecture. That the main purpose of the architecture is improving the quality of life of people and communities. Therefore, that the subject of architecture beside the design of spatial arrangements is the quality of life of communities in which are they placed. And 
that the impact of the on the community is one of the most important criteria for assessing the quality of architecture. There are several trends and characteristics of the development context according to which we should redesign our curricula in order to empower future professionals to deal with them. The gap, some of them are, the gap between the poor and the rich is being bigger. The gap between uh, what millions of people need and what the current system of housing provides continue to grow. Economic uncertainty, inequalities, and informal development, as well as the number of unemployed and socially excluded inhabitants is rising. Villages are disappearing, getting old, and have been emptied. The number of migrant crises due to wars or climate disasters uh, is increasing. Consequences of climate change and environmental degradation degradation are on the rise. This growing movement among architects and their architectural practices has many different names, such as architecture for humanity, public interest architecture, emergency architecture, architecture as activism, but similar ideology. Architects can help the poor, marginalized, powerless, vulnerable people. The common meaning in the search for architectural solutions that address the most basic needs of the population, not traditionally served by architects. The course uh, whose teaching model I'm presenting today was developed in collaboration with my dear colleague, Associate Professor Dr. Ksenia Valovic in 2012 school year. And since 2015, I'm running it with the great help of my former student and today's very active and competent expert in the field of participation, public property, and public interest protection, Božena Stoic. The course was designed with the aim to make students able to formulate, design, fundraise, and implement sustainable solutions for and with client, in this case, civic initiatives and local communities. The key characteristic is the continuous testing and repairing of a project design in accordance with expected problems of its implementation in the context of limited resources, as well as due to the lack of skilled labor and the low technology, equipment and materials that can be used for its construction. The key outcomes of this collaborative practice oriented and real context teaching model can be expected at three levels and they are ex expected to happen to everyone involved in this process, from teachers and students to the local population and involved, involved consultants as well. On the first level, we expect improving performances for, for dealing with current situation. It means that we produce better solutions. On the second level, we expect improving ability to deal with future challenges in order to make uh, participants able to replicate solution, meaning the knowledge and skills acquired in the, in the process to some new in the future or even improving it. On the second level, we expect, we expect changing the perception on the structure, meaning value system and his own role and capacity within it. Within it. it means being able to create new partnerships, starting new projects, taking more proactive role in his own or community goals achievement. The teaching model will be illustrated by three projects done for and with the local communities in the villages Dojkinci and Pakrštica on Stara Planina, Old Mountain, the municipality of Pirot. They are results of a joint efforts and collaborative work of students and teachers at the Faculty of, Faculty of Architecture in, in Belgium, residents of the mentioned villages, and representatives of the civic initiatives of Branimo Reke Stare Planine, Let's Defend Rivers of Old Mountain. 
They formed initiative called Old as New, refer referring to Old Mountain name, and under it applied for funds pre present via social networks, achievements, but barriers also to the wider public. In 2018, the 19th school year, we, we renovated a, a, an unused and neglected community hall in the village of Doikinsi into community cultural center. In 2019-20 school year, we made a project for renovation of a, a, an abandoned and neglected old rural school and also renovated uh, unused old diary in the village of Pakvestica and vill into village center and museum. In this 2020-21 school year, we are in the process of designing a project for renovation of an um, abandoned and neglected old diary also, but in a village Doikitsi into the uh, Orasap, uh, let's defend uh, uh, the river of Stara Planina, Initiative Research and Teaching Center. In 2019, uh, in, in the village of Doikinsi, so this is the presentation of this first project, we created a space where various activities of importance for life of people in the village can take place. Meetings, celebrations, workshops, presentations, exhibitions, projections, etc. The realization of the project was supported in various ways by numerous individuals, private, civil, and public organizations. We designed solutions in a solution in a continuous collaboration with the locals. We raised funds. The total value of donations in money and material good is around 1 million dinars. Everyone involved in the process of designing and implementing the project volunteered and the value of that work is not included in the stated amount. We are very proud that we succeeded to achieve our goal to provide a new place where Doikinsis, but also other villages, inhabitants and their families can gather and celebrate. This is a picture from the opening of the hall, and those are the people who participated in its realizations. And uh, on the left side, you can see our wish. We wanted that this project will inspire future in, in future other villages and other communities to, to take their initiatives. And it really happened. Next year, we received in, an invitation from the village of Pakrštica. It is a nearby village on Old Mountain. To renovate the old school together with the locals and uh, civic initiative mentions ORSP. This school was built in 1923. It is abandoned since 1986. Uh, it was built by its inhabitants. And this is one old letter that, which shows that in 1923, they agreed to, to gather funds and to, to build a school. Today, it is a public property and the city of Pirot has the right of ownership. We did the same as we did in previous case. Uh, we followed the pattern at the beginning of the teaching process. We organized a few, st few study stay, few days study stay in the village and its surroundings, and be received by the city officials in a city hall. We find this formal recognition by the public authority very important for the sex of the future actions, even if it, not, it was not the case at this time. We continued to work in different formats, supported by experts and guest lecturers from different fields of expertise. Using different types of platforms for collaboration between us and with inhabitants. We presented proposal to the city officials uh, in a municipality hall, but also in a village, to village inhabitants. We started preparatory activities for cleaning school building and its yard. We took action to stop the further the deterioration of the building by temporarily closing the windows with nylon and repairing the roof. In the process, we combined 
local and professional knowledge, skill and techniques, techniques, values and ideas. And we produced a very multi-layered and complex product, which beside these uh, architectural projects, we had an urban design project, but also center management model and uh, uh, the concept of media campaign and the project realization concept. But after three formal requests from the village, where the idea is presented to the city and asked for consent for the implementation of the project, after six months, the city administration gives a negative answer. One of the stated reasons is their understanding that the village does not have authority to engage in this type of activity. As in previous case, we have already get some different type of resources from different so, uh, sources. Beside these financial resources, we also had this legal and organizational support and specific knowledge expertise. So we had to re re redirect energy and resources on another project in the same village a village and we uh, organized ourselves to reconstruct all diary in a village park, park And uh, with the help of uh, local communities, uh, all of the members, our students helped to uh, reconstruct all the diary into village center and museum, which is very successful. These are some pictures from the opening and uh, uh, in, in this uh, place, this building, we have uh, um, uh, the villagers uh, organized many different uh, manifestations and uh, this um, uh, uh, village center lives very successfully. This is this year's project uh, and it is uh, still going on in the village Doikinsi. Uh, our partners from previous po um, projects uh, initiative uh, for defending uh, rivers on um, old mountain uh, gave us initiative um, to renovate abandoned and deterior deteriorated old diary in village Doikinsi into this uh, research center. Their idea that we support and embrace as ourselves is to create a teaching and research center necessary for continuation uh, of their activities on the nature protection. The main aim is creating uh, environmentally responsible, energy efficient, in line with the spirit of the place, but, al but also with legal re regulations, safe and comfortable space for work and stay of, group, uh, of groups of people, a place that will be a nursery of future guardians of nature Start I'm not sure. Daniela, thank you. Okay. Uh, Did I fit uh, in the time? There are, there are no uh, further uh, questions. So I would like now to present our uh, another uh, presentation from our faculty. This is Professor Ivan Rashkovich, and uh, he will uh, present. Um, the topic of use of heritage in architecture. Uh, professor Ivan Rashkovic is full professor at the Faculty of Architecture in Belgrade. He's a head of one of the design master studios and the graduate courses of the Department of Architecture. He deals with practice and theoretical work. And for him, architecture is primarily a consequence of social phenomena, processes, and the value system of certain echoes. He, with uh, Professor Borislav Petrovic, he published monographic study, Tradition Transition, as well as monograph, uh, Future of Housing. And his creative office includes over 20 buildings of various purposes involving residential, business, industrial, sports, and religious content. The team which uh, he belongs to has won more than 30 architectural competitions on which 15 of first prizes and he is a bearer of nine professional recognitions. He was Serbian National Commissioner 
of the 14th Venice Biennale of Architecture, and he currently performs in the post of city, uh, uh, city architect of Banja Luka and in Republic, Republika Srpska. Can... Thanks a lot. Thank you. This is sort of a, this is candid camera. <laughs> this joke, sort of a game. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Very happy to be here. I'm happy to present with my associate assistant Miloš Kostic our, our elective uh, program user heritage in architecture. Um, I think that um, we have been recognized for upgrading this, this uh, subject with some interesting issues. And um, uh, Miloš will give the advanced, advanced information about that upgrade of ours. Yes, the, the elective subject, the use of heritage in contemporary architecture, uh, has been uh, dealing with the topic architect film epoch in the recent three years. It is offered in the second year of master studies and the fifth year of integral stu integrated studies or uh, single cycle studies. And it is um, comprised of three uh, group of uh, separate researches that deal with the same uh, topic regarding uh, four films that were selected as case studies. Next slide. Um, general subject goals were directed towards understanding of tradition as a concept through the relativization of its temporal and spatial dimension. Uh, the focus of student works were directed towards critical analysis of the formative aspects of spatial practices as a consequence of specific cultural and social phenomena and mapping the scope of their influence. Uh, the, the third goal was outlining communicational aspects of architecture through different contexts with special emphasis of overcoming uh, the prejudice and uh, stereotypes related to the question of heritage. And uh, the fourth goal was developing the necessary skills for critical thinking and the re-examination of conceptual frames and in the connections of various phenomena related to modernity, historicity, contemporaneity, heritage, originality, readability, authorship, etc. Next slide. Um, the general content of the, of the course was directed towards uh, the processing of key terms and the observed area of research, uh, where we tried to implement different theoretical standpoints, interpretations, and critiques. Uh, that was the first phase in which uh, we decided to focus on theoretical problems while, uh, rel relativiz oh, sorry. while the relativization of certain theoretical assumptions generated within popular populist discourses, such as stereotypes and prejudices, which are directed towards the understanding of the role of heritage in the contemporary practice. And the focus of research was, of course, mainly on uh, questioning the, the place of interdisciplinarity of research through overview of relevant concepts and ideas from the discourse of culturology, sociology, and anthropology. And as already mentioned, in the recent three years, uh, we chose to examine this topic based on four uh, key studies that were uh, films uh, in, in Yugoslav cinematography, and Professor Rashkovic will tell you more about the criteria which were used for the selection of these of these four films. Well, we uh, saw the film or movie, as we say, as a brilliant uh, carrier of meaning, special uh, carrier of uh, various stereotypes, narratives, and even prejudice. So we have chosen uh, four films from uh, Yugos Yugoslav, actually, heritage, Yugoslav kinematography. Uh, the main criteria was uh, actually epoch. Four epochs are uh, marked by these films. Uh, the first one is from uh, early 60s, the second one mid 70s, the third one um, late 80s, and the fourth one uh, early 20s. 2000s, sorry. So they mark uh, uh, um, uh, the time of um, happy, cheerful socialism, then uh, self uh, self management uh, uh, problems, and the last two ones actually are dealing with the, something that we could call a black transition. Um, uh, the, the all four films, uh, as a main uh, characters, main heroes, have actually architects. Uh, 
so uh, we could uh, define or see or uh, make transparent the popular popular view of a popular meaning on, or uh, of a profile of such a profession a profession and its uh, social meaning and it was very useful uh, students like that and uh, they made actually excellent elaborations of these uh, these epochs um, and uh, especially the uh, actually uh, parallel um, analysis was very very useful uh, even some some surprising conclusions we have made yes as professor Rashkis has already mentioned the four depictions of architects uh, are analyzed and the uh, and the special focus was um, directed towards understanding the role for example of, of women as an architect uh, uh, depicted in the in the role of Katarina Ilic uh, played by uh, by uh, who was the famous Yelena Georgievic at that time Yelena Georgievic yes and these four uh, four roles were then uh, mapped in the in the in the context of the plot of the uh, those films next slide by uh, applying the methodology, the study methodology that uh, was consisted of def defining conceptual framework, narrational framework, and spatial framework, where we applied the different teaching media. Uh, we or uh, decided to go outside the, the faculty as, as an institution and organize the lectures and discussions with the directors of those four films um in the uh, alternative artistic space named catch 22 where we had a chance to discuss uh these topics with guests students local artists and uh everyone who was interested in the in this particular topic and uh in this place we also organized these interviews with uh, with the directors discussions and presentations of the of the test tests that students did during the course uh then according to these uh, three frameworks uh the different approaches were applied where the students showed the understanding of the complexity of the socio-cultural context ideological and historical background of the plots and the uh, specific profiles of the architects um analyzed the narrational techniques of the directing plot character portrayal human interactions behavior and hierarchies and applied representational techniques uh, of architecture in the process of mapping the observed phenomena and their spatial interpretation. And uh, as a result, uh, the discursive images were generated, uh, which were a sort of systematization and uh, the, the representation of transforming role of the architect in the different uh, social contexts, as mentioned before, and in, in different epochs. And here we applied three uh, research media as a textual, uh, form it was an essay as a notational form it was a diagram and as a spatial form we decided uh, to apply set design uh, by applying digital and virtual techniques of uh, that architects usually use in their design projects next slide and the uh, the course uh, ran through three steps and the first step was of course the discussion and analysis of the content of architecture and film where they um, where the students had a chance to uh, form their critical overview and uh, standpoints based on the four interviews that were conducted during the, the course uh, with each director. Um, and the, uh, based on these interviews, they built their conceptual framework. Next slide. Uh, the conceptual framework was then defined on theoretical level based on different, um, different uh, standpoints and, cri uh, and critical uh, remarks that uh, they had a chance to, to um, pose to those um, interviews. And um, afterwards, they uh, formed an input for this next step, which is next slide, uh, theoretical practical task. Uh, it was uh, directed to a spatial diagram of the film uh, as an outcome that will uh, be uh, as an instrument that will be used for uh, questioning the built, the projected, the relation between narrative and perceptual, the relation between spontaneous and constructed meaning in the in the space of film. Uh, next slide. 
And here we can see that uh, students use the different uh, te graphic techniques in order to, to map these uh, different meanings and to simplify them and explain them through the spatial uh, uh, context and, uh, and uh, tools that were already uh, known to them and at this point of studies. Next slide. And uh, as, the, uh, as the, the third and the last slide during, and the last step during the, the course, uh, critical analysis through a physical 3D model uh, was um, was a, a, a focus where the students were um, appointed to work on the on the different you can play the film uh, where they uh, had a task to define a 3D uh, set design uh, inspired by those those critical standpoints that they defined in the previous previous phases and this was. Uh, this was a, a task for um, outlining the, the spatial and and the most architectural framework of the of the uh, course. These were actually not actual sets of the films. Yes, there the were impressions a, that the film is giving about space. These were the critical re-examination of the of yeah. the film sets, and as such, they they. Uh, present an inter interpretative studies of the of those uh, spatial aspects. Next slide. And as they use different media, they use the 3D modeling and the virtual techniques, which um, proved to be a very useful during the, the COVID uh, time in, in uh, the previous years, as these were uh, um, applicable. Uh, this methodology was applicable during the, the digital learning and in the digital environment as they could also focus on, on the developing the virtual skills and virtual sets that also had uh, a, that were um, so with uh, narrational meaning next slide and uh, they choose to define the different set designs which uh, differed in the, in the scale and in the uh, in the scope uh, questioning at the same time in the theoretical level the the positions and the hypothesis that they uh, set at the, at the very beginning of the research and the next slide and the next slide uh, represents the, the synthesis this this was the, the the very end of the of the course where they had to choose uh, the, the the most um, representative elements and try to connect them in one coherent um, whole. Next slide, using the different uh, graphic techniques uh, and colleges as, as a method to connect this theoretical and practical work uh, as a form of a 3D essay. And just instead of uh, conclusion, next slide, just a short 20 second uh, film from the from the movie Jivi Dili Bavidili, Long Live and See. Or let's see, I was yeah. putting that there. Let's see what will happen in the future. It's a, a film of Miroj Pulkovsky, Yugoslavian Croat director. A film made in the mid 70s and uh, actually socialism um, uh, opened its uh, uh, systematic crisis. So it's, it's a brilliant elaboration of that crisis. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. You. you can contact us if you're interested yeah, or you have more questions. Email. <laughs> yes. Thank Thanks you. Much. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. We will have the, the last presentation for today. Uh, this is uh, Professor Dusan Ignatovic. He's the associate professor at the Faculty of Architecture in Belgrade, also visiting professor at the Faculty of Technical Sciences in Kosovska Mitrovica and formerly at Faculty of Architecture in Podgorica. His professional and scientific interests are related to design, energy efficiency, green building design and refurbishment. Uh, as an expert, in, as, as a researcher, he has been involved in uh, numerous international, national, scientific and professional projects and activities. Currently, he's involved in City of Belgrade Typology of Residential Buildings as the team leader and National Typology of Buildings in Montenegro as international consultant. He also participated in many uh, international projects uh, by uh, Horizon Projects, Erasmus Plus Clubs, 
projects, etc. And his expertise in building technology and energy efficiency has enabled him active participation as invited speaker and lecturer in numerous national and international professional trainings, workshops, and symposiums. And uh, besides, he published uh, many publications, and he's also uh, designed numerous uh, buildings covering great variety of programs in various cultural and climatic conditions. So please, uh, this last presentation will be okay, focused you, on uh, energy efficiency. Yeah. Thank you, Elena. Dear colleagues, I hope that you survived actually this couple of days. And since I'm the last one, I will start to speak between the eight and 10 minutes. So I have eight minutes till the end, and I hope I will be finished by that time. Uh, as you can see, the position of the subject which I'm supposed to present is uh, the specialized studies and these specialist academic studies are actually the graduate course after the academic studies of architecture. So they are kind of in between of the professional expertise and academic expertise, uh, aiming at providing the direct tools applicable in everyday practice in the, in the field of energy efficiency primarily and at the same time broadening the knowledge and academic topics about the sustainability and green architecture as a topic. So why do we do this? Why, what was actually the, the starting point in the idea for be, be, uh, be, uh, let's say starting this course? First is the general uh, shift towards the energy efficiency and green architecture on one side being pursued both internally from the Republic of Serbia and externally pushed by the European Union. On the other hand, we are facing the decrease in population where we lost, let's say lost, almost a million people within the next, in the past 30 years. Our families are narrowing, the number of inhabitants are narrowing. At the same time, we are having more and more flats constructed every year. So on this slide, you can see that actually the number is decreasing of the people and the number of the dwellings has been increasing. So now we are having the standards which at the time when I was a student were just imaginative for us that one person occupies more than 30 square meters of space. But what kind of space? What does our built heritage look like? And we are focusing, or at least my study is mainly focusing on the uh, residential sector. We are tackling only the residential on various types and various, uh, let's say, appearances from the history. So what do we investigate? first? the technical aspect. We investigate what our buildings are constructed of, when are they constructed of, what are the materials, what is the performance. Aside from this studio, there are numerous uh, other subjects which are dealing with the specific technical knowledge needed for assessment of the performance of the buildings. One of these is this uh, uh, implementation of infrared inspection in the building performance. On the left, you can see the structure of our building fund where actually more than a half is constructed before the 1980. And that was the period with very low energy efficiency standards, meaning that half of our built heritage is not, so, let's say, according to the, any contemporary standards. And we all have the buildings which are constructed of the very co good quality materials and which are lasting for 60 and plus years, meaning that we have to deal with them. So it is the, the less, less and less of us and the buildings are more and more. That's the only resource which we have. So this is the only resource which keeps on growing and it presents a significant material and let's say a resource which can be used and which can be worked upon. So this is the legal legacy that we are leaving for our future generations, which is 0.8 kids per family. And we have to adapt it for the us which are aging, which are becoming more older and which are being less available and to use the so, uh, contemporary and new models. So we have to adapt our building funds to the aging population. We have to adapt to the structural material and cultural as well as technological changes that are appearing every single day. And we have to adapt to the new regulatory changes being pushed top down from Europe and bottom up from internally from our own legislation. So we have to deal with the maintenance, rehabilitation, improvement, as well as the protection of our built heritage. So what do we do? We can leave it by itself. You can see on the left how the people are doing it by itself. They do what they do and the outcomes are as they are. Or we can do it like our neighbors. We can try to fix it. And fix it usually means that we improve the state or improve the energy efficiency. And the energy efficiency is the main motto of all these works. But this is not architecture. 
This is just posting the insulation and painting. So the buildings are the same. They are still ill-performing. They are still substandard in the, from the point of the spatial and functional efficiency. So in our course, we try to move a little bit forward. We try to use the energy rehabilitation, the stimulus towards the new approach in building treatment. That the, that the actually the dynamic management and the architectural realistic interventions are potential. So the reconstruction is actually the new design. Because we design only 1% of the new buildings a year, meaning that we have to deal with the old ones. So our, our profession will have to turn itself towards the reconstruction as a main challenge, both from the performance point of view, but also from the design point of view. So rehabilitation is actually the new discourse in our practice. And in order to boost this uh, discourse, we actually uh, started the, uh, like let's say demonstration works on various building types, usually choosing the ones which are most common in our building fund. Trying to put our students to analyze these areas, these building types, the people that are living in the social, the cultural and the functional needs which they are facing within this building. So this is one example, for example, from the last year's studio project. Okay, we have next one. First, we analyze the big picture. We organize the urban picture, so-called bioclimatic principles, location, urban milieu, climatic, and other influences that actually uh, can be and uh, used and fostered towards the way to make the new and better buildings. So we kind of analyze various uh, surrounding uh, appearances and influences like sun, wind, a little bit of uh, mechanical fluids and stuff like that, just to uh, give the glimpse to the architects what uh, can be modeled and what can be included when we go top down to the building level. So once we arrive at the building, we analyze what we have, what are the material, uh, material elements of these buildings, how they're constructed, what are the actually layouts, what are the advantages, disadvantages, and we do this calculation of energy energy performance. Then we try what is being requested by the law. If I add thermal insulation, if I add uh, some new windows, if I change this, if I change that, but it's not architecture. This is just a technical principle which can be applied by any technical person as being requested by a chamber of engineers. And we can see what are the levels that we can improve our buildings in this way. But we kind of try to push it a little bit forward to follow up on a project which we did 15 years ago which actually tackled the building as a resources and which tackled the principles of redesigning the building in the 21st century. And in this way, we analyze the structure itself. We analyze building as a potential on which we can work on in all the axes, horizontally, vertically, internally, externally, both from the materialization point of view, but also from the design point of view. So this is one illustration where our students analyze the layout and potential of the building also aiming at the generating the economic, uh, let's say, boundaries which can enable reconstruction. So what we can gain from this reconstruction in order to foster the reconstruction itself. So uh, and then we go deeper into the technical aspects of this, all the way through the detailing and calculation of the materials costs and actually the gains. So we can see that, for example, this example can reach up to the level B, which is higher than requested by the, our laws for the new buildings. And these buildings can look a little bit different than the ones on the first slide. And there's just a couple of slides more. There's another example of another student where we can also see the same procedure, but with the different outcomes. So the idea of this course is on one side technical, to go through the, all the calculation and all the technical knowledge and data needed for sufficiently reconstruct and rehabilitate the project. But on the other side, since it's been positioned in the faculty of architecture, it is the design philosophy and idea making of how to treat the building fund uh, actually in correlation with the ever-changing needs of society which we are facing. And that was it. Eight minutes. Thank <laughs> Eight you very minutes. much. Thank you very much for being so, being so uh, focused now. Uh, I don't see that we have any uh, questions and I think we are, uh, running out of time, I will just uh, finalize uh, this uh, this uh, session. We uh, were able. Oh, there is. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, we will. We had the, the great opportunity to see a variety of approaches uh, to, and uh, teaching methodologies uh, that relate to history, landscape, uh, communities, practices, technologies, and I think that all that we hear will uh, really. 
be very useful for our next steps on working on a CURSUS project uh, that uh, we will all benefit, not only our schools, our students, uh, but uh, our professions from this, but also ourselves. And I will uh, finalize this uh, session with the quoting Anna uh, Tostas that presented uh, today. We have, we have great uh, lectures this morning. Uh, and she said, without people, there is no heritage. So this will open our, I hope, uh, kickoff uh, meeting uh, just after a short break. But I think that uh, Anna Nikizic had uh, wanted something to, to add uh, to all of uh, this. So before we have a short break, and then start kick off meeting. Uh, thank you, thank you, Anna. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you all for the for the patience. Uh, the official part of the webinar is over, and now I will ask full consortium members uh, to use the link that you have received for the kick off meeting and that you already have for today, so we can transfer to the other meeting to have an internal meeting. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. And I hope this was a good experience and some prospects for future um, uh, ways in which we are going to um, develop this project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.